This audio presentation of the Greater Spiritual Responsiveness of Body and Awakening the Brain of Spirit by Brown Landon, a course of 37 lessons, is brought to you by AudioEnlightenment.com, copyright 2017, all rights reserved. Part 1. The Greater Spiritual Responsiveness of Body Lesson 1. The Gate to the Path This is the gate that leads to the path, that leads to the steps, that lead to the portico of the Temple of Transformation. My very first suggestion in these lessons may surprise you, for since they are written to help you respond more fully to spirit, I ask you not to think too much about details of information given, or how the development is to take place. You know that thought does hinder free expression of spirit. For years in your own life, many an impulsively joyous desire of spirit has been restricted in expression by some thought of whether or not you dared to express it. So if you ask me, how many minutes, or how many times, or how often you should do this or that, well, I shall not answer. I will not aid in such thoughts which hinder your development. Think a little of detail, but feel deeply whatever you do. There is rhythmic power and work harmoniously repeated four or seven times, and when wise, I advise such rhythmic repetition. But otherwise, the less you think about details and the more you feel, the greater will be your response to spirit. Another forethought is this. When we later come to the use of spiritual desire, please do not center on little petty things such as growing a new toenail or a new head of hair. Most people fail because they desire too little things. It is right to desire little things, but spirit is infinite. And if you too often limit your desire you will put a thought dampener on the great expression of spirit. Desire greatly, and you attain greatly. Then all those other things will be added unto you. I am writing these lessons differently than most courses are written. One, in real reverence of the subject, and two, as a friend to lead you to think less and feel more deeply. First, recognize the difference. Awakening the mind-brain leads to improvement. But awakening the brain of spirit for greater spiritual responsiveness leads to transformation. Second, since the brain of spirit is far down in the body, just above the kidneys, it can be awakened only by those means which do reach down through the body. Third, any attempt to use direct means of awakening spirit will hinder full manifestation, just as you injure a rosebud if you use direct means trying to pull its petals apart. And fourth, do not try to awaken the brain of spirit by thought, never by affirmation or concentration. There are two results which you most desire. They are heavenly results, because when they are attained, all other things are added. The first result you want is abundant, overflowing energy in your body, energy inspired from the universe, pulsating like a flame of life all through your body. This is important for 99% of your problems would disappear completely if you had only twice the energy you now have. The second result you desire is the constant flow of energy out into free and full activity. Merely possessing abundant overflowing spiritual energy in your body is not enough. You want it ever flowing out, freely and fully into action. To attain the first condition, I teach you to tune up body to spirit and awaken the brain of spirit, so you will inspire or take in more divine energy than you have dreamed possible. To attain the second condition, I teach you to use the seven creative powers of God to impel all soul power to move out into action, to vitalize every cell through which it moves and transform every condition of your life. I know you have already tried many means and methods, and that most of them have not come up to your expectations but you have not yet used the unknown powers. You do not even know them. Of course, you know the powers of mind, of love, of life, but there are other powers unknown to you. There are the unknown initiating powers, holy light, high electronic energy, mighty silent overtones and rhythm. I also call these powers the operative powers. Clearly understand, there are two groups of great powers. One group is the initiative, or operating powers. The others are conceptive powers, of God and the soul. 
The conceptive powers are mind, love, life, and spirit. Most people make the mistake of depending entirely on the conceptive powers without preparing the body for their use by first using the initiative or operative power. Some claim that only conceptive power should be used. This is not sensible. Heat is one of the operative powers, and you know very well that mind or life or love cannot manifest through your body if it is frozen stiff. Head is an essential, so are all other initiative powers. I am teaching you uses of powers never taught previously. First, tune up the body by initiative or operative powers. Then you will never fail to work transforming changes when using the conceptive powers of mind, love, life, and spirit. So please give careful attention to using these mighty operative and initiative power first. They are powerful. The light rays you cannot see are a thousand times more powerful than the light rays you can see. The high unknown electric rays are rejuvenating, although 110 volts will shock you and a 25,000 volt current can kill. And there are the mighty unknown powers of silent tone. The miracle of the unknown powers is this. Whenever you tune up a lower destructive power so that it vibrates more like spirit, it then changes its effect and becomes a constructive power. You can use these to tune up your body to vibrations of higher unknown power so that transformation can take place. For example, when the low electric current which will kill your body is stepped up a million volts and its frequency increased, then its deadly current becomes beneficial because it is more in tune with the spirit power in your body. You cannot even feel this higher unknown electric power, but when an x-ray bulb is held against your skin, it glows with a beautiful light. And when a million volt current is passing through your body, it seems to rejuvenate the body. Another unknown initiating power is the mystic, unheard overtones of silent sound. Glorious tones sing in all things, even in your body. Our human ear hears only a few tones. Dogs hear many more. Bats and ants hear still more in higher tones. You cannot hear a tone of 25,000 vibrations a second. But ants hear a tone of 50,000, and there are tones of crystal tones that vibrate 500,000 times a second. There are also tones of atoms and stars. Such tones are absolute silence to our ears. They vibrate a million or more times a second. The song tones of some stones are very powerful. When a pebble of laminated crystal is placed near an anthill, its song increases activity of ants ten times and without fatigue. The unknown tones of atoms and stars have astounding power. And your body, which is composed of cells which are composed of atoms, can be tuned up to respond to such power. These lessons teach you to tune up and spiritualize your body to pulsate in harmony with the spirit of the universe. To do this, it is necessary to use powers which will reach deep down to awaken the brain of spirit to free its power. The first start in lifting up the body to greater responsiveness is effected by the use of the initiating or operative powers. These powers are used to initiate a greater responsiveness of the body so that it will be prepared for the higher vibration of spirit actually to flow into every cell of the body. These initiating powers are the higher unknown powers of light, sound, rhythm, cosmic rays, etc. But to lift up vibration of your body and prepare it to respond to spirit, you must use powers, the initiating powers which penetrate into the body. Several do not, even x-rays do not pass through bone, so they are useless for this purpose. And you cannot use the unknown powers of light for such initial awakening because light never penetrates more than one one hundredth of one inch into the skin. If it tries to go deeper, nature builds up a wall of tan to keep it out or cooks your skin to blisters. Light in moderation is beneficial to the outside cells, that is, to the skin cells, but it is deadly to the cells of your inner physical body. You cannot often use the unknown powers of high electric rays because the machines which produce vibrations of such high frequencies cost several million dollars. And you cannot use mind to awaken the brain of spirit.
for thoughts of mine always tend to block expression of spirit. I do not need to argue this with you, for you know from experience that freedom of spirit has been blocked, perhaps all your life, by thoughts of what you should or should not do. Yet many teachers have written books and lessons to teach you to use only mind to awaken spirit. But when you follow such instructions, you ultimately find that you are not attaining that which you wish to attain, no matter how thrilled you were the first few months of such an effort. And often such methods, if continued for years, lead not only to disturbed body functions, but also to unbalancing of the mind. Since your body is not as responsive to spirit as you desire, it is wise, from the practical standpoint, to prepare the body so that spirit can normally manifest through it more fully. This is done by means of the operative powers, which initiate responsiveness of the body. But there is only one of the initiating powers which you can easily use which has power to affect the initial preparation of the body structure, and which also penetrates it so that its cells will vibrate highly enough to begin to respond to spirit. Orientals have known this power for centuries. They have tried to teach it to us, but we have understood it only mentally. And even their own teachers have lost the spiritual understanding of it and teach only the mental and physical exercise. The first initiating power to be used is silent sound, sound that is silent to your ear, yet 10,000 times more powerful than any sound you can hear. Silent sound is the harmonizing power of the universe. We have evidence of this. When its high overtones are vibrated through matter, it is only the lower tones which rip matter apart and destroy it. The higher overtones, the silent overtones, are so constructive that they actually build up substance, even new tissues of the human body. It is these higher, unheard overtones which I teach you to use to initiate the awakening of the brain of spirit and prepare the body to vibrate harmoniously enough to respond to spirit. Silent overtones are mystic energies of stars and atoms. They are the only power you can use to initiate responsiveness of the body, for colors and lights cannot even penetrate the skin. You cannot secure the means of producing the higher electric vibrations, and thought tends to repress the power of spirit. The four reasons for the use of the higher silent overtones to induce initial awakening of the body are as follows. First, mystic silent tones penetrate to every body cell. Second, they harmonize the cells, just as they forever harmonize stars in their courses and the electrons and atoms. Third, they tune up the body so its cells can receive and inspire the cosmic powers of spirit. And fourth, since they reach down to brain of spirit itself, they can awaken it, so its powers flow more freely and fully into the activities of your body and into action in your life. Lesson 2. Tones of Cathedral Bells in Your Body You have advanced along the path to learn of the brain of spirit and the initiating or operative powers which you will later learn to use to make your body continually responsive to spirit, not only improving it but transforming it. Here I give proof of the power of the initiating powers, the powers which initiate responsiveness of all cells of every vital organ of the body and of every muscle and nerve. Even the muscles must be tuned up to receive the spiritual energy of the universe and to manifest it more fully. With such manifestations through muscles, you will possess enduring energy and experience much less fatigue. Thus, you can add many hours to your life and ultimately many years, as well as doubling attainment and joy every day. These initiating powers initiate responsiveness of the body so that it is tuned up to receive and respond to spirit. They include the unknown powers of sound and light and color and rhythm and cosmic rays, etc. There are many of them, but it happens that God so made the body that only one of them is both beneficial to every cell of the body and also able to penetrate to every cell. It is the one which includes unknown overtones of sound. Perhaps you doubt that overtones of beautiful sound, overtones of power, can sing in and all through your body. So I ask you to make two simple tests to prove to yourself that beautiful overtones can vibrate through your entire body, even though quite unheard and unknown to you. Make these tests now. In each test, use four things. In the first test, you will use a table, a spoon, a piece of string, and air. 
In the second test, you will use the same table, spoon and string, but instead of air, you will use your fingertips. Hence, any difference in tone will be due to using fingertips instead of air. Any table made of wood will do for both tests. And any soup spoon you choose, solid silver or plated. For the string, choose any kind of wrapping twine or cord about four feet long. What follows now is the first test. Tie the middle of the string around the small part of the handle of the spoon. This leaves about two feet of string at one end and about two at the other end. Now hold up one end of the string in one hand and the other end in the other hand so that the spoon tied in the middle of the string will hang down and sway. Next, stand near a table and sway your hands a little so that the bowl of the spoon swings against the table edge, just tapping the edge of the table top. Listen to the tones. Every tone you hear is produced by the singing quality of the table and spoon and string. Their combined tone is carried to your ear by air. And what do you hear? A pleasant jingling sound. That is all, is it not? Now carry out the second test. It is done differently. In the second test you use your fingertips. Wind one end of the string two or three times around your right forefinger. Back a little from the tip so your thumb can hold the string from sliding on the finger. In the same way, wind the other end of the string around your left forefinger. Then put the tip of one forefinger in one ear and the tip of the other in the other ear. Keep the string far enough back on each forefinger so that the string does not touch your ear. Three factors are the same. Table, spoon, string. In the first test, tone traveled along string and then through air to reach your ear. But in the second test, the sound travels along the string and then through the blood and bone and muscle of your fingertips to get to your ear. And your fingers are composed of muscle, blood, and bone. So if the tones you hear in this second test are different from the jingling tone of the first test, the difference must be due to the singing qualities of muscle, blood, and bone. Now with your fingertips stuck in your ear, step back a little from the table. Bend forward a little so that the swinging spoon will not touch your clothes. Then bend near to the table and sway your body a little to swing the spoon. Do this easily, letting the bowl of the spoon again hit against the table edge. And what do you hear now? No mere jingling tones. Instead you hear tones of great cathedral bells. And all the difference is due to the one factor which is different, that is, to the singing qualities of muscle, blood and bones in your own fingertips. More astounding is the fact that all the difference you hear is caused by only a half inch of fingertip. What then must be the silent song of your entire body? Just as a great six foot bell produces greater tones than a half inch bell, so all of your body, 10,000 times larger than your fingertips, produces tones 10,000 times more powerful than those you've just heard. There is a means of producing powerful tones in your body. It is your own voice. Each voice tone produces silent and unheard overtones within your body, mystic inner tones which work tremendous change. If the tones of your voice are disagreeable or weak or edgy, they produce friction in your body. If they are tones of love, they harmonize cells, tune up the spiritual quality of your body, open it to the inflow of spirit. These silent overtones can make the cells of your body sing in harmony with the mystic songs of stars and atoms. Certainly, the test you just made did not prove that the tones you heard were the tones of songs of atoms and of stars. But there is proof that they are like those of stars provided the tones of your voice are tones of love. Stars of universes and electrons of atoms are held together by attractive power, the most titanic power of earth and heaven. Out in space, billions of stars have been held together, circling in harmony for trillions of years. In the atom, electrons have been held together since creation, and even million volt power in laboratories cannot pull them apart. There is only one great attractive power, whether out in space, holding stars together, or an atom, holding electrons together, or in the body, holding cells together, 
or in the human society holding people together in love and attainment of great ideals, there is but one holding together power. There is but one such power, and it is love. So if you use the deep loving tones in your voice, particularly in the work I give you to do in these lessons, to tune up your body, you will produce unknown and unheard overtones of beauty and power vibrating all through your body. Such tones will create harmony among selves and lift them up in love to be ready to receive spirit and respond to spirit. Do not doubt the existence of these overtones. You cannot hear them just as you had never heard the tones that sing through the tips of your fingertips until today and did not know that such beautiful tones vibrate in your body. Be certain that the powers which work alike produce results that are alike. The overtones of your body will be like the overtones of stars and atoms, and you will begin to respond to the harmony of the universe if your tones are tones of love. Do you, my friend, now begin to realize how useless it is to merely repeat words and thoughts to produce harmony? There must be actual response of the entire body before your body can respond to the harmony of the universe. The songs of stars and atoms are overtones of the one attractive power, and the inner body overtones produced by your tones of love are tones of the same attractive power. I know you want to reach great spiritual heights, attain super consciousness of spirit. I know you want a body thrilled with energy, ever flowing into free and full action for perfect manifestation. But you cannot attain the first without the second. Unless you tune up your body to spirit, you cannot become truly conscious of spirit. You have proved that overtones like those of great cathedral bells do sing in the tissues of your own body. You now know you cannot use light's unknown power to awaken the brain of spirit because light rays do not penetrate even through the skin. You know you cannot use mind to awaken spirit. You know there is but one great power which harmonizes and holds all things together. You know that power is love. You know that the same power which harmonizes and holds stars together is the power that holds cells together. Otherwise, one would work against the other and tear the universe apart, tear stars apart, tear your body apart. To inspire or take in spirit energy, you know you must tune up your body to spirit. Moreover, you know you want more than mere theories about spiritual power. You want the actual awakening of the brain of spirit and spiritual responsiveness here and now. So you are now ready for the next lessons, to begin to tune up the body of spirit. In every silent moment, visualize the two heavenly conditions you most desire. First, abundant energy flowing into your body. Second, all power in you flowing fully into action. Attainment of these two is perfect manifestation on earth. I know you have read so many things that have been just masses of words without much meaning, that you have come to believe that truth is difficult to understand. Free yourself of that idea. It takes no education to understand spirit. Simple souls often attain the greatest power. Do the work I give, and the results will make it clear to you. You, born of God, can understand. So let us begin now, with great insistent desire, to understand the means of awakening the body to respond enough so it can inspire spirit, millions of times more powerful than mine. Lesson 3 Four Brains and Improvement versus Transformation Spirit is the most powerful energy of the universe. The physicist calls it cosmic energy, the biologist life. We call it spirit, the radiancy of God. Adrenal is the name of one of the teeny organs of the body. It enfolds the medulla of brain cells. The substance of these cells is the most powerful substance known on earth. Since spirit is the highest energy of the universe and the actual matter of the adrenal is earth's most powerful substance, they form the union of the highest power in the most spiritualized matter. It is the mystic wedding of spirit and matter. Transformation differs from development or improvement. No matter how highly you develop a grub worm, it's still a worm. But transformation changes the grub into a butterfly. We have improved the body for ages by diet, breathing, bathing, exercise, developmental training, mental control, we have attained a high degree of thought consciousness. 
We have also been taught mind power, teaching of the occult, and also consciousness of inner light, use of the violet ray, the vibrant om, realization of the absolute, etc. In these lessons we retain all that is helpful of these means, and then add the use of spirit itself. We also use the power of spiritual desire. Desire is not spirit itself, but it is the activating power of spirit. It puts spirit into action. It also awakens and greatly augments the activity of each one of the seven creative powers which I teach you in later lessons. Before discussing desire, I wish you to know what and where the brain of spirit is. It is the brain which mystics knew long ago, but knowledge of it had been long lost to modern man. It has been recently rediscovered. It is not the brain in the skull, for that is the mind brain. It is not the solar plexus, the emotive or love brain. It is not the sacral plexus, that is, life or sex brain. The power of each brain works marvels, but their power is as nothing compared to the spiritual power of the brain of spirit. Even the substance of the brain of spirit is so powerful, matter which lacks power lacks spirit. Matter which is powerful throbs with spirit. The actual substance of this hidden brain of spirit is so filled with spirit, and hence so powerful, that we dare not inject a drop of its pure substance into the blood of a human being. We first dilute one drop of it in one hundred million drops of water, since proves that this substance of the brain of spirit is more powerful than any other substance known on earth. This brain is the brain of brains. Surgeons can remove a third of the brain of the skull, and the individual can still live on. The solar plexus can be injured, yet the person will not die. The sacral or sex brain can be inhibited, and the testes or ovaries removed, and yet the health of the body may be even improved. But if brain of spirit is seriously injured, there is death. This brain is the center of spiritual desire. Man waited 300,000 years before a teacher appeared who proclaimed the power of desire, by promising, What things soever ye desire, ye shall have. Then man waited nearly two thousand years more before he discovered in his own body the secret brain of spirit, the brain which is moved only by spiritual desire. By desire, man's energy, even in ordinary life, can be multiplied fourfold or fortyfold in a few minutes. We have known of such results in the past, but we have not known how to affect them at will. For example, when I was seventeen, I was ill in bed. I had been an invalid all my life. I was so weak that I had to be carried up and down stairs. Yet, when I was awakened by a fire one night, I got up alone, dragged two heavily loaded trunks down two flights of stairs and across the street. It was my desire to save the treasures in those trunks which awakened in me that astounding energy. Yet, one hour later, using all my faith and thought power and physical energy, I could not lift one end of either of those trunks. Why? By that time, the desire to save the trunks was gone, because they had already been saved. Each new discovery of a different brain in the body has initiated a great new advance. Herophilius, some three hundred years before Christ, recognized the brain in the head as the center of thought. Then, for almost twenty two hundred years, man mistakenly assumed that all other soul powers also manifested through that one mind-brain. When a young man, now in medical science, my observation as a neurologist convinced me that two of the great plexuses of the nervous system were not merely plexuses, but that they were actual brains which functioned individually as brains. Later I performed 1,400 experiments and tests which proved it. At that time my conclusions were ridiculed. Today, however, in every medical college there are textbooks, often three-volume reference books, on this same subject giving proof that these plexuses are brains. By 1922, man had definitely differentiated the function of three great brains in the body. A. The mind brain in the skull. B. The emotive brain of solar plexus on an approximate level of the stomach, but back in torso in front of the spine. C. The sex or sacral brain lower in the torso. Now a fourth brain has been discovered, that is, fourth in the order of discovery. It is not a mind brain, or love brain, or life brain. 
it is a brain of spirit power. The ancient mystics seemed to know of this brain of spirit, and even knew its location, for they wrote of the spirit of man being centered in his reins, R-E-I-N-S. Reins is an old word for kidneys. Their inspirational knowledge of long ago has now become proven fact. Today it is proven that such a brain does exist, and in the particular part of the body designated by the mystics 3,000 years ago, it is just above the kidneys. The kidneys are also called the renals, and hence anything above them is super. Therefore we have the word suprarenal. In lower animals, which do not stand upright, the glands are not above the kidneys but in front of the kidneys. Hence, in lower animals, they are called adrenals. For many years, I had been intuitively certain of the existence of a brain of spirit because I could not believe that the miracles wrought by hormones were produced by mere juices of glands. Now my faith and intuition are justified. Physiologists have now proven that the cells of the medulla, of the suprarenal, are not gland cells. They have proven that the cells of this medulla are brain cells, similar to the cells of the sympathetic nerve plexus. The outer part of each suprarenal is composed of gland tissue and functions as a ductless gland, but the inner part is a brain cell function in the brain. It is so phenomenal that I wish at once to prevent you from confusing it with another gland, the pineal, which some writers who are sincere but lack physiological knowledge have mistakenly assumed it as the seat of the soul. The pineal is composed mainly of a few flakes of lime sand held together by connective tissue. Amazingly fantastic claims have been made for it, but it is silly for any educated person to believe that lime sand is the kind of substance through which spirit affects its supreme manifestation. Each of the four brains in the body is fitted by the Creator to manifest one power more dominantly than all other powers. Hence, there are four brains and four basic soul powers. Mind, which idealizes and directs. Love, which attracts and harmonizes. Life, which unites and reproduces. Spirit, which inspires, impels action and creates. Each soul power has a brain for its own particular function. The brain of spirit is the inner center of the suprarenal. It is a brain of spirit energy. And only spirit spiritualizes all cells and all tissues. Only spirit creates and recreates. Only spirit can transform the body. Only spirit can transfigure the powers of the soul. This newly discovered brain is the brain of spirit. But what do we mean by spirit? The word spirit designates a supreme energy because all energies which move in spirals are supremely powerful, that is, much more powerful than the energies which move forward in straight lines or in wave lines. In all early languages, the word for spiral and spirit are the same. So I use the word spirit in the same way the ancient mystics used it, to designate the supreme power, whether of the material or of the spiritual world. This helps you to understand inspiration. It is the act of supreme energy spiraling into physical structure. Since the very substance of the brain of spirit is super powerful, it can respond enough to inspire or take in spirit energy of the universe. We are now almost at the end of the path which leads to the seven steps which lead to the portico of the Temple of Transformation. Lesson 4. Two Stupendous Truths, Life and Death Reversed This lesson and Lesson 6 contain three stupendous truths. So far as I know, they have not been previously presented except in private courses of my own. The first stupendous truth is the true understanding of our life here, compared with the life of those who have passed on. Death is the word we use for passing on. In all I write here, death refers only to the body. Usually we speak of those who have passed on as dead, and very strangely, we think of ourselves as the living. Yet both of these statements are not true. When the sperm and the ovum unite in the womb of the mother, there is life impelled by spirit. The cell lives and multiplies and increases its life. And if life means anything, it means increase of life and growth. This process of increase and growth of the human continues within the womb of the mother until the child is born, 
It continues after birth until the 21st or 22nd year. Then every human individual begins to die. There is no more youthful growth or increase in life of the ordinary human individual after his 21st or 22nd year, except in a very few exceptional cases. Day by day, the body of every adult slowly dies. Some die more rapidly than others. So it is we are the ones who live in the realm of death. Even those of us who are happy that we have retained vitality and youthfulness through a number of years, after all, the best we can say for ourselves is that we have not been dying quite as rapidly as other people have. All adults on earth live in the realm of death because they are dying individuals. And strange, as soon as one passes on, he is free of this dying condition and hence he lives in the realm of the living. It is a stupendous truth. We on earth are always slowly dying in this realm of death. Those who have passed on are the ones who are truly living. From this we can take the step in clear thinking. It leads to the second stupendous truth of life. The second stupendous truth is that our condition of continuous dying here is due to the destructive energies which we mistakenly think are energies that support life. The biologist or physiologist has never found the primal cause of death in any study of the chemistry of the body or any study of the physiological activities of the body. Please note that physiology does not mean the anatomy or structure of the body, but its activity and functioning. Each thinking biologist or physiologist says there should be no reason why the human body cannot live forever. Yet we are very certain that the body does die. To live, man depends on the use of certain energies. He depends on them for the functioning within the body. Now we come to my second stupendous truth. Every one of these energies on which man depends for life is a destructive energy. It always tends to destroy whatever it temporarily builds up. We have been so stupid in our scientific study of energies that it almost warps our faith in science and our own intelligence when we learn that every energy which I have considered to be a constructive energy is basically a destructive energy. For a time, each such energy may stimulate and produce a temporary growth, but in so doing, it already starts the process of death because of its own destructiveness. Even all of our therapeutic sciences and efforts to heal the human body depend upon use of destructive energies. In fact, not one medical physician or naturopath in 10 million knows what a constructive energy is. For healing, we use light, heat, electricity, x-rays, radium rays, chemical energy as in food medicine. We generally accept these energies to heal the body and give us life. Yet every one of these is destructive, always destroying whatever it temporarily builds up in us. For instance, we depend on light for life. Some people are great fattests of sunbathing and even boast about how healthy they are because so darkly tanned. But light is absolute death to the inner human body. It is so deadly to the human body that nature provides that it shall not be allowed to penetrate the body. Light cannot get into the skin more than one hundredth of an inch. Nature is very wise and man is often very, very dumb. When dumb man exposes himself to too much light, nature knows enough to protect him from killing off his own body. So nature puts up a blackout curtain between layers of the skin, little particles of color through which light cannot pass. That color is called a tan. Nature deposits a shade of tan so light shall be kept out from the cells of the inner body because light will kill any cell of an organ of the body except the skin in about two seconds. And if nature does not build up a tan to keep light out of your body so that it will not kill you, then the light cooks your skin, that is, blisters it, until you do stay out of the light, until your skin has recovered enough of life to be able to stand another dose of killing light. Light even destroys the cells of the retina of the eye if it is exposed to pure light such as sunlight. Explorers in Arctic or Antarctic regions, where light is often continuous for months and reflected from the snow, go blind because light destroys cells of the retina, unless the explorer protects his eyes by colored glasses to shut out most of the light. Light even destroys the very qualities of its own nature. Light broken up into its different vibrations produces colors, but light destroys colors, it fades them. 
I am not writing this to oppose the use of light, but I am writing of the stupendous, widely unknown truth. The light, on which we depend for life, is a killing enemy of our bodies. It is one of the destructive energies which even destroy that which itself builds up. We also depend on heat for life, for if body temperature drops below a certain degree, it is truly dangerous to life. This is the reason we must eat food which free a certain amount of heat or calories into the body. We need heat to keep up the temperature of the organs, so that the energies of the mind and the soul and spirit that radiate from brain centers and nerves can easily manifest and through the tissues of the body. But heat itself is destructive. It destroys the human body, destroys and burns up wood and other substances, even melts steel. I am not here fully discussing any one of these energies. I am merely telling enough so that you will recognize that each of the energies of which we depend for life is destructive. Consequently, all adult human beings, depending on such energies for life, live in a realm of death and slowly die every day from the 21st or 22nd year. Sound also, although beautiful to our ears as music, can actually drive man insane. And it is proven by laboratory experiments that sound vibrations that approximate 8,000 vibrations per second disintegrate bones and teeth and even the hardest substance found in the human body, gallstones. Now it might be considered beneficial to use such rays of sound to dissolve gallstones in the human body, except for the fact that if we place the human body in the path of such sound waves, the entire body would be disintegrated. Even higher, silent vibrations of sound, of laminated crystal stones, are deadly to several forms of life. If you drop a pebble of laminated crystal into a tank of milk, within a few minutes every germ in the milk is dead or drop a pebble of a laminated crystal stone in your goldfish bowl. In half an hour, every goldfish in the bowl will be dead. Since these sound vibrations are absolutely silent, their destruction of life is the mystery of the silent death. And electric rays can shatter glass, shrivel plants, and kill animal life from tiny cells up to the human body. X-rays are also destructive. They actually burn up organs of the body so terribly destructive that even the physician who uses them to cure others by such a destructive energy protects himself with gloves and stands behind a lead screen. And radium also is a destructive energy. A tiny bit of it in your body disintegrates all organic tissue, even bone. It is stupendous truth, is it not, that here on this earth we depend on these energies for life, although each of them is a destructive energy and destroys with absolute certainty the human body to which it is supposed to give life. I am not leaving this subject here, for I have another stupendous truth to reveal to you in Lesson 6. It is the truth of the seven great powers, the spiritual powers, which I have discovered, or rather rediscovered. Every one of these is a constructive power. These are the seven powers God used to create the earth. Each day's creation reveals that a different power was used each day, and that each produced a different result. Since those results are eternal, they reveal that the powers which produce them must be eternally constructive, otherwise God's creation would not have lasted. Lesson 5. Spiritualized Matter and Responsiveness It is now wise that I sum up for you the basis of which we are to proceed for your greater development. 1. The awakening of the brain of spirit, and 2. The increased spiritual responsiveness of your body. You now know that man's body begins dying at 21 or 22, and continues slowly dying for the rest of its life on earth. You know that all the powers of which man is dependent for life are destructive energies, rapidly killing his body. You also now know that something more than improvement is needed for man's greater advancement here on earth, for neither man's body nor mind of today surpass the body or mind of the ancient Egyptian or Greek. Man must now make transforming changes in his body, otherwise he will stand still and even slip back. Since man begins dying at 21 or 22, something must be wrong with our method, as well as our choice of powers used. Man has prayed and idealized, striving earnestly both for physical and spiritual growth, using many means and methods yet he has often failed to attain all he has tried to attain. We should face the truth and find out why we fail. Nothing is gained by our hush-hush method of not saying anything about those who, after claiming that they have found the truth, still die while young. 
Let us face truth, and truth itself will give us the answer. Truth itself has never failed, but our understanding has, and our mistake and applications of truth have often been wrong. Neither the most hygienic life combined with the best physical training, nor the most ideal life in accord with truth of mind, has added to man's length of life. The facts are these. Every professional strong man has died before he was fifty, most of them before their thirty-fifth year. I am writing of those men who took good care of themselves, not drinking, not smoking, not using food supposed to be detrimental. Likewise, most of our great leaders of truth whom we have admired have died before they were seventy years of age. This does indicate a failure, because there are more than four million people in our country who have never heard of truth, and yet there are more than seventy years of age. Even the one leader whose keynote of mentalized truth is that there is no matter and no possible death to the physical body died before she was ninety years old. This is neither criticism of individuals nor of truth, but it is honest recognition that we do not yet use the powers of the soul that make the body spiritual enough to live as youthfully as many other forms of life. Man's body dies as an old body even when young in years. Some lower animals, even birds, live as long as man and some animals live twice as long. Any animal that can keep his body vital and healthy and active for two hundred years possesses something which man has missed. It is shocking that man really lives only until he is twenty-one or twenty-two years old, and then begins dying and continues to slowly die, week by week, and actually ends life here while yet young in years. Since man's soul is made in the image and likeness of God, and since God is eternal, forever living, never dying, it seems man should have accomplished more in making his body responsive to spirit, so that it would live longer and more youthfully. It is strange that man still depends for life on destructive energies which tend to destroy his body so that he dies young. But now we have discovered the brain of spirit. There is certainty that you can awaken your body to respond more fully to spirit and to the creative power of God so that you may actually work at transformation of the body. The degree of change depends on two factors. One, the power of the energy of the brain of spirit, and two, the degree of responsiveness of your body tissues. The brain of spirit is deep within the suprarenal gland. The suprarenal, or adrenal, is the supreme endocrine gland. In making this statement, I do not discredit opinions of other scientists, although I seem to disagree with them. Many endocrinologists assert that the pituitary endocrine is the master gland of all the endocrine system, because it can make the hormones of other glands if they fail to do so. I do not contradict them, for I know this is true. That is, that the pituitary is the master endocrine factory. But all evidence proves that it is the suprarenal which is the master brain of the master factory. The very substance of the brain of spirit in the adrenal is practically spirit itself. It is no longer possible to draw a clean-cut line between matter and spirit, but we can truly say that some substances are not powerful and that other substances are very powerful. When we say that a substance is not powerful, we mean there is not as much spirit in it as in other substances. When we say another substance is the most powerful substance on earth, whether in or outside of man, in air or depth of the earth, we mean that that substance is so like spirit that it is practically spirit itself in manifestation. The very substance of the brain of spirit is so saturated with spirit that it is practically spirit itself. It is the purest form of manifesting spirit in matter Perhaps it is one part matter and 999 parts spirit. From this brain of spirit, spirit itself can be radiated to every cell of man's body to transform every cell, to change man so that his body shall live instead of die. For this, there is a need of greater responsiveness of body. Your body is now responsive to the destructive energies, to light, sound, electric rays, ultraviolet, radium, etc., but all of them tend to destroy the body so rapidly that your body begins to die just about the time it ought to begin to live as an adult, able to attain great things in life. There is great need of the body becoming more responsive to the seven great powers of spirit, the constructive powers which God himself used in creating the universe. And what do I mean by responsiveness? When I say that matter is responsive, 
I mean that energy can flow through it with little friction so that the substance is not worn out and the energy is not used up in merely forcing its way through the matter. To illustrate the value of responsiveness, let me use an electric dynamo, a motor, and a wire connecting the two. The dynamo radiates 1,000 units of energy every minute. So carry that energy from the dynamo to the motor, you use a connecting wire. If you use a semi-iron wire, which is not responsive to electricity, to link up your dynamo to your motor, the wire itself will use up 950 units of the energy. Then your motor will receive only 50 units of energy. This makes it a very weak motor, a failure in life. But if you use copper wire, which is responsive to electricity, it uses up only 80 units of the energy radiated by the dynamo. This leaves 920 units of energy for you to use. This gives you a very strong motor, a successful life. Soul is infinite, and there is no limit to its power. So if the body were fully responsive, the energy of the body will also be limitless. But an unresponsive body uses up such energy that your energy for the activities of life is greatly reduced. Tune up the body so that it is more responsive to spirit, more responsive to your soul power, and much more of the power of your soul will manifest, not only in energy, but in health and in vitality and attainment and love and charm, friendship, abundance and spiritual illumination and realization. The soul is limitless. Nothing can prevent its limitless expression, except an unresponsive body. Since we have now discovered the seven great constructive powers of spirit, the very powers that are enduring and do not wear out structure through which they manifest, we should try to make the body responsive to them. As your body becomes more responsive, you will more fully express the divinity within you and realize that you are made in likeness of God to live like a God on earth. But be very certain, my friend, that you cannot increase such responsiveness by any direct effort of the conscious mind whether by affirmation or concentration or visualization. Mind always hinders expression of spirit because the limitations of conscious mind cannot remove their own limitations. If, however, you rise to consciousness of the power of spirit and make your body more responsive to spirit, then transformation is possible and all the other things will be added unto you. Lesson 6. The Seven God Rays of Creation Practically all work of science has been concerned with the study of the destructive energies of Earth and the universe. But from geology we know that Earth has existed for billions of years. From biology we know that life on Earth has existed for tens of millions of years. So there must be energies that are not destructive, for nothing but constructive powers can create that which lasts. Scientists now call energy rays or powers. There are seven rays which are God powers. These are the constructive powers of the universe. They have never yet been investigated by scientists. It is these powers which make body responsive to spirit, and we can discover what kind of energies they are because God used them one at a time, one for each day of creation, and tells us exactly what he created each day. The greatest Bible truth is found in its first 34 verses. They tell just what seven powers God used in creation. They tell us the result of using each power each day. Another illuminating truth is that the word translated God in the first chapter of the Bible is the word Elohim. You know that in different foreign languages, plurals of nouns are formed in different ways. In English, we usually form a plural by merely adding an S. In the Hebrew, one sign of the plural is I am el Hohim is plural in form. It means seven powers of God, that is, the seven powers or energies or seven rays of God, which he used to create heaven and earth in seven days. On the first day, God used his inspiring power or ray. He radiated his light to inspire energy into his ideal of creation, to give it power to become real. On the second day, God used his expand. On the second day, God used his expanding, uplifting ray. In the margin of the revised version of the Bible, you find that the word firmament 
is a translation of a Hebrew word which means uplifting or expanding. This reveals what God did on the second day of creation and the uplifted expansion God called heaven. Scientists know there is such a power, yet they have never even studied the power itself. They know that gases expand and that other substances expand when heated. And they know that this power works independently of heat. And you know it also, it ever near a raw cut onion. Particles of onion oil move outward by expanding power so rapidly that you smell it even though several feet away. God's power of expansion exists in all things, onions, or the universe. On the third day, God used his forming ray. To form means to put things together into shape. That is what God did on the third day of creation as revealed in Genesis 1, 9-13. He formed the heavens. He formed the waters. He gave form to dry land. All these forms appeared on the third day. I devote many later lessons to these powers, but here I give you only their names. Read the first 34 verses of Genesis. The fourth constructive power God used in his clarifying ray, the purifying power which eliminates non-essentials and clarifies one thing is different from another. The fifth day God used his vitalizing ray to harmonize all things. This power even harmonizes elements in water, so that out of them life is created. The sixth day, God used his recreative ray, the power that gives each thing the power to multiply after its own kind. The seventh day, God used his holding ray, the power to hold all things created, keep them from being dispersed. I might as truly call this God's Sabbathing ray because the word Sabbath often means capture or hold. These are the only constructive powers in the universe, and scientists have made no study of them. Every scientist knows that there is an expanding power, but he never studies it, and when you mention it, he merely shrugs his shoulder and says, yes, all things expand. It is strange that scientists have never been impelled to recognize that if all things expand, there must be an expanding power which expands them. Every synthetic chemist knows that when certain molecules of one kind are brought near certain molecules of another kind, they rush into a new form, a new chemical. Yet when questioned about this, the scientist again shrugs his shoulder and says, yes, why, that's affinity. It is amazing that not one scientist has ever tried to find out what power causes affination, the one process of forming all new things. The above are the constructive powers of the universe. They impel all the lesser powers, such as heat, sound, light, electric rays, x-rays, radium, cosmic rays. All the minor powers destroy or tend to destroy, and their effect on a human body always leads to death. But there is something in creation of man which, for a time, is not affected by these destructive powers. It is the spirit. It gives to man, when conceived within womb of mother, something which gives him life and for the first few years of life after birth for about twenty years. So long as man depends on this spirit, even unconsciously he lives, and his life increases and grows. But when man begins to use his mind too much, particularly as the dominant power of his life, the man stops growing and increasing life and begins dying. So from about his twenty-first year, dominated by mind instead of spirit, man slowly dies year by year. Mind does something to spirit that hinders the free flow and manifestation of spirit. It clamps down and limits. Conscious mind limits man to time and space and restricts every impulse of love, life, and spirit. Yet the soul of man is limitless. It is spirit created in the likeness of God and knows no limit of time and space. Conscious mind will not even let you believe that you can expand in spirit over all the world in a second, or instantly change from one age to another, or be here one second and a half around the earth in another. Yet your soul can do all these things. In sixty seconds of a dream, your soul can do all these things and a thousand more, because when you dream, your conscious mind is asleep and cannot limit your soul. This means your soul is free for the time, although you have not yet learned how to use this freedom when you dream. 
The soul experiences this freedom also in near drowning. At such a moment, the conscious mind unconsciously gives up its control, and the soul is free to live limitlessly. Hence, at such a time, the soul experiences more in a minute than it lives in a lifetime of conscious thought. I do not expect you to understand all this fully now. I write of this here as a basis of future understanding. Study this lesson many times as a basis. I shall ask you in succeeding lessons to make your body so responsive to spirit that conscious mind shall no longer limit your soul or bind your body, so that the creative powers can transform your body and transfigure your soul as you become more responsive to spirit. Comment on Slightly Changed Names Finding names for things which have never been known on earth is one of the most difficult problems for the human mind. For example, I tried for 13 years to find a name to designate the work of my friend Luther Burbank, but there is no English word which defines his kind of work. It has been very difficult to find English names for the seven creative rays. The mystic names which I have had to translate in writing for you are Shamayin, Aphraim, Korakelium, Arminium, Gadishian, Miolanin, and many others. Sometimes three different names are given to many the same ray. These have never been translated into English until I first wrote this course some years ago. I am now changing my first English translation a little bit to make the name simpler and meanings clear to you. For example, what I previously called the conforming ray, I now call the forming ray, because forming is sufficient as a name of the power that gives form to things. And what I previously called the purifying ray, I now call clarifying ray for it is the clear meaning of the power God used, symbolized by making sun and moon, the light that made it possible to clarify all things. But no matter what little change I may make in names, each ray remains the same, and its power remains the same. Lesson 7. Spoken Word. Silent, Mystic Sound of Spirit. My insistent purpose is that you get results in attaining the two most important goals in all your life. First, full inflow of spirit, second, full outflow of expression of spirit. I had a basic reason for those tests of Lesson 2. First, they proved to you that tremendous overtones can vibrate in your blood and bones and muscles through every cell of your body. Second, they proved magnification of overtones, that even the ordinary jingle of a spoon did produce sounds of a cathedral bells in your fingertips. Third, they indicate that great harmonious overtones vibrate in your body, for the tones you heard were beautiful and harmonious, hence workers of good in your body. These same overtones vibrate in atoms. I emphasize atoms because every cell in your body is composed of atoms. An atom is a tiny sun center of infinite energy of God. We call the protons and electrons of which atoms are made the smallest particles of matter. But since matter is energy... A proton or electron is really a particle of energy, not a particle of matter. Although infinitely small, the atom has a sun center. Its electrons whirl around that center just as our Earth and the other planets whirl around our sun. The whirling is so rapid that the power is titanic. If scientists could free the energy locked up in the atoms of one teaspoonful of mud, its energy could toss all navies of all nations from the Atlantic to the Pacific in one second of time. Your body is made up of such atoms of tremendous power. The power within them is the same attractive power which holds stars together to form universes. The attractive power is the same because it produces like results. In the past, many of our hopes have not been fulfilled. Faithful souls have tried earnestly, tried and tried again, and yet not attained the results they desired. We mistakenly thought that the divine mind is all power. This is a mistake, for mind is the means which God has given to us to use the still greater power of spirit. The goal of life is 1. Incarnation of spirit into the body. 2. Transformation of the body by spirit. 3. Outflow of spirit. and 4. To transform everything in life. In our efforts, there has often been a slip in our work, a slip between the effort we make and the result we attain. This slip has often been due to the lack of understanding of listening to the inner voice and our use of the spoken word. This inner voice is called conscience by some, 
but its messages do not come in words. The inner voice is truly the mystically silent overtone of God, whose power ancient mystics knew and used. Just as there is an inner light in your body, which the eye cannot see, so also there is inner sound, the voice of absolute silence, which the ear never hears. I am revealing holy truths to you, stupendous truth. They are usually misunderstood, seldom truly understood. The spoken word is not a word or words spoken aloud. Our past teachings have been only partly right. The spoken word has great power, but the mentalists of the truth movement have materialized it and used it to designate words or phrases to be spoken aloud as affirmations or declarations of being or power. Sometimes you have been helped when you yourself have awakened the true spoken word of spirit within yourself. In other cases, it has failed a hundred thousand times. Many practitioners have spoken the word of abundance for others, and there has been no abundance. They have spoken abundance for themselves and are in want. They are not to blame. The lack of results has been due to the materialization of the high ideals of the true word into crude sounds which the ear can hear. The true word is never a word or a phrase spoken aloud. The spoken word is spirit, a mighty, silent, harmonizing overtone of God pulsating through your body. Speaking it aloud with your lips kills its true power. In ancient text, spoken word means the highest power issuing out, issuing or radiating as a power. Hence, our use of it as a truth spoken aloud by our human voice is a materialistic desecration of the real spoken word. The true spoken word vibrates in silence. It unifies you with the essence power of stars which issue out from God. It vibrates in all things on earth, and in all the eternal circling of stars, it tunes up the body, so that the body itself becomes more responsive to spirit. It penetrates to every cell, reaches to brain of spirit, and frees the silent power of spirit. Please do not think that the awakening the brain of spirit is complex and difficult. It is very simple. And the means are so simple that unthinking people often miss both the understanding and the awakening. Only unthinking people teach complex truth. That is why they are always failures. Thinking souls soon learn the basic truth are simple, so also the simplest means are always the most effective. A great uncut diamond may lie in the gutter for a year. A million people may pass it by, missing its wealth. They think it is only a simple pebble without value. They are the unthinking people who fail to realize the truth that the value of wealth of a diamond resides in its quality not in the complexity of facets cut upon its surface. In this course I give you very simple means of awakening the brain of spirit, so simple you may at first wonder how they can produce the marvelously great value. These simple means produce results because they unify divine power with the silent power of movement, with harmonious unheard tones, and with your deepest soul desires. Lesson 8 initiating the mighty overtones. All of your body is always vibrating with mystic sound. 1. There are ordinary tones which you can hear. 2. Overtones of these tones which you sometimes hear. 3. Higher overtones absolutely silent to your ear. And 4. Mighty overtones which have unimaginable power and unite with the higher silent overtones of your body. In the laboratory we have proved that all tones have power, that sounds you can hear can disintegrate bone, that silent overtones of singing stone crystals can sterilize milk, that still higher overtones can increase the energy of animals, so they increase their activities ten times without increased fatigue. Then in human life we have proved that silent overtones initiated by tones of love in your own voice can awaken titanic energy, increase activity without increase of fatigue. Let me explain simply what an overtone is. When vibrations of a tone are doubled, its simplest overtone is produced. These can be doubled again, multiplied and multiplied. These are overtones. 
A few of these can be heard by the ears in music. The 19th overtone of an initial violin tone is exceptionally beautiful and can be heard by some ears. But thousands of the higher overtones are absolutely silent to our ears, yet they possess mighty power. You already know that overtones can ring in your fingertips. Now please learn that overtones produced by your own voice can and do vibrate in all parts of your body. Often a person, when talking over telephone, wishes to say something to a person standing nearby, which he does not wish the person at the other end to hear. So he foolishly puts the receiver of the telephone to his chest while making the side remark to the person nearby. Well, this is silly. If you put the transmitter against your chest while talking, the person at the other end can hear what you are saying, sometimes more clearly than when you talk into the phone for tones of your voice do vibrate through your torso as well as in your voice. If you hold the palm of your hand flat on the upper back of a deep-voiced man when he is talking, you can feel the overtones of his voice even in the muscles of his back, and hear them if you place your ear against his back. If you place a microphone against your upper chest, you can broadcast through its muscle and bone when another person is telephoning you, if you place the earpiece of your telephone flat against the sides of your head, you can hear by means of your head bones. Moreover, your abdomen often feels deep overtones. You have felt such tones many times when listening to a mighty pipe organ, either at church or at a movie theater. Even the feet can both feel and hear tone. Deaf people at a concert hear music by feeling its tone vibrate through their feet on the floor. Every tone produces overtones. When you speak, the tones of your voice produces marvelous overtones. You hear them only when they vibrate through air to your ears. But your voice produces thousands of the higher overtones in your body. These you never hear. These silent overtones, produced by your own voice, always vibrate in your body when you talk or hum or sing. They actually pulsate in every nerve and brain cell and activate all cells in every part of your body. They produce amazing power in your own body. You can use such overtones of your own voice to tune up your body's vibration to make it responsive to spirit. Every mediumly low tone starts thousands of silent overtones of great power vibrating in your body. Every low tone you hum produces mighty unheard overtones of mighty power in your body. They are always silent to your ears, but their amazing power can transform your body and every deep loving tone of your speaking voice produces unheard overtones of attracting and constructive power, the same power which holds electrons together in atoms, cells together in your body, and stars together in space. Any tone you speak or hum or sing, if somewhat low for your voice, and if it is a love tone, can produce unheard silent overtones which can work miracles in your body, if you unify them with strong desire and love and action. In this alone you possess power as of a king or a god. On earth there are two billion people. In your body there are eight hundred trillion cells. Every cell is a very intelligent individual, and all these billions of cells live in the overtones you initiate by the tones of your voice or your humming. No stretch of imagination can visualize the tremendous power you possess in your tones not only to heal the body, and harmonize its cells, but also to give you power, increase endurance, and augment activity with less and fatigue. These silent overtones, which your ear never hears, although produced by your own voice, are the true spoken word. The OM that is hummed aloud is only the materialized, devitalized, despiritualized substitute of the true word. The true higher word is always silent. It is silence that gives power. You already know that the two-cylinder auto that chugs along at eight miles an hour is very noisy and has little power, while the 16-cylinder automobile, which can speed 90 miles an hour, is almost silent and has comparatively great power. The nearer to silence, the greater the power. Think what one complaining tone can do to your body. No wonder whiners are always failures. In contrast, the vision of thousand silent overtones of harmony initiated by the love and power tones of your voice creating peace among 800 trillion cells, giving them power of unified action, the ease that is vibrant health. 
prove to yourself that humming does produce overtones in your body, place your hands flat on your chest and hum. Any low overtone which your hands feel is powerful. As you hum such tones, they first produce overtones you can hear. Then the silent overtones which penetrate to every cell and reach even the brain of spirit itself. You do not need to sing to initiate such overtones. Just hum. Humming produces very powerful overtones. And if humming tones vary from day to day, that is good. Learn to hum. Medially low and loving tones. Not back in your mouth, but in your chest and then far forward of your teeth, just as though you were a boy again playing on a comb covered with tissue paper. Do not try to hear the tones you hum. Instead, try to feel their mystic, silent overtones vibrating through every cell of every organ of your body. The tone you hum is only an ordinary tone, but its mystic overtones vibrate unheard through your body. They tune up its tissues so that every cell actually sings a silent harmony that pulsates among the stars. Use this true inner voice and the true spoken word. They are of spirit, not of mere words. They are vibrant inner overtones of silence. Use the divine mind God has given you to guide you. Use the divine love God has given you to transform your soul attitude and initiate tones that will harmonize 800 trillion cells in your body so that they will work together in perfect harmony without friction. This means health and also tremendous power and energy. And use the divine spirit to awaken the deeper desire to be unified with the overtones of love, your own voice, and with movement of your body to break down its old and crystallized stiffness, to open it up to spirit so that it will respond to spirit and let spirit flow fully. The means I teach is so simple, it has tremendous power. Even if it did nothing more than break down the stiffened crystallization of aging, that alone would be a miracle. At least twice daily, at any time, and for as many minutes as you wish, stand up, feeling at ease, and as adjustable to the spirit as a willow tree is to the wind. Gently sway your body as a willow tree in a gentle breeze. Sway from your ankles, away from your waistline, forward, back a little, then side to side, and always easily. I know that this alone is nothing new, but the unity of high thought with deep feeling, with mighty overtones, with easy movements, is new, true oneness in expressing spirit. So let the body sway, 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 just a little, and easily and with rhythm. Sway rhythmically as you hum, hum, low and lovingly. The ancient mystics knew this secret of unifying the mighty power of silent overtones with movement, but they knew very little about the human body. So they made two errors. One, they insisted on imitating the tone of a master, their teacher, and two, because of the restriction of their religious ceremonies, they used an erect sitting position while humming. The first error is an error. Your soul is your soul and your body is your body. Hence, you should use your own tone. The second error results in fixation, and hence they spend years in trying to attain what we can now attain quickly. In the next lesson, I carry this work further, teach you a prayer of actual unification of spirit with action, the true wedding of the spirit and the substance in each cell. Let all you do be simply done, and power will come. It works like this. The silent overtones of the humming tune up 800 trillion little cells of your body to vibrate with power. The silent overtones are harmonious, so the love quality in the humming tunes up all of these cells to vibrate in harmony. Then the easy, swaying, rhythmic movement breaks down the stiffened and aged conditions of years and lets spirit flow. Your desire of what you want to attain awakens impulse to attain resulting in action by all cells of your body, unifying all powers of your soul, awakening the brain of spirit itself, and opening the body to spirit energy. One thing more in this lesson. Please, in all work of awakening the brain of spirit, begin prayerfully and lovingly. Do not try to secure quick results. If you could awaken the spirit brain instantly, its power might destroy your body. Even its substance is so powerful that if a physician should inject one drop of its pure substance into your blood, its power would tear through your body, even rip muscles apart. 
In this work, you are not working with mere mind, which merely thinks about power. You are now awakening power itself, spirit, the greatest power of the universe. If you do the work as I give it you to do, the awakening will be normal, and the results transforming. Lesson 9. The Mystic Wedding of Spirit and Matter Use all your powers. Actually use them, and use all of them. Use them to unify the deepest desires of your soul, with its highest ideals, with mighty mystic overtones of spirit, with actual movements of the body itself for the most complete expression. Thus you bring the power in you into actual manifestation. I give you an action prayer for such actual unification. It unifies the spirit that moves the stars with the spirit in you, with the substance of every cell of your body. There are many prayers of words and thought and feeling, but this prayer is fourfold communion with God. Its silent tone tunes your body to vibrate with spirit. Its movement frees the body of its tensity of years. Its aspiration awakens the brain of spirit. Its desire impels spirit to flow into every bodily cell. This supreme unity is attained only when soul realizes and then actualizes its own unity in spirit and action. This prayer of high ideal and deep soul desire is unified with body movement and unheard tones in perfect harmony. To prepare for this, I ask you first to learn which tones to use in such a prayer, to actually wed matter and spirit to create a holy oneness in each cell of your body. You have already heard the quality of overtones vibrating in the flesh and blood and bone of your fingertips. But in this prayer, you initiate even higher overtones to vibrate through the cells of your body. In this prayer, you initiate these higher tones by humming. But in your humming, do not imitate any tone of any other person or of any musical instrument. No two souls or human bodies are alike in manifestation. The fingerprints of no two fingertips are the same. Even bone cells differ with every person. No two people have the same cellular structure. Since all overtones vary with the spirit of the person and also with the structure of the body, no tone of any other person is as beneficial to you as your own tone. This fact is basic truth. Your tones are best for you. Please do not try to imitate tones of any teacher or master. To attain the amazing results we desire, the tones you hum must be mediumly low for your voice, and they must express love. Such tones will tune up every cell of your body by the unknown power of inner sound, vast, silently throbbing overtones initiated by your own voice. These silent overtones possess mighty power, even though your ear can never hear them. So learn to hum, hum, hum. Learn to hum such tones, low and loving, before you begin to use the action prayer. First determine the appropriate pitch of tones to be hummed, and do not try to imitate the pitch of any tone of a piano or the pitch of any tuning fork. Make the pitch of your humming, like the tone you would use, to express your greatest love to the one you love the most. Then it will respond to mystic overtones of stars and atoms. Make the tone pleasing, easy to hum, low and loving. Remember the swaying and humming in Lesson 8, in that the purpose of the easy sway was to free the body of tensity and to prepare it for inflow of spirit. In this prayer of action the purpose is different. It is to take in spirit and wed it to matter. Learn this movement next. Bend forward and down just as you do when you try and touch your toes with your fingers. Do not bend far down. Bend only as far as is easy for you. Merely bend forward and downward and up again easily. This bending is not like the gymnastic or military exercise in which you try to keep the legs straight while bending to touch your toes. This bending is not for goose step efficiency. Do not try to keep the legs straight as you bend forward. This bending should free the body to respond to spirit, so let the hips sag backward. This is what I mean by bending easily. By itself, there is nothing new in this, except that, in bending forward 
as you do in this prayer, you push out the lower part of your back a little. This gives more vibrating space for unheard overtones to multiply near the sacral brain of life. And these overtones increase their power astoundingly with increase of torso space. Hence, with these easy bending movement, you unify use of silent overtones with their power multiplied many times. The preceding nine lines contain the key to the power of the organ tone quality of the voices of the mystics. What follows is the tonal action prayer. Each morning when arising, and each night before retiring, use this simple, powerful, tonal action prayer. Slowly bend forward easily, and as you bend, hum. Hum a low tone, a tone that is easy for you to hum, pleasing to your ear, with all the theme of love you can put into it. Then straighten up, humming the same tone while you do it. Stand erect for a second, quiet, looking forward and upward, to mountaintops of vision of the goal you desire. Then bend again, straighten up again, always humming. Stand a second, eyes to mountaintop of your desire. Repeat this until you bend down and straighten up seven times each morning and seven times each evening. Please do not time your movements. That injects thoughts of mind into it, stiffens actions, opposes spirit. Instead, let spirit in you direct you joyfully, freefully. Move slowly or not, just as you feel like doing, and certainly time of movement may vary each morning and each night. Then, after one week's use of this action prayer, follow the above, each night and morn, by expressing your high ideal and deep love in words, as given in verses which follows. But do not speak the words distinctly, Always keep something of a hum in your tone as you speak. The humming tones are more powerful than speech in silently multiplying the unheard overtones of mighty power in your body. Stand easily erect and look to spirit power sublime and vision what you long to be, and thus repeat or read the following with vibrant hope and certainty divine. I stand expectant here. My aspirations reach under the stars. My soul is longing now to inspire mighty energies divine. My body too is hungry for the vibrant mystic power sublime, and every cell awaits the thrill of energies of silent song, that permeate all atoms here and all the universe afar. Then, next, bend easily and low and use these words. I bend, and bending, feel the vibrant spirit power of mystic harmony, inspire itself into each cell, into 800,000 billion cells, into each cell of which my body is composed. I urge each cell to joyfully respond under the power that swirls from God to me, a great transforming stream, to permeate and flow throughout my body now, this very hour. And now lift up your body once again and pray. I rise again, attuned to all the power of worlds of space each cell a thrill with silent energies divine, each cell alive with mystic harmony sublime, awakening in me the power that meets God face to face. Each factor of this prayer, alone by itself, that is, its words or thought, feeling or movement, may not accomplish much. But when they are united, as I ask you to unite them in this prayer, they multiply each other's power thousandfold. Yet since it is so simple, please do not pass it by. It is the simplest means which has the greatest power. When unified, these means inspire or take in the silent powers of stars to vibrate in and through your body. And then the unheard overtones of your own humming voice will unify themselves with powers of God and all His universe. They open up the channels of your body, Tune it up to full response to spirit, so that the inflow shall reach down into the brain of spirit deep within, and awaken it to free undreamed of power for you to use. Of course, you often awaken powers of mind, but this is spirit, far more powerful, a million times, perhaps a billion times, more powerful than mind. In succeeding lessons, I teach you to use the holy spiral to awaken the impelling power within, to flow out, freely fully into action, to create the actualities of life. Lesson 10. 
Mysterious Likeness of Movement, Body and Spirit. In this work you are awakening response to spirit. Spirit is neither a stagnant nor a theoretical power. Spirit is the cosmic moving power of all the universe. Spirit is the one moving power of atoms and cells and stars. In all ages, savages as well as mystics have sensed the true nature of the movement of spirit. In our language today, in all ancient writings, that word spirit and spiral come from the same basic word root. Every mystic uses these two words as the same. The truth that spirit means spiral reveals the way in which spirit moves. I have taught you to tune up the sounds of your body by use of mystic overtones of silent sound and taught you to blend vibrations of substance and spirit in rhythm to movement unified with the power of silent tone. Now I teach you the movement of spirit, the holy spiral. But please carry on this work prayerfully and lovingly. Do not try to secure quick results either in awakening the brain of spirit or securing spiritual responsiveness of body. If you should awaken the spiritual brain instantly, its freed spirit power would destroy your body. This is no mere scare line, for even the pure substance of this brain has titanic power. If a physician were able to secure one drop of its pure substance and inject it into your blood, its power would act like a bolt of lightning. Rip all muscles from your bones, rip them into shreds, and make even your heart a mere mass of fringe. But do not worry about the possibility of this happening to you. If any physician ever obtains a drop of this pure substance, he will hire a bodyguard to protect it, for it is worth many millions of dollars a drop, even more precious than radium. I cite its power at one, only that you may recognize how many billion times more powerful spirit is than mind, and two, that you may recognize the immensity of power that can thrill a spiritually responsive body, and three, I write of the greatness of this power, so that you shall never try to rush the results of attainment of response to spirit. Work lovingly to tune up your body first. And remember, you cannot awaken spirit by mind action. So start first with mystic silent sound, then rhythmic movement, and then spiral movement. There are great unknown powers in such means. You have already heard marvelous overtones of cathedral bells ringing in your fingertips, there are a thousand other unknown powers of sound, and there are many other initiative powers of God. Spirit power is millions of times greater than mind power because spirit is spiraling power, and all spiral power are magically greater than powers that vibrate forward in straight lines. You remember that an electric current of 25,000 volts kills the body, but that when it is lifted up to a million volts and its frequency increased, it thrills and transforms the body. So it is with all the spiral powers. Please read the following paragraph on vibration of power in substance many times. First, no power can move beneficially through a substance unless the vibratory movement of the substance is lifted up until it is like the movement of the power. Second, Unless the vibration of the substance is thus lifted up, the power either destroys the substance or else it does not even manifest in it. For example, electricity will either shatter glass to powder or it will not manifest through glass because the vibratory movement of glass is not lifted up to the vibration of electricity. So also light cannot shine through iron because the vibration of iron is too slow for the vibration of light. Third, a power cannot manifest beneficially through a substance unless the vibration of the substance is lifted up to the vibration of the power. This is absolute law. You cannot attain great manifestation of spiritual power unless your body vibration is lifted up to vibrate in the same way spirit vibrates. Fourth, you cannot do this with thought. For thought always vibrates forward into a straight line, while spirit speeds forward in spirals. This is why thought or mind has always hindered free expression of spirit all your life. Fifth, spirit can exist without a body, but it cannot manifest without something to manifest through, a body of substance lifted up to the spiral vibration of spirit. Sixth, spirit can manifest in part of your body, 
without being radiated throughout the rest of your body. For example, spirit may manifest in your brain and make you conscious of it without manifesting throughout the body. This makes it possible to think spiritual ideals, even though the rest of your body lacks spiritual power. This leads many a person to think he is spiritual merely because he thinks about spiritual ideals. Seventh, when spirit actually manifests through your body, it transforms it. To attain such transformation, your body must be lifted up to the spiritual or spiral vibration. Eighth, the movement in any substance is always like the movement of the power, which is moving that substance. Ninth, when you see anything moving forward in a straight line, you know it is being moved by some power that vibrates forward in a straight line. And when you see anything moving in a spiral, you know that it could not move in a spiral unless moved by a power that is a spiral moving power. Tenth, the movement of the power moving a substance of body must be like the movement of the substance or the body, otherwise the substance is disintegrated and its form destroyed. This is the most important law of physics. It has never yet been taught in college. Eleventh, we know that mind moves in a straight line vibratory movement because it always tends to make the body and every part of the body move in straight line movements. So also we know that spirit is a spiral moving power because the power of the spirit always tends to make parts of the body move in spiral movements. Hence you can easily determine what kind of soul power is moving in your body at any particular time. If some power moves your arm in a straight line movement, then that power must be a straight line moving power, otherwise it could not produce straight line movement. And if a power tends to move your body in half spiral movements, then the power which is producing such movements must of itself be a spiral moving power. Prove these truths for yourself before a mirror. Twelfth, stand before a mirror and imagine yourself directing a stranger how to reach a place he wishes to find. Tell him to drive four blocks straight ahead, then three blocks to the right. Gesture with your arm as you give him these directions. Watch your movements in the mirror. You use your mind to direct the man and to move your arm. Hence, it is mind which determines the kind of movement your arm makes at such a time. As you point the way the stranger should go, your arm tends to move in straight lines. Even your forefinger is straight as you point in that direction. Thirteenth, now express the love of your soul and watch your movements as you look in the mirror. Your little granddaughter comes into the room and rushes to you. You smile and take her into your arms. Every straight line in your face changes. Every line tends to be curved. You cannot even smile in a straight line. Now stand before the mirror and imagine yourself trying to embrace someone lovingly by moving your arms in straight lines only. It is grotesque and burlesque. Fourteenth, since love moves in wave lines, it makes your body tend to move in a curved movement. I use the phrase tend to move because there are bones in your body and no body movement can be a perfect curve or a complete spiral. Fifteenth, love tends to make your body movements curved and spirit tends to make them spiral movements. Sixteenth, even strong, efficient physical power tends to move in spirals just as spiritual power does. To throw a ball with power, the baseball pitcher twists his body in a half spiral from his feet to his head and even moves his arm in a half spiral as he pitches. Seventeenth, standing before the mirror, imagine yourself pitching a ball by straight line movement. Imagine you have the ball in your hand. Lift your arm on a straight line to throw the ball straight forward. Do not twist or spiral your arm in this test. If you move it in a straight line, you will look like a wooden man with hinges at wrist and elbow and shoulder, and the movement is so weak, it makes you feel weak and look like a sissy to others. Imagine what your habitual straight line tendency of movement has been doing to the cells of your body for years, vibrating through every tissue, every organ, and every cell. Eighteenth. Now test the power effect of spiral movement on your body. Twist your body to throw a ball as a baseball pitcher does. Imagine the great increased power that will come to you 
by changing from habitual, weak-feeling straight-line movement to spiral movement of spirit power. Nineteenth, commit these four truths to memory. Mind always tends to produce movement in straight line. Love tends to produce wave and curve movements. Life and power always tend to produce spiral movements. Spirit is the supreme spiral power of the universe. Twentieth, every power moving in a substance adapts the particles or cells of substance to the nature of its own power. If it did not do this, the substance would be destroyed. 21st, mind always moves in straight line. Hence, it tends to make the cells and tissues through which it vibrates like unto itself, that is, straight-lined. 22nd, when mind vibrates through a cell, the inner particles of the cell form in straight lines. This leads to crystallization, a mentalized, stiffened, aged cell. 23rd, it is impossible for the spiral whirl of spirit to flow freely in a body if its cells are crystallized by mind. 24th, watch your movements in a mirror, and even though you have lived truth for 20 years, ask yourself if you have been using mind truth or spirit power. 25th, spirit is the only spiral moving power. It is the holy spiral of the universe, the holy spirit of the mystics. 26. Mind can awaken mind to illumined ideas, but it can also produce the hallucination that you possess spiritual power when you do not. Spirit is the only inspiring power of the universe. 27. For the greater awakening of the brain of spirit and greater spiritual responsiveness of the body, the body itself must be lifted up to the highest spiritual vibration of the universe, lifted up to respond in movement to the holy spiral. 28. For inflow of spirit, the vibratory movements of your body must be changed, from straight line vibrations of mind to the spiral movement and spiritual vibration of spirit, that is, the vibratory movement of your body must be lifted up so that it is like the movement of spirit itself. 29. The change from straight line movement to use of the holy spiral is the change from death to life of your body, from slow dying day by day to the inspiring of new life hourly. 30th. Since the purpose of this work I am giving you is to secure actual manifestation for you, then mere contemplation of spirit power is not enough, and too much affirmation and meditation of thought may so crystallize the body that inspiration of spirit is hindered. Nothing but actual manifestation of spirit changes and transforms the body and creates heaven for you here and now. 31st. Movement of any power in a body prepares the body for greater inspiration of that power. Every movement of your body is the expression of some power producing the movement and every movement sets up its own kind of vibration in the cells of your body. Straight movement prepares the body for greater mentalization and crystallization. Wave movement opens the channels for greater inflow of love. Spiral movement prepares the body for greater inflow of the holy spiral of spirit. Lesson 11. Training Muscles to Spiral Movement to realize the necessity of changing your body, to an habitual tendency to spiral movement, stand before a mirror and, one, imagine that you are a very old man, so very stiffened that you cannot even turn your head except in straight line movements. Two, imagine yourself to be a youth playing baseball or tennis or watch a youth playing such a game and note how many different twists there are in the movement of the body. Old age is largely restriction to straight line movement. Because as man restricts his body to straight line movements, he shuts off manifestations of spiritual power and limits the body to pure mental effort to move. Moreover, if you watch any 100 people, you find that every movement which gives charm and attractiveness and vitality to a personality tends to be a spiral movement. But please, use common sense both in your judgment of what I mean by spiral movement of the body and as well in your work of carrying out the activities suggested below. 
Use sense with spirit. Never twist or attempt any spiral movement which does not appear to be graceful and which does not feel easy and powerful. Anything that looks grotesque in movement as you watch yourself in a mirror is evidence that you are overdoing the effort to awaken easy spiral movement. I suggest seven different activities to help you change your habitual tendency of movement. But first, I give you a basic spiral movement that is the basis of each activity, one to seven given below. The basic is this. Stand easily with feet a little apart and with your weight on one foot. Twist your body easily in a part spiral to the left, then back to front, then in a part spiral to the right and back to the front. The above is the basic spiral movement to which I refer below. And please remember, any twist of body suggested in this work must not be grotesque but easy and graceful. There are reasons for this training in spiral movement. 1. Each spiral movement gives you increased feeling of manifested power. 2. It lifts up the vibratory condition of your body to be ready to respond to spirit. 3. Since it is spiral in movement, it turns your consciousness from feelings of weakness to a certainty of power in action. The following are the seven spiral activities to use to change your body from its present habitual action to more youthful, more inspiring, and more powerful activity. These begin with slow and gentle twisting of body and proceed to stronger and more viral spiral movement. First, carry through the basic spiral movements and think of a vine climbing upward, reaching to spirit and to sunlight. During the basic spiral movements, either repeat or at least think the thought of these lines. I thrill to the surge of life, as tendrils are thrilled at sunrise. I thrill to the surge of life, as tendrils are thrilled at sunrise. Sunrise, sunrise, as tendrils are thrilled at sunrise. Second, make the twisting of your body a little stronger now, and think of another form of life, the wonderfully beautiful twisting of a young panther. Think only of the beauty in its movement, the grace, the ease, the suppleness. Using the basic method, twist your body as a panther at play, and while doing this, think the thought that follows or commit it to memory and repeat it. I twist myself slowly round, as lithe as a panther at play. I twist myself slowly round, as lithe as a panther at play. As lithe, as lithe, as lithe as a panther at play. Third, now increase consciousness of spiral power. Use the basic spiral movement and think of yourself as a wire spring. Imagine you are twisting your body up as a spring and then letting it untwist a little more rapidly than during the twisting. Fourth, using the basic spiral movement and put your body into position to throw a ball as a baseball pitcher pitches a ball. Pull your arm behind you and half twist your body to the rear then let your body untwirl as a spring untwirls and throw the imaginary ball with a feeling of power. This helps to adjust every large muscle of your body to a spiral movement and to make every cell of such muscle responsive to the movement of spirit power. Fifth, now add thought and feeling to the basic spiral movement of twisting, spiraling, to develop a tendency of such movement of your body. For a minute each night and each morning, with use of the basic spiral movement, move your arm forward and upward, imagining that you are a public speaker, proclaiming a great truth to the audience. With this basic body and arm action, use these words. The power of spirit rules this earth, and war shall pass and peace shall reign. For Holy Spirit is supreme on earth and in the universe. In proclaiming this, do not move your arm upward in a straight line gesture as a prim old woman or a stiffened old man. Instead, move your arm and hand out and up in a half spiral in a gesture of power. Sixth, use your basic spiral movement now with a consciousness of youth instead of that of age. Imitate in your twisting any activity you have seen in the movement of a child at play or a youth in a game. Don't think of being a child or a youth but feel the spirit of the child or youth in you, expressing in movement as the child or youth expresses the power of life in them, the newness of life. All these seven activities do initiate a new tendency of spiral movement within the body. Do not try to make a whirling spiral of your body. 
Instead, establish a habitual tendency to spiral movement to free you from the dominant and habitual straight line movement which ages the cells, lessens free movement, and stiffens muscle action. This work brings back the spiral movement of youth. The spiral movement is dominant in youth. The straight line movement is dominant in old age. The ancient mystics knew the power of the holy spiral. It affects every cell of your body and prepares the body for greater inflow of spiritual power. And spiritual power is different from mind, a million times greater than mind power. Seventh, think of the spiral movement as a symbol of life, ever tending to spiral up from earth toward heaven. Use the basic spiral movements, respond to the feeling of life within you, moving upward through your body and outward through your fingers of your uplifted hands, using just such arm motions as you did when proclaiming the power of a great truth to an audience. Repeat several times, spiraling a little faster each time, to break down the stiffened, straight line, mentalized, crystallized, old age condition of your body. But please understand that none of these seven activities are evidence of spiritual power in your body. These activities are given to train the muscles of the body to a tendency of spiral movement so that the body will be fitted to respond to spirit, ready for the power of spirit to move through it. Do this work, and you shall begin to manifest spirit, the highest power of the universe, changing your body from an aging structure to one thrilled by youthful spirit. A few souls in all ages have risen to this height, and now thousands, because of our new knowledge, can change their bodies to greater manifestations of spirit and action. I am praying, friend, that you shall be one of them, in the next lesson, I teach you to unify the holy spiral of movement with the mystic powers of silent tone, with the power of rhythm, and to blend all in the oneness of spirit. Lesson 12. The Rhythmic Multiplying Power The strangest thing in life to me is our stupidity. We fail for years to recognize the great astounding means of power all around us all the time, ere waiting to be used. You know rhythm is power. Just a few minutes of flowing rhythmic music which you like is a rest. And no matter how fatigued you are, you can often dance for an hour to rhythmic music and be rested by it. We have known this truth for centuries, and yet we have not recognized that rhythm is a power of God, an operative power to be used to multiply our energy a hundredfold. You also know your little heart does work each hour which would exhaust four husky men, each weighing 175 pounds. It is strange that a rhythmic beat can perform such a miracle. We know gigantic stars have circled on for eons of time. We know God moves them rhythmically. We know that their titanic energies are tireless for many billions of years. We know that jerking movements exhaust us and rhythm rests us. We now know we can dance to rhythm without fatigue, but that jerking the same muscles about spasmatically for the same length of time would nervously exhaust us. We know that rhythmic music is cigar factories increases production more than 300% increasing energy of workers three times. But have you thought of using rhythm to increase your energy 300% every hour? We know that engineers found that husky steel plant workers were exhausted from carrying 12 and a half tons of pig iron a day, and that the same man when taught to move rhythmically carried 47 tons a day with less fatigue. We have been stupid and not realizing that rhythm, which gives your heart the power of four husky men, is a power. Think of your little heart and the secret of its amazing energy. There is nothing extraordinary about its muscle fiber or its nerves. Yet its power transcends anything purely muscular or physical. It weighs about 12 ounces, yet each hour it does work enough to lift two and a half tons of concrete one foot off the ground. It works every hour day and night, for sixty or a hundred years. What are the two secrets of its power? 1. Your mind almost completely lets it alone. And 2. Its rhythm is near perfection. It makes us ashamed that we have been so stupid that we have not recognized that rhythm is a power to be used. Rhythm is one of the great operative soul powers. It banishes fatigue and multiplies power a thousand times. Think of your heart and envision what rhythm can do for all your body, increasing energy many times and transforming the activities of every organ of your body. Rhythm possesses its titanic power because it is of spirit. Spirit itself is rhythmic. 
If spirit were not rhythmic, it would have caused so much friction that it would have disrupted the universe eons ago. Since spirit is rhythmic, you cannot greatly increase your body's response to spirit unless your body is made more rhythmic. No, I do not mean that you must dance rhythmic dances or frequently skip about on toe tops waving your arms, but I do mean that your body will not respond to spirit in its fullness unless it moves with an inner rhythm, from the soles of your feet to the top of the head and the tips of your finger. The phenomenal power of rhythm is proven to be titanic even in ordinary work. Remember the husky steel workers. To attain the greater manifestation of spirit you desire, you must tune up your body to rhythmic movement. Energy is energy, and energy is rhythmic action is tireless. Rhythm and action is the lost cord of our use of our powers. Most people, as you know, use up lots of energy without attaining great results because they lack the power of rhythm and try to live contrary to the spirit power of the universe. Unify your desire with movement, with silent tone, and with rhythm, and you attain the perfect oneness of power. Even my instructions of this lessons I soon give in rhythm, so that, if you but read them every day, and let your body respond in rhythm to the words, with beating throb of inner rhythm, it will prepare your entire body to respond to spirit. In this, it makes little difference whether or not you can carry a tune or any particular musical air. Just sort of chant or sing or hum the words to any kind of song or chant, or use a tune that you make up, and a difference one day an hour if that appeals to you. Tap out the rhythmic beat of the words, or move your entire body with it, for rhythm is virile power of earth and heaven. It is not necessary to learn the sections which follow, but keep the words by you and read them several times each day, and let your body move a little with the rhythm entire body or a part of it, even tapping out the rhythm of your feet or swaying with it. Do not be afraid to let your body feel the virile, rhythmic power of God. It is the only means of manifesting tireless energy of stars, of atoms, or the body or cells. As overtones tune up vibration of the body cells, so rhythm tunes up the movement of the body to throb with spirit power and then multiplies the power one thousandfold. So read rhythmically the words which follow until their rhythm is habitual to you, habitual to every organ, every cell, so each will feel the rhythmic beat of every other cell, and multiply your manifested power a thousandfold. I wish you now to feel, and strongly feel, the rhythmic beat of marching men. I want you to feel the rhythm within your consciousness, pulsating in and through your body, till it throbs with rhythmic power in every cell. I want you now to let your body move in full response to the simple rhythm of the words which follow below. I want you to feel the virile, rhythmic power of God that multiplies all other powers a thousandfold. I want you to think of this as little as you can, but to feel so much that it will thrill you through and through. I want you to live the Master's words to take no anxious thought for anything, but to live each hour so that his joy shall be fulfilled in you. This hour I put myself in rhythmic tune, with all the harmony of all the universe. I close my eyes and vision all my body cells, 800,000 billion cells, alive with rhythmic harmony, that comes from distant stars sublime to penetrate the deepest depth and waken both my body and my soul to holy power divine. I let my body feel the rhythmic beat of stars, I let my body move in rhythmic harmony and dance with life that throbs in every cell. I let each cell respond to music movement born of stars that multiplies all other powers a thousandfold and makes of man a god on earth and gives him a life sublime of peace and love and joy and power divine. Rhythm is a divine operating power of the soul. It is the means which God uses to make all great powers manifest the greatest good. The proof is certain. Use mind jerkily, and you set every cell in your body on edge, and stir up antagonism of people around you. Use love jerkily, and people will pity you, but not love you. Use the life power jerkily, and you wreck your body. Sometimes it is wise to use some light, gay, rhythmic movement as a start in breaking down old fixed conditions 
so that the body will respond more easily to the higher rhythms. If you have need to break down the old stiffened conditions, then use some jaunty tune you know, such as, My Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean, and chant the words which follow to that tune. My body is thrilling to rhythm, and dancing to music of stars. My body is dancing to rhythm, that multiplies power in me. Rhythm, rhythm, rhythm and power in me, in me, rhythm and rhythm, that multiplies power in me. I thrill to the dance of atoms, that dance to the rhythm of joy. I dance to the rhythm of atoms, that multiplies power in me. I wonder, if I hear you say, Some people may need such work, but I do not, for I dwell in the consciousness of divine mind, and all of truth is included in it. Certainly, all is included in what you term divine mind, and that is why you should not shut out the rhythm of God and His holy spiral and the mystic overtones of His creation. Let me caution you, my friend, if you hold to the thought that all you need to do is to think of the high ideals of God, then you are taking an anti-Christ attitude. Christ positively taught that you cannot add one cubic of your stature by thought, and he added that God is spirit and that man must worship him in spirit. God conceived all things with infinite love. He used the holy spiral of spirit to whirl his stars into universes, electrons into atoms, and atoms into cells. You cannot deny the means God used without failing to attain what you desire. God used the mystic power of silent overtones to tune up all manifestation to be at one in divine harmony. God used divine rhythm to bring all things he created into harmonious activity. You cannot neglect the use of these operative powers of God without suffering the loss due to such neglect. To become godlike, you must manifest as God manifests. Tuning up the body to constant inner rhythm tune ups the consciousness to constant feel of peace and love and joy and power. Lesson 13 the power of the holy unity in use. I write this lesson that you shall not think too much of the information given, but feel more, to get into the feeling of spirit, to be more ready to respond to spirit. When you study the use of each power separately, it leads to much thinking and thought of mind, but unity in use leads to a feeling of inspiring attainment, because as soon as they are in use, you have a feeling of doing something and do not think so much about them. It is like learning a new dance step. You think of its separate movements while learning, then stop thinking and lose yourself in the joy of the music and the movement and the rhythm. So in this, I lead you to unity in use, for joy in use. This unity in use is the only means of attaining actual oneness of power, which makes you godlike, so that there shall be no failure in your efforts to attain whatsoever you desire. Such oneness is a spiritual blend of all soul power, of all conceptive powers of mind, love, life, and spirit, blended with use of all the operating powers of the mystic unheard overtones, the silent spoken word, the holy spiral of spirit and rhythm that multiplies the power of all. And the activating power of all soul power is soul desire. Remember when I was seventeen, an invalid too weak to walk, yet when there was a fire I dragged two heavy trunks of treasured manuscripts downstairs and across the street. The power to perform that feat was activated for the moment, and it was not awakened by thought, for if I had stopped to think about it, I could not have done it. My power was activated by intense desire to save the trunks without any thought of my illness or lack of strength. Desire is the spiritual catalyst of the soul, and the less thought there is about it, the more powerful desire is. So do not confuse desire with mere wish or affirmation. A wish of mind or an affirmation, whether wishy-washy or intense, is a headlight which, whether dim or brilliant, merely reveals what you wish for. But desire is different. It is spiritual engine power. It is always moving you to get what you want. It is the only power that turns all other powers into action. Desire moves mind, not only to think, but to do something about what you think. Desire moves love not merely to love, but to do something to win love and attain what you love. Desire moves life to multiply and reproduce results. 
desire moves spirit to inspire man with God power to work transforming changes. We have missed the use of this power of desire in the past because we have tried to awaken it by mind and mind hinders it. Now, however, with new knowledge of the brain of spirit, a new world is opening to us, the possibility of using desire at any time to activate all the other soul powers, so that its use will not be incidental, as in my dragging those trunks to the street. Use the divine mind in you to vision, one, your present status in life, two, the goal you wish to attain, three, the powers you can use to attain, and four, the means of using each power. Use mind as a searchlight to seek out the goal. Use it as a headlight to illumine the way to it. And use divine love. Lovingly love all the billions of cells of your body, so they will have their being in your love. And so love one another, and they will work in perfect harmony, resulting in enduring energy without fatigue. And love every quality of everything, its form, color, sound, hardness or softness, roughness or smoothness lightness or weight, and if a scientist, its chemical qualities, and then you will find new abundance of which you have not dreamed. Use love to love your fellow man. Use it as the power that holds all things together, stars in their course, electrons together, and atoms, and you and others together, so it will be impossible not to love and not be loved. And use life to whirl old cells in the mystic weddings of energy and substance to form new cells for a youthful body. Use life to give new form to things you desire in life, multiplying them limitlessly into the abundance of life. And use spirit, open to it, let it inspire into you the God powers of the universe to transform body and transfigure soul. I ask you to use all powers of your soul, the conceptive powers, the operative power of the mystic silent overtones, and of the holy spiral and movement, and of the rhythm of the stars. Do as God does. Use the operative power to initiate the use of the higher conceptive power in your body and your life. Vision first, the transformation of your body. Thus, I vision cells conceived anew in me, each cell reborn, attuned to all the spirit power of rhythmic songs of stars. Eight hundred thousand billion cells, embraced in love divine as tenderly as mother holds their babies to their hearts of love each cell inspired by thrill of life divine, to wed and multiply a million fold, to be reborn and born again, to live forever youthfully. And second, intensify desire in you. Each time you hum a tone of love to start a thousand silent overtones of mystic power, each time you move with holy spiral power of spirit energy, each time your body feels the rhythmic beat of stars, desire what you want with all your heart. And third, lift up your soul to use of all your powers in harmony with rhythmic beat, with mystic overtones, all whirled into expression, here by God's divinely spiral power, which God himself has used to whirl creation into actuality. Lift up your soul to unify all power with strong desire, for in the blend of all there is the oneness we call God. And fourth, make this your prayer of unity in use. I long, as I have never longed before with deep desire, of deepest depth within the feeling of my soul. I long to unify all powers that God has given me to use, so that God's mind reveals whatever it has conceived for me, so that God's love in me shall dare to love as it has long desired to love, so that God's life in me shall multiply all things abundantly, so that God's spirit shall ever blend with spirit of my soul to make me like to God with power to turn desires of heaven unto actualities of earth. O oh, listen, friend, unto the mystic music of the stars, and feel the mighty swirl of spiral power, and let your body feel the mighty rhythm of the universe, and you shall know the oneness that is God, and enter heaven here and now. Lesson 14. Seven Goalposts and Guides this work is so new, its basic discovery so astounding, its results so nearly miraculous, it seems so simple and different from those usually taught, that it is wise to clarify the seven bases of progress by which you attain most quickly. 
First, work for actual manifestation of what you want, not for mere thought about it. Second, truth is not yet complete in man's manifestation, but is forever seeking fuller expression. Third, accept and use the operative soul power, that is, those powers which help to initiate the use of greater powers. Fourth, mighty, silent overtones of stars can vibrate in and through your body if you initiate them by low and loving tones. Fifth, spirit has movement, and the spiritual energies of the movement of the universe are always rhythmic. Sixth, spirit vibrates spirally, and the holy spiral of God's universe is an operative power of your soul. Seventh, today is God's age of transforming change for man, and your progress can increase mightily now if you realize that you are chosen to effect a transformation now. The first goal is vision clearly, when you consecrate yourself to attain the two heavenly conditions man wants, one, free flow of spirit into man, and two, free radiation of spirit out into every activity of life. Second, be certain that the ideal of what you want is different from the process by which you will attain it. Be certain also that the process is just as divine as the ideal. Just as ideals of truth are perfect, although we have not yet attained one-tenth of those we affirm, so also in essence a soul is perfect, although we have not yet perfected its manifestation. I wish to teach how to attain greater manifestation, to be more responsive to spirit for more complete expression of life. Third, use all four conceptive powers of your soul, mind, love, life, and spirit, for they are born of God, radiate to man, to make man like unto God. There are other powers, the great initiating powers. These initiative powers are just as divine as the conceptive powers, for all are of God. It is silly to select one of God's powers and insist that it is the power of God and that all other powers are not of God. Mind and sound, love and light, life and electronic rays, spirit and cosmic rays, each is a power of God. All energies are powers of God. God created all of them and commanded man to use all he created. Use each to produce after its own kind, but do not expect goof results if you try to substitute one for another. Fourth, increase your energy by one, daring to recognize your likeness to the divine source of energy in its limitless, and two, by tuning up your body to harmonize all its billions of cells to work together without friction. Fifth, increase the flow of energy into action by divine rhythm of action and use of all powers. Sixth, do not let mind hinder the awakening of spirit. Every fussing thought about details does interfere. Thoughts of what the soul should or should not do have hindered free expression of spirit to limitations of time and space. Be intelligent, but take no anxious thought of anything. Use common sense. In one of my booklets I have written of the inner light of cells, of inner foods, hormones produced within the body, and of the marvelous magicians within the body, the endocrine gland, of phenomenal changes of weight, restructuring of organs and tissues by the hormones produced within the body. Yet in spite of all those words of inner and within, a few students always write asking, why do not tell them where to get such inner food, where to buy them? Please understand, you cannot buy the highly spiritualized substance of inner food produced in your own body. They are created within, by spiritual responsiveness. Seventh, do not limit your development. Limit your effort and you get limited results, but multiply power and respond greatly and you manifest greatly. Part 2. Awakening the Brain of Spirit Lesson 15. The New Response this lesson 15 is the first lesson of part 2 of this course. It is entitled, The New Response. By this title I mean one, spiritual response, and two, response that is new in your life. New to every cell of your body as well as to your soul. In the past you have probably thought of spiritual responsiveness of motives, desires, and ideals of the mind. But I teach you the basis of all responses. 
I teach you the spiritual response of the body itself, of its very tissues and particularly of its activities. And that means the activity of the muscles. You will never attain the highest degree of spiritual consciousness until you lift up your mind to recognize that the cells and tissues are just as divine as the most ideal thought your mind can conceive, for God created all things. Moreover, there is no way on earth by which your soul can express anything except through your muscles. There is no expression possible except by movement of the large muscles of your body, or movement of small muscles for facial expression or expression by the words and tones you use. And you cannot speak one word or utter one tone except by muscle action of chest walls, cheeks, lips, and tongue. There cannot even be a gleam in your eye except little tiny muscles change the thickness of the lens of your eyes. Read the above, if necessary, a hundred times. I mean it a hundred times, once a day for three months. That may not be too much to open your mind to the great illumination that all expressions of soul depends on your muscles. And all expression increases in power as you tune up the muscle to spirit, thus only you attain Godhood in action. Expression of spirit is the highest attainment in this life. It is manifesting as God intended you to manifest in His likeness. And only, when body tissues are responsive enough to receive infinite energy, can spirit manifest freely and fully. Certainly you now recognize you are a radiation of the divine rays of the universe, of the marvelous powers that are forever constructive, the very powers which God himself used during the seven days of creation, when he created all things which have existed for hundreds of millions and even billions of years. And that which has continued for billions of years must be right, for evil always destroys itself and all it creates. Hence the seven creative powers of God, manifesting in man, must be the very constructive essence of God himself. Manifesting these powers is different from merely thinking the thought that you are made in the likeness of God. This differs from affirming or declaring it or meditating about it. I teach manifestation, not thoughts about manifestation. And these lessons teach you the easy approach to becoming more responsive to these spiritual powers by the simplest and most effective means you can use in this life on earth so that you can enter the temple of transformation. Cosmic energy can penetrate your body so that you feel the thrill of it if your conscious mind does not block it. So I ask you to think as little about this work as possible. That is, think just enough to get the information necessary to tell you what to do. Then live in response to the urge of spirit to carry out the exercise that may be given, not as exercises, but as means of easy response of body, free expression of the soul. Some lessons will be long, other lessons will be short. Each will contain all that it is essential for you to know in order that you may learn to respond to the fullest degree possible. Infinite spirit forever surrounds you and from it you receive all the energy you can ever manifest on this earth. And spirit is the source of everything you can ever attain on this earth or manifest in heaven. The meaning of spirit is the essence of all power. For example, the light you see on earth, that is, light of the sun, never comes from the sun as light. Instead, it is the spirit of light which radiates from the sun. It is pure light, light that is never seen by the human eye, the perfect light of God. The sunlight, which you do see on earth, is not pure light. In actual fact, it is nothing but the friction that is created by the air as the pure sunlight tries to get through it. There is proof. When scientists rise high in balloon, even on midday, it is almost dark in the upper atmosphere. There is very little crude light up there because there is very little air up there and hence little friction. And when man mounts still higher, there is absolute darkness, that is, what we call sunlight is crude friction of true black light passing through air. And since air does not exist out in space, there is no light out there which the eye can see. There is only the pure unseen light of God. So I make a real distinction between this crude light on earth and the spirit of light which is the essence of light, the holy unseen light, light such as God knows. There is also a spiritual essence of X-rays and of ultraviolet rays and of all radiant rays. All we know of them on earth is the crude friction, 
due to pure rays trying to plow either through air or more solid substance here on Earth. Likewise, I make a distinction between mind, as manifested by man on earth, and the spirit of mind. All those who dwell in mind dwell in the realms of thought, and thoughts are forever changing and forever dying. Not by might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts, and the Hebrew word translated might means strength of mind. At this point I caution you again against trying to classify or mentalize and thus kill the essence of this work. A few months ago I received an outline made by a student, an outline of two lessons of this course. This woman wrote that she was rewriting this course so that it would be right. She said she had classified and numbered the exercises so she could do all of them efficiently, practically, and in 11 minutes each day. In essence what this woman says is this. I have classified and numbered expressions of love so that I can get all expressions of my love for my loved ones out of the way in 11 minutes each day, and thus my life becomes efficient and practical. What she calls practical is killing the spirit of love, killing the response of mind and body to spirit, and substituting mere thoughts of mind for the love and life of spirit. Assume that you are a young sweetheart and that your lover comes home after two years across the sea in military service. He enters your home, and as you walk toward the door to greet him, you stop halfway and say, John, since you've been away, I've worked out very efficient and practical means of expression of our love. I have scheduled a plan for our manifestation of it. We will take exactly one half of a second for one kiss, no more, then three quarters of a second for an embrace, after which we will sit on a sofa and hold hands for two minutes and ten seconds. I do not need to explain. You know that any such attempt will first dampen response to your love, then freeze it, then kill it. Mentalization of expressing love can completely kill the love within a month, so also with expression of spirit. If this woman has worked out response to spirit just right, then it's not worth teaching, certainly not worth living it. So I caution you, my friend. Think just as little as possible about the information on these lessons. Give only enough thought to them to know what you should do. Then forget the thought and live the love and life of spirit. Keep always these two truths in mind, my friend. First, life and love and spirit are completely different from the much lesser powers of the thoughts of conscious mind. Second, conscious mind is a mechanicalized skeleton in activity, an actual hindrance in manifesting life and love and spirit. You know this is true, for you know that nothing has ever interfered so much with the full and free expression of your life as the thoughts of conscious mind, which have forever been saying, you can't do this, you can't do that, you haven't the strength to do this, or what will people say if you do it? All hindrances to response to spirit are due one, to thoughts of conscious mind, or two, such slowness of body vibration that its tissues do not fully respond to spirit. One of the great inspired English poets whom I intimately knew compared the place of conscious mind and thought in our lives to the box of tools which a carpenter uses. Except when using thought, thought should be laid quietly aside as a carpenter put his tools aside when he is through with them. But up to this time, Living in a world of thought, you have become a slave to mind. You even take your thoughts to bed with you and cannot sleep, and if you do sleep, your mind unconsciously races on all night, and you awake and tired in the morning. Be as wise as the carpenter is wise. Put aside your box of tools of the mind each time you are through with them, and then live love and life and spirit. I am the poet of hitherto unuttered joy. I see the heavens laughing, Yet I dare not say what I see, lest I be locked up. These things I say, not to excite thought in you, but rather to destroy it. Or if it does excite thought, then to excite that which destroys itself. Spirit is not born of thought, and whoever dwells among thoughts dwells in the region of delusion and disease. Although thought should gird you round about, forget not to disindue it, as the man takes off his coat when hot. As a skilled workman lays down his tool when done with it, so shall you use thought. And then lay it quietly aside again when it has served your purpose. Yet you do go about through life carrying a box of thoughts on your back, 
The carpenter is wiser. He does not sit down to eat or go out to court the girl he loves, or come back home and go to bed with a box of tools always hung on his back. Thoughts are tools of the mind. Use them and put them aside. This is the first step in learning to let your body respond more fully and free to spirit. Forever avoid teachers and instructors, lessons and books which teach you exactly how to do things in a definite fixed way. Fixity of operation is good for a machine, but death to initiative, death to inspiration, death to responsiveness. Just how can help you to be a good machine? But a machine always wears out and is soon thrown aside. You are more than an efficient machine. You are a creator, created in the image and likeness of God, a living soul, with power to manifest continuously, with increasing activity, increasing youthfulness, increasing life, love, power, and spirit, all of these which come only by response to spirit. Lesson 16. Inspiring Matter with Spirit the new response of the body to spirit starts with something which may perhaps surprise you. It must begin with the means by which the spiritual energy of the infinite enters the body. There are great dynamos of spirit power in your body, within your actual physical body. There are great motors of tremendous power in your body. But the energy which they radiate, the energy that flows over your nerves, comes from outside your body. From the word spirit, we derive our word inspiration. Inspiration is the act of inspiring energy, that is, the activity of energy spiraling itself into your body. It is impossible to find any illustration that is fully true, for the soul is greater than anything else man knows on earth, and the human body is the most marvelous organic mechanism of all God's creation. Hence there is nothing to which soul and body can be truly compared. Soul and body transcend all other things on earth, and nothing completely illustrates that which takes place when infinite spirit which surrounds you flows into and through your body. But in some factors, comparisons are true. Great generators in a powerhouse can generate no electricity unless there is electronic energy flowing to them from all the universe. Such energy surrounds every powerhouse, penetrates it, and fills every inch of space in and around every machine. It is the electronic energy of the universe that makes it possible to inspire energy into the generators, so that when they operate, they can radiate electrically out along wires. So also, all the power that radiates from your soul or in and through your body is first inspired into the structure of your body by infinite energy which forever surrounds you. And in proportion as you increase responsiveness of tissues of your body, lift them up to respond more fully to the higher vibrating energies of the universe, in that degree will you manifest more spiritual energy in every activity of life. In beginning this new response, let me again emphasize that all power first comes to you from outside your body. It is inspired into the structure of your body, either to be used at once or else stored up as titanic power to be released later and radiated out into manifestation. But where does this energy inspire into your body? What is the means used? The means must be some part of your body whose cells are more sensitively responsive to spiritual energy and all higher energies of the universe than any other cells of your body. To this time you have thought of your ears as miraculous receptors because they are able to receive vibrations of tones vibrating up to 24,000 times a second. It is marvelous that nerves of the ear can respond so amazingly to such high overtones of sound. Also your eyes seem to be the most amazing organism ever developed. It is a camera that adjusts its own lenses to different amounts of light. Then its retina adjusts its nerves instantly to different length of light vibration. Some of the little nerve cells on the rods and cones of the retina of your eyes can receive vibrations that range from 400 trillion times a second up to 700 trillion a second, that is, from lowest reds to highest violet the human can see. It is marvelous the delicate responsiveness of the nerve cells of the rods and cones of the retina of the eye. Yet the nerves of the ear and the nerves of the eye cannot equal another tissue of your body in responsiveness. 
it is the most receptive organ of all your body. Some physiologists now call it the mirror of the soul. And what is it of which I am writing? It is your skin, the most miraculous organ of your body. It is different from all other organs. It is a physical body by itself. It is composed of cells that are the opposite of the cells of all other organs of your body. And most of your body is three-fourth water. But if skin cells are put in water, they die. And if they are put in darkness, they die. It is your spiritually responsive body. It is your skin composed of cells which must have light and air, although all cells of the inner body die if exposed to light or air, even for a second. Cells of skin originate from the same kind of cells as do cells of the brain and nerves and the endocrine gland. They are the miracle cells of the body. One physiologist even calls the skin the miracle organ of the body. The skin is the inspiring organ, the only organ that can take in the energies of God so that they can be embodied in the brain dynamo and then radiated to all parts of your body. In your skin alone, there are two billion receiving sets. If this seems strangely impossible to you, that is, that there are billions of receiving sets in your skin which receive power from the universe, realize that scientific engineering has already developed power sending and receiving apparatus here on Earth for use in a practical mechanical engineering way. Towers can be built to send out power, just as we have towers that broadcast radio waves which are carried to your radio set and turned into sound. It is possible to build towers that radiate power, so that if you are within 500 miles with an automobile with a power receiving set, you can tune in to that tower of wireless power and receive power for the engine of your car, sufficient to run it anywhere within a radius of 500 miles. And of course, this radiance of power may, in a few years, be so improved that it can be used anywhere within a thousand miles or five thousand mile radius of such a tower. I cite this only to illustrate four great truth. One, all great power first exists outside of the structure. Two, it is inspired or taken into the structure. Three, it can be inspired or taken in only if the structure is responsive to the power. And four, the degree of power taken in depends on the degree of responsiveness of the structure of your body. To receive such power, your physical structure must be tuned into it, must be responsive to it. And you, in this most marvelous organ of your body, your skin, have more than two billion receiving sets capable of receiving the highest power of the universe. The receiving sets in every area of your skin are infinitely more responsive to higher energies than the nerves of your eye or even those marvelously delicate nerves of the retina of the eye. The proof that the skin is more responsive is the fact that it does respond to much higher powers than eye or ear. Your eye cannot perceive x-rays, yet your skin can respond to them and inspire them into your body, even all through your body except through your bones. And nerves of the eye are so dull compared to skin cells that they cannot receive ultraviolet light. But skin cells are so responsive to spirit they can receive ultraviolet rays and transmit them to all inner organs. In preparing for this new response to spirit, this response even of your body to spirit, clearly vision the truth that your skin is the one most miraculous organ of your entire body. Look at it in a new way. Reverence it, for it is the bridge between all that is manifesting as you and all that is not you. It is the receiving, inspiring organ of incarnating spirit. It is the bridge between the infinite power that surrounds you and the energy of all the inner structure of your body. There are 800 billion cells in your body. That number may not seem much in words, so I put them in a figure. 800 billion cells, that is, 400,000 times as many as all the people on Earth. Each cell is a living individual, and the very life of each one, the vitality of each one, its every impulse to act and move to live in love, and to respond to spirit depend on how much energy is inspired into your skin by your skin and then carried into your inner body. So look upon every skin cell as an angel from God, an angel to take in the powers of God and transmit them to all the body. 
This is the very basis of the new response to the physical structure of your body to the infinite energy of God. The skin is means of the inspiration of matter by spirit and the inspiration of matter with spirit. The vibration of matter must be tuned up to that of spirit, otherwise the matter is destroyed by spirit entering it. Only as the rate of vibration of matter approaches that of spirit can spirit flow into it in its infinity. It is this full inflow of spirit which lifts you to living in the image and likeness of God. If I have not previously written of this likeness, I write of it now, so you will understand what we mean when we accept God's statement that he made man in his own image and likeness. The Hebrew language is confusing to those who know only the English. It differs greatly from our English language. Often it uses the same root word to form the noun and adjective and verb and adverb all in one sentence. It does this often for powerful emphasis. For example, consider a Hebrew word like play. In using this word, an ancient writer might have written, The player played the play playfully. This is what was done in the original Hebrew sentence that is translated, God made man in his own image and likeness. Root words of similar meaning are used as the basis of the words translated, made, own, image, and likeness. The meaning of the root words is activity. So the full meaning of this great truth is this. God, the infinite activity, activated the activity called man by his own activity to be like unto God's own activity. It is inactivity that man is like God. And since the meaning is repeated four times in made, own, image, and likeness, realize the great emphasis God gave to this truth to help you to comprehend it in its full significance. It is response to this activity which guarantees attainment of all that is worthwhile in earth and in heaven. This is the ultimate attainment desired of the new responsiveness, greater activity by means of spiritual response, so that the body may become more like spirit and manifest spirit more fully and more completely like unto a God on earth. Now, in the next two lessons, prepare the skin as a mystic organ for higher response to spirit to inspire more of spirit. Lesson 17. The Newly Discovered Unity in Radiance I teach you spirit and its expression through the body. Spirit is the God urge of expression. It is the outpouring and outpushing of God Himself. It fills all spaceless space and surrounds and permeates every star and atom of creation with infinite power. It floods the universe, including you, with titanic energy. Moreover, spirit is ready to thrill your body, yes, even your physical body, with such a flood of energy that ill health and fatigue, weakness of old age, will be impossible. Spirit is ready to contact you intimately and continuously. I know your earnestness, hoping, praying, trying again, and yet, although you have for years, and faithfully still, mind and body are not yet fully responsive to spirit. Yes, even after the years, there are lacks. Your body is not yet vitalized. It is not yet fully inspired by spirit. There is lack of the abundance. There is lack of full joy and lack of constant contact and communion with the all-knowing spirit. I am not criticizing, but my heart feels for your effort, which up to this time have not yet been fully fulfilled. So I wish to help you discover the cause of the failure of your efforts, so you shall attain response so the lack will disappear. The cause is this. In the past, no matter how consecrated you have been, your mind has tended to move in one direction, while spirit is always moving in the opposite direction. Spirit is always radiating outward, ever outward, and all spirit is always inspiring itself into whatever responds to it. Think clearly. Mind is always reaching out to get ideas and perception and take them back into itself. Instead of radiating outward as spirit does, mind is always seeking to take in information to within itself. Even in meditation, mind tends to look within the self to find power instead of recognizing that supreme power is outside the soul 
and available for use only when inspired into the self. So when you use mind too much, even when you think too much of what you are doing in this work, you use the power of mind, which works in the opposite direction to that of spirit, for spirit is radiance from God, the out-moving power of God. So with mind always tending to pull ideas to itself, and spirit radiating outward, there is subconscious conflict. Oh, see the significance of this. It explains why you have failed, even when trying earnestly to attain your desire. So I first teach you that to be an aspiring seeker and adjuster, to stop thinking enough, so that you can respond enough to spirit, so that spirit can inspire itself into your mind and body. Without inspiration, all effort ends in disappointment. But response to the divine, inspiring ray brings heaven to earth. It brings the divine energies of heaven into your desires and into the earth of actualities for you, even into your body. The inspiring ray is the first ray used by God in creation. Respond to it, and you create as God creates. Respond to it, and for the first time, you will begin to unify body and mind and spirit to move together in the same way at the same time with power of unity you have never known before. Then ills of body and lack of energy disappear. Failures turn to success. Feelings of being separated from it and from those whom you love vanish. I teach you to respond to spirit and to its seven sacred rays of creation. These rays are called the Elohim rays. The word ray is now used by scientists to designate each distinct group of radiant energies. The word Elohim, you will remember, is the Hebrew word in the first chapter of our Bible, which is translated God. But its ending, I am, in the Hebrew, means that it is plural. Hence it should be truly translated, God's powers. There are seven of these creative powers, seven holy Elohim rays of God. The Elohim rays are much higher than any radiant energy yet known to scientists, vibrating far above septillion times per second. Each ray has a particular vibration of its own, and whenever it vibrates through any substance, it produces a particular result of its own in that particular substance. That is creation. Even common earth rays possess this transforming power. The common heat ray, for example, has such power. You've seen it work. A chunk of hard butter in the presence of heat rays soon changes its form and becomes just melted yellow grease. Sound is also a very common ray, so common you do not realize that it also has transforming power. But sprinkle a thin layer of sand on a tin platter and tap the edge to produce sound, so the sound rays make a platter ring and the layer of the sand is transformed. It forms beautiful designs, circles, squares, diamonds, and stars. But Elohim rays have power millions of times greater than any of the ordinary rays known on earth. I have already stated the main cause of your lack of attainment is the inner conflict between your mind and spirit. Of course, you may not consciously know of this conflict, for mental mind seldom knows the mystic working of spirit. But certainly you do know that your body is not yet constantly thrilled with the power of spirit, and you do know that your communion with spirit is not yet consciously continuous. Conflict is not in ideals, but in opposition of activity. Your mind tries to make the powers of your soul move one way inward, while spirit moves in the opposite way outward. But when mind and spirit work together, results are as certain as God and as wonderful as miracles. Since it is mind that is to blame, there is but one way of solving this conflict. It must adjust its old ideas. This is attained only when you make the activity of both your mind and body like unto the activity of spirit. Then you respond to the divinely inspiring ray of God. To help you in this, learn the nature of spirit's activity. First, spirit is never passive, but always infinitely active. Second, spirit never turns inward on itself. These two truths are known to all scientists and to many spiritual thinkers, and hundreds of books teach them. 
Yet few students use them, and most teachers urge you to dwell in attitude which oppose spirit, to be passive instead of active, to look within instead of looking outward for inspiration. What is your mind doing, working with or against spirit? First, spirit is ever active, yet your mind, because of mistaken teachings, tries to make you become passive in the infinite silence in order to be at one with spirit's activity. This opposes spirit, for spirit is infinitely active. Passivity may make you into a good sponge to soak in a little more spirit, but the soaking process does not make you active as spirit is active. It actually prevents you from being at one with spirit and its activity. Second, spirit always moves out to inspire with its contacts. Yet your mind has been taught to look within for spirit, to awaken spirit in you. Be very certain that you cannot fully attain what you want so long as your mind continues acting one way, while spirit radiates in another way. Lovingly, teach your mind to move with spirit. First, stop being passive. No matter who has taught you, or what mistaken psychology or mysticism you have been taught, realize now and forever that any attempt to be passive in order to be more active is a contradiction. There is only one way of becoming unified with spirit. That way is to become active as spirit is active. Second, abandon all methods and all the means you have used of withdrawing within the self. Great peace is due to unity of action. Spirit is always moving outward to inspire itself into all things. As an aspiring seeker and adjuster, move outward with spirit, even to infinity, even to feeling you are up among the stars. The peace of such expansion is a thousandfold greater than the peace of withdrawal, and this peace of unity with God's inspiring power opens the soul to illumination. When your body and spirit are in perfect union, there is no blocking of memories of the past and no dimming of knowledge of your future. In this, there is limitless vitality from inspiration of the body by spirit, and at the other end of the gamut, intimate communion with spirit by inspiration of spirit itself. Lesson 18. Great Peacemaker and Inspiration of Power When the activities of your body and mind and heart and spirit are at peace, that is when their activities work together, then your desires become holy actualities. This brings us to another factor in making peace with spirit. To be responsive to spirit and create with absolute certainty of results, you must use the same power which God uses, and in the same order, one after the other. God needed seven days for creation, each day to create a different result, and with divine certainty because use of a different power must produce a different result. The secret of this great hidden mystery resides in what I taught you in the preceding lesson, or the meaning of the word translated God in the first chapter of Genesis. Remember, it is Elohim, and is this I am at the end in the Hebrew sign of plurality, just as S is the plural form in English, which tells us that the word boys means more than one boy. Elohim means the seven holy impregnating powers of God. Without use of these powers, even God's own conception of creation were without form and void. See Genesis 1-2. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth and the earth was without form and void. Isn't that exactly what has happened to thousands of creations you have conceived in your own mind? You have created them in the heaven of mind, but as actual manifestations on earth, they have remained formless and void. Many teachers of the last 90 years have mistakenly taught that all you have to do to create what you want is to hold a thought of it in mind. They, however, do not know the process of God's creation. They fail to realize that even God's mind creation on earth was void until he used other powers. Let us repeat. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. That is, the actual manifestation was empty or void and had no actual form. So also, our creations in mere thought have 99 cases out of 100, 
remained in consciousness, formless and void, never coming into actual manifestation. That is why I give you this work of the use of the seven creating powers of God, the powers which God used to turn the formlessness and emptiness of thought into actualities. It was only when God used these seven powers that he created the actualities of creation. Read Genesis 1, 7 through 2, 3. You also in the past have created many desires and ideals which have never taken form and become actualities. But now, with your use of seven powers of God, your desires and ideals can become actualities just as God's did. These powers are the seven sacred rays which God used in all his creation, and they were first symbolized by the seven days or process of creation. Through the ages, mystic men have tried to lift mankind toward manifested perfection by use of each ray predominantly for thousands of years at a time. This has already created six great civilizations of the past, each with its own one great temple as a symbol of the spiritual urge of its own civilization. Now we are in the seventh civilization. These seven powers of creation, creating actualities are, the first is the great inspiring ray or power of spirit, the let there be light of the third verse of our Bible. The second great power is the expanding ray, the Oranian ray, as Jesus called it, the heaven from within. Third, the great forming ray. Fourth, the clarifying or Cathayan or purifying ray. Fifth, the vitalizing or Shemian ray. Sixth, the recreative ray, creating new atoms and new cells. Seventh, the great holding ray, by use of which man is beginning the completion of man's attainment here on earth. These lessons teach you responsiveness to these rays. In this lesson, I teach you of the great inspiring ray. Such response can come only from an attitude of openness of the soul, free from restrictive thoughts of mind, so that the soul is open for the inflow of spirit for inspiration. The use of the inspiring power of the first great ray of creation is proclaimed by, Let there be light. But it is certain that this light is not the light seen by the human eye, because what we call light was not created until the fourth day of creation. It was then that symbols of the sun and moon were created, creation of light which we call light seen by human eyes. The word light in the phrase, Let there be light, literally means... Let there be a spread of spirit fire. This means a spreading or radiation of spirit moving out into all things and consequently inspiring itself into them. This is closely linked up with the use of the second great ray, that of expansion. Because when spirit moves into anything, it expands into new activity and new attainment. Now return to a truth I taught you in a preceding lesson that the physical means by which all energies which manifest in your body and in your brain structure are received. Preparation for response to this inspiring ray is simple, but do not try to do it by thought of mind. Remember that mind always tends to take things to itself, to store them up within its own consciousness. That is, mind never gives attention to anything except to perceive something it wishes to take into its own thought. No one would ever study anything except mind wishes to gain information to take into its consciousness. Mind is selfish, grasping ideas to enrich itself. Hence, mind has become a ruthless dictator, interfering with the manifestation of love and even of spirit itself. But spirit is radiant, flowing out, always to inspire itself into something else, always to uplift that something else. You want spirit to flow into your body and through it. Remember clearly that all inspiration of power into your physical structure comes through the skin. The skin possesses the only cells which are tuned to vibration high enough to respond to infinite energy. Moreover, its very structure, 
it is over 2 billion power receiving sets, which can and do receive the infinite energies of the universe, the energy of God. Even physiologists now call it the miracle organ and write of its mystic activity. Yet you give it very little chance to inspire the divine energies of the universe. In fact, you usually actually hinder its activity for 23 hours, 59 minutes, and 59 seconds every day. So at least for seven minutes each morning and night alone by yourself, give the cells of your skin freedom. Remember also that your skin cells are different from all other cells of your body. In origin, they are like brain cells, but functionally they differ from all other cells. All skin cells must have light and air to live. In contrast, all cells inside your body die the moment they are exposed to light or air, and this is true of all cells of all the inner organs and tissues of your body. This is why in growing heart tissue cells outside the body, as Dr. Carroll does, the laboratory room must be dark and the laboratory assistants dress in black gowns. The one great life need of cells is air and more air. Most benefits supposedly due to sunlight are due to air. Only a little sunlight is beneficial. More than a little is deadly detrimental. God in nature knows more than fattest do. If you expose your body to just a little too much sunlight, divine intelligence knows it is so very detrimental that nature blisters your skin to make you keep out all the sunlight or it builds up a dark curtain of tan below the outer skin to keep out the light. But skin cells need air and more air and still more air. Air is the great activator of all billions of skin cells. They must have air to live. Yet you do not give them even a 1% normal chance to live. Your body lives 1,440 minutes every day. 14 minutes is only 1% of the 1,440 minutes of the day. But you do not give your skin cells a chance to live in direct contact with air even for 14 minutes each day. Will a plant grow well if given only 1% of the air it needs? All life breathes to live. Even an apple and the cellular breathes, and a tree breathes. It even perspires about 400 quarts of water on a hot day. But what would happen if you kept its leaves swathed in clothes? Even to live, your skin cells must have moving air, yet you deprive them of it 99% of the time. This is a great physiological crime of the ages. The activity of the skin is mystical and mighty. It affects even the inner body. The body itself dies if only a part of its skin is injured. Science has recently made a remarkable discovery. If one-third or more of the skin is burned, even liver and kidneys begin to disintegrate. And although the skin may heal, yet death results because of its indirect effect on the liver and kidney. This is but one proof that the skin in addition to its own inspiration work, helps to maintain normal activity and even the structure of kidneys and liver. Skin activation is essential so that other organs can do their part in responding to spirit. Cooperate with your mystical skin cells and free them from the sodden conditions in which they have kept them. Give them at least a 1% chance to live, to contact air freely for at least 14 minutes every day. I ask you to expose your skin freely to air and to move about it when doing it. Seven minutes each morning and seven minutes each night. Certainly these two periods, 14 minutes in all, less than 1% of the 1400 minutes of the day, are not too much for the activation of the miracle cells of your body, the only cells which must have air to live. Choose a seven minute period convenient to you and be certain that the temperature of the room in cold weather is agreeably warm. Then, when you first awaken in the morning, and also just before you retire at night, take a piece of white silk cloth, about a yard square, and gently fluff, very, very gently fluff, the entire skin surface of your body. Fourteen minutes of exposure to air, which skin cells must have to live, plus this light fluffing of the skin with a dry, soft, white silk cloth, will do more to activate your skin than twenty-four hours out in the sunshine. Give the mystic cells of your skin just a little chance and the spiritual responsiveness of the body will increase tenfold. 
awaken your skin to receive the inspiring power of God. This ray has a peculiar vibratory power of its own. When it passes into a living substance, it inspires it. How long should you continue this activation of the skin? Continue it for life, if you wish to continue to inspire the energy of the universe, the energy of God to the limit. Yes, the instructions I have given you are very simple. I want them to be simple, so you will scarcely think of them. All you need to do is to secure a body square yard of white soft silk and then use it with the skin free to the air for at least seven minutes each night and each morning. Do not lie down for this, but move about. Move around in your room by yourself alone. There are many proofs now that movement of air on the skin counteracts much of what we used to think were detrimental results due to lack of sufficient oxygen and breathing. We now know that it is ionization which is the essential in the breathing of air and in the action of the skin on the air. We also know that the electronic energy of God is the energy which conditions the cells of the body so that they become more responsive to the essence of all power of God. Let us clearly understand this, even if it is necessary for me to repeat something I may have previously written. All energy of God work together in harmony unless your conscious mind interferes with their working. For mind and love and life and spirit to manifest through your body, the body must be conditioned, that is, brought up to a certain state of vibration, before even the all-powerful energies can manifest. The words all-powerful mean only that energies are all-powerful according to the harmony of all powers of God. It is necessary for the body to be conditioned by the energy we call heat before any cell can function at all. You already know this, for if a human body is frozen stiff, no power of life or mind can manifest through it. So also the body must be conditioned by the electronic energy of God before its cells can respond to spirit. But energies which condition the body are not life. They merely put body in condition so life can manifest. Hence, scientists who conclude that heat is life, or that electricity is life, are completely mistaken. All such energies are merely the conditioning energies which make it possible for higher God energies of spirit to manifest. Nevertheless, all the conditioning energies are essential for all manifestation of life, and the greatest manifestation of life in the body is due to the ionization which takes place because of electronic energy. So it is wise, when you use the square of silk to fluff the skin of your body to stand on a tile bath floor, or on a large piece of glass, or on a rubber mat or anything which prevents electrical energy from passing away from the skin. There is proof of the value of this, for electronic energy can be induced to accumulate on the surface of the skin. You know that merely walking over a thick carpet barefooted on a cool day charges the skin with electricity so that when your fingertips touch an object made of metal, there will even be a flashing spark of electricity. The life or death of every cell of the body depends on a major positive electronic charge at its center and a lesser negative electronic charge on the outside of its little body. We also know that if these charges tend to equal each other, there is death and that the vitality, energy, endurance depends on the inspiring of the positive power of the universe. Your skin is a mystic organ, the miracle organ, as mystic as anything as you have ever dreamed of in the occultism. It is the only body tissue which contains billions of little receiving sets to take in the spiritual energy of God. I do not wish to instruct you much about this. I have told you all that needs to be done. I do not wish you to think much of it, but to feel all the time you are fluffing your skin with that white silk cloth and leave it uncovered free to the air, to feel that your skin is awakening to responsive vibration of a higher rate. Remember, the skin's delicacy of response to vibration of higher powers is finer and greater even than the response of the most delicate nerves of the eye. The skin's mystic activity is to receive power, to inspire energies of God, and then to transmit those energies to all the billions of cells of your inner body. 
this inspiration of power is the true breath of life. Lesson 19. The Limitless Expansionist Oranos is the word always used by Jesus for heaven. It means infinite expansion. And Jesus taught response to the expanding power of God as the means of the awakening heaven here and now, of expanding life into a heaven of attainment, of bringing heaven to earth. This expanding ray was called the Huanican ray ages ago. It was deified in the Tiahuacan temple of the god in gold in the sacred eastern Andes, thousands of years before mystic wise men went to Tibet. It lifts up and expands the soul. God used this second step in creation, and by use of this expanding ray, God wrought the second day of creation, the firmament in the midst of waters. In the revised version of the Bible, notes at the bottom of the page indicate that the word translated firmament means expansion, and God himself called this expansion heaven. See Genesis 1.8. To respond to this expanding ray, I teach you a new attitude. It is neither relaxed nor tense, but expectantly expanding, and hence it is in harmony with spirit's ever-expanding activity. You do not relax your body to become more responsive. No matter what you have been taught, any and all slackness of relaxation is not like the activity of spirit. Slackness or relaxation is lack of energy in action. It makes both mind and body non-active. Non-activity does not and cannot respond fully to activity. There have been strange teachings given to you to help you attain greater spiritual consciousness. Spirit is the highest activity of God. Yet these strange teachings tell you to stop activity in order to become active. To respond to spirit, the greatest activity of the soul, first quiet the slow chugging action of body and anxious thoughts. But you should not try to quiet their activity by trying to stop their action. Rather, you should increase their activity so that you rise above the slower action. Get the full significance of this. When you run your auto very slowly, it chugs and jerks, and you can overcome this by increasing its activity, increasing the speed. You respond to spirit only as soul increases its activity. When activity is lessened, responsiveness is lessened. When activity is increased, responsiveness increases. In your past efforts, you have tried to lessen the activity of your body in order to increase the activity of spirit. This is a contradiction carried into active opposition. I teach you to unify the activities of body and of spirit, for only in unity of activity will your dreams and desires come true. I teach you steps by which you become responsive to spirit. These I call the steps to sacred response. The work of each subsequent lesson starts with the expanding attitude given in this lesson and the next. For the present, use the five steps given here. What follows is the positional body attitude for spiritual responsiveness, harmonizing mind and soul with spirit. This is the one divine attitude the only divine attitude which unifies activities of your body with activities of your mind with activities of spirit with the expanding ray of God. First step. Sit in a semi-easy chair resting your back easily against the back of the chair. Elevate your chin a little. Hold up your head. Look a little upward and outward easily and without strain as though peacefully looking up and out to the stars. Since spirit is radiantly active, do not bow your head, and do not close your eyes, and do not let your body sag, either forward or downward, for such attitudes are in opposition to the uprighteous attitude of spirit itself. Do not look within, for spirit infinitely radiates outward. God's world of spirit is infinite. Even your soul is not confined inside of your little body, God does permeate your being, but the greater truths are, one, you are in God, and two, your soul is greater than your body. Your soul is not in your body, for body is limited and soul is limitless. The light in your room radiates out from electric bulb and is all around the bulb. Only its focal point is inside the bulb. 
So also, your body is the focal point of your soul. It is no more inside your body than light in your room is inside the bulb. Second step. Sit seven minutes in this radiant, expanding attitude and do this each night and each morning. Feel yourself expanding. Look out at a night over the top of the trees, out over faraway hills, out far above the horizon, even to the stars. Say unto thyself, I will lift up my eyes to the hills, for it is from the heights of God that strength cometh. Third step. Feel as though you were out in the midst of all infinite spirit, out beyond any thought of limited body or mind. Expand out and out until you know the infinity of your own soul is not confined to your little body. Your soul is spirit and does actually live in spirit among the stars as well as on this earth of God. Fourth step. Vision what you want. With no restrictions. Spirit is infinite. So vision fulfillment without limit. Adjust your old thoughts to new ideals. You are in spirit. So vision yourself in spirit. Fifth step. As you sit in this expectant attitude, and as your mind expands, so it is like spirit in action, desire what you want with all intense spiritual longing of your soul. This makes your soul reach out, not inward, and this is in harmony with all the activity of spirit itself. And as your activity becomes like the activity of spirit, conflicting opposition disappears and desire is fulfilled. Even your body and its expectant attitude becomes responsive and is transformed, flooded with vitality of spirit. As you expand, your consciousness intimately contacts spirit itself and all its manifestations. You become consciously guided by spirit. All mental barriers to past memories disappear, and with your activity, like the activity of spirit, you constantly commune with it. Practice easily now the first five steps given above. Often clarify in your own mind the seven holy powers of God of the seven days of creation. There is nothing else like these powers in all heaven and earth. They never destroy, they are always constructive, and each always produces a result after its own kind. For the first day of the process of creation, there is the inspiring ray the radiation of energy into the ideal of what you desire, or into the substance of thing or condition you wish to create. For the second day of the process, there is the expanding ray, which starts the creating of something different from that which was inspired by the first power. For the third day, there is a forming ray, which begins to give form to what is expanding, to actualize the ideal of what you desire. For the fourth day, there is a clarifying power. You may also call it the purification or differentiating power, each taking part in its own place, being harmonized, so that each part works together harmoniously to produce what you most desire. For the fifth day of our process of creation, there is the vitalizing ray to be used. It is mystic and mysterious in its power. It gives life even to that which does not have life, just as God on the fifth day brought forth life out of water which in itself is not living. For on the sixth day, the recreating power, the power of each thing to reproduce itself, like to its own kind, the source of all abundance of earth, whether abundance of energies or life or all things of material wealth. And for the seventh day, the holding ray, that is, the power that keeps what you have created for use for yourself and for others, and also keeps what you have created in the form or condition in which you created it, so it does not lessen or deteriorate or disappear. Lesson 20. Expanding to Create I write for you of the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world. The powers that be are ordained of God. Let every soul be subject or responsive unto them. Spirit is forever infinitely expanding, hence expansion is the only way by which you become like spirit and responsive to it. It is the way of heaven. 
taught by God and the Christ. It is the mystic secret of the expanding ray. We have not yet comprehended what Jesus meant by heaven any more than his apostles and disciples and followers did. What they later taught proves that they did not understand. Yet Christ tried to make it very clear. He taught what he meant by heaven again and again and used illustration after illustration. Yet they did not understand. Even in the Old Testament, the ideal of heaven is defined, and the meaning is exactly the same as that which Jesus taught. If you have a revised version of the Bible, turn to the first chapter of Genesis and look at the footnotes. I tell you this again, just as Christ repeatedly repeated it to his followers. The Hebrew word translated firmament means heaving up and expanding and expansion, and God himself called that heaven. Then the only word for heaven in the New Testament, the only word which Jesus himself used for heaven, means limitlessly increasing and ever-expanding activity. Jesus said, Heaven is like unto a grain of mustard seed. One single mustard seed can soon produce enough other seeds, expand in one season into a thousand seeds, so that its progeny will cover an entire field with mustard plants in one season. And Jesus said, Heaven is like leaven. Leaven is yeast, and there are very few things we know on earth which expand so rapidly and amazingly as yeast. And Christ said, The kingdom of heaven is within you. That is, that the center of expanding power is within you. Be certain to understand this clearly, for there have been many mistaken teachings which confuse the truth of Christ. There is no statement whatever that heaven is within you. All inspired and mystic statements of all ages reveal that it is not heaven, but the kingdom of heaven that is within you. The word translated kingdom is basilica, meaning stronghold of power or center of power. Heaven is expansion, and it is the center of this power, the kingdom from which expansion takes place, that is within you. And since your soul is made in the likeness of God, you are the center of that expansion. You are the limitless expansionist. By use of God's expanding ray of spirit, you enter into its heaven of infinite expression and attainment here and now. Remember the first steps of the sacred response. 1. The physical attitude. 2. Expanding far out in consciousness as to the stars. 3. Feeling that you are in the midst of stars. and 4. Visioning what you want while feeling this expansion. Hell is being forced to shrink when you want to expand. Heaven is expansion out beyond your present consciousness. God used the expanding power the second day to begin the change of the formless and void earth, which resulted from the creation in mind only, into an actual and spiritualized earth. The first power, used on the first day, is inspiring power. It inspired itself into substance and into all energies. It inspires itself into each soul and each body. Now another great truth. I have taught you that Elohim is the word which is translated God in the first chapter of our Bible, and that it is plural in form, meaning God powers. In its spelling, a strong A instead of a weak A is used. The strong A is Aleph, A-L-E-P-H, and Aleph is the word for bull in the Hebrew language, the sacred symbol of divine He powers of God. The inspiring power which God used the first day of creation is the impregnating power of God, by which He impregnated all energy and all substance with power of continuing creating and growth during the next six days of processes of creation. Certainly, after the use of the inspiring power on the first day of creation, something more was needed to grow into reality. Compare this with God's divine process by which woman gives birth to the child. First, male power impregnates woman. This is inspiration of power into that which is to be created. But the human being is not yet born. For development and birth, they use another power and needed. 
the tiny impregnated cell in the mother's womb is still formless and void of the form of a human being. So for this, God uses the expanding power, and within the mother's womb, the one tiny ovum cell expands into a million cells, ten million cells, ten billion cells, the most amazing expansion of earth and heaven. Thus the child's body is ready to be formed. I am teaching you truth far beyond mere thoughts of truth. Statements of truth are crystallized. They have lost living power. They stimulate, but their effect always wears off. What I teach you is true of everything God has created. Just as new life of the human being is born, by use of the two powers God first used in the creation of the earth, the first and second days of creation, so also these same two powers must be used in the initial birth of everything you desire on earth, if you wish to become an actual creation. Conception of the plant is created within the seed, but as a plant it is still formless and void. It is merely the idea of a plant which exists in the seed. Then something is inspired into the seed, the warmth of heat, the energy of sunlight. This awakens life in the seed. This is the use of the inspiring power affecting the seed. Next comes the use of expanding power. Expansion within the seed breaks its outer covering and expands the infinitely small substance of the seed so that it multiplies itself millions of times as it grows to a plant or even to become a tree. Everything you attain in life can be attained with the absolute certainty of God if you begin with the use of the inspiring ray and continue with the use of the expanding power and then follow on with the powers of the other days of creation. In this, you are the limitless expansionist, and expansion, please remember, is heaven. Lesson 21. Reviving Purifier and Balance Wheel Yes, you have been able to get along, body, slowly dying every day from your twenty-first year to the end of your physical life here on earth. But now, with new expanding power awakened, this can change. The expanding ray is also called the resurrecting ray. This ray was known to holy men as the Caracolian ray in very early Maya times and symbolized in their Temple of the Stars. But 11,000 years before the Mayans, it was deified in ancient Tiura by holy mystics who built the most mysterious temples of earth near the highest waters under the Southern Cross, and by them it was called the Ray of the Mystics of the Southern Cross. From what has already been excavated and discovered, it seems certain that their civilization excelled all other civilizations in at least 19 different ways. Their holy men later went to Tibet, and have now again returned to the mountains and high waters under the Southern Cross. This expanding ray is also the reviving ray, and as you become responsive to it, you are continually being reborn. Instead of the usual slowing dying process after the 21st year, life of the body becomes a process of continuous, hourly resurrection. Resurrection takes place by purification and by inspiration. That is, to restore life in the body, the body must be purified so that more spirit energy can be taken in or inspired. By purification I mean more than mere cleansing of body, more than the process which physiologists teach. I mean an actual change of quality of the substance of the cells, like the change when coal is changed to diamonds. And I am not writing now of purifying your soul. You do not need to purify it because it is pure. God made the soul perfect in the beginning in his own image. Only two things interfere with its perfect manifestation. One is the opposing activity of your conscious mind. The other is the non-responsive condition of your body. In this lesson, I write of your body to make it responsive. For just as pure light cannot manifest its glory of color through a lump of coal, so your soul cannot make its power manifest until the substance of your body is transformed as coal is changed to diamond, so that it will respond to spirit. No mere material, physiological means will do this. So to attain true responsiveness, you become a spiritual physiologist. 
As there is spiritual salvation, so there is bodily salvation. To continue living, your body must expand in spirit and be resurrected physically from death each four minutes. And unless you do this, spirit ceases to manifest through it. The process which the infinite has given you for this redemption is the sacred breath of resurrecting expansion. This is more than mere physiological breathing. A pig breathes physiologically, but you need something higher in breathing, something that awakens the mystic relationship between life in your body and your breath and the energies of spirit. Many modes and methods of breathing have been taught. Some vitalize the body temporarily and yet lead to early death. Others awaken brain centers unevenly so that the mind becomes unbalanced. Others actually burn out the lungs. Others produce results directly opposite to that which is claimed for them. Others unbalance blood circulation. I have studied and faithfully practiced all methods of breathing usually taught, physiological, athletic, hygienic, mystic, some learned in America, some in Europe, some in the Orient, some of mystic Tibetans. And there is one test above all other tests which will determine whether any one of these systems is beneficial or harmful. The primal essential of breathing is to free the body of fatigue poisoning, that is, to rest the body minute by minute. Hence, any method of breathing which you cannot continue for ten hours without increasing fatigue is detrimental. Test this. Go to an open window and take a few deep breaths, as you have often been taught. If permanently beneficial, then you can keep up that breathing for hours without fatigue. But try it, and you find it so fatiguing that it is difficult to continue even for ten minutes. Hence, it cannot be beneficial breathing, for the primal purpose of breathing is to rest, not to fatigue the body, rest it by removing the poisons of fatigue. Here I discuss only the breath of resurrecting expansion. It keeps your body pure as spirit is pure. It continually frees your body of the non-responsive substances. There is need of this breath, for although there are only two billion people on earth, there are eight hundred billion cells in your body, and all of them must be redeemed from death each four minutes. Normally, you exhale sixteen quarts of carbon dioxide each hour. This is necessary to exist. But eliminating only sixteen quarts of carbon dioxide each hour lets your body slowly die. It alone does not make your body any more responsive than that of a pig. It does not resurrect the cells of new life. If for one hour you allow even a little extra carbon dioxide to accumulate in the body, that is, if you breathe out only 15 quarts instead of 16 quarts, then all your vital organs, endocrine glands, nerves, brain become numbed and non-responsive. In contrast, if you breathe out a little more than usual, that is, 18 quarts an hour, then your body is changed as though by mystic magic. If then I teach you the sacred breath, which will eliminate 19 quarts an hour, you can work miracles of increased vitality, resurrection of cells, expansion of energy, and continuance in life. With such breathing, more spirit will flood and permeate your body, cells will respond more fully to spirit energy, radiate more of your mysterious inner light, and your body will be sensitively awakened, so that you can intimately contact spirit in all its manifestations. The process is very simple, and the results are amazing. We now know for a certainty how to transform breathing. Nature, spirit, a little child, and mystic masters teach us. Here is nature's proof. When you exercise vigorously, extra impurities are produced, and nature rids you to breathe in such a way that you will more quickly get rid of the extra impurities. So what do you do? You pant. And how do you breathe when panting? Each ingoing breath is shorter than usual. Each outgoing breath is longer than usual. With no pause after each ingoing breath, but with a pause after each outgoing breath. Where is spirit's proof? 
How do you breathe to free your body of the extra emotive waste due to sadness or sorrow? You sigh or sob. And a sigh cannot be a sigh unless its ingoing breath is short and its outgoing breath long. The proof of a little child, asleep, breathing as spirit impels it to breathe. Ingoing breath are short, outgoing longer. Proof of the mystic masters depends on the perfect teleosis balance of four to seven in breathing. This cosmic balance of ingoing breath to outgoing breath was taught in ancient Tayura. It is very simple, so simple it is mysterious. Breathe in four counts, breathe out for seven counts. This four to seven ratio is not based on mere theory or supposition. It is the law of perfect spiritual form and movement. All perfect movements resolve into one or four or seven. Perfect numbers are always determined by addition because it is the only arithmetical operation which is always basic in all other secondary operations of mathematics. Multiplication, subtraction, and division are secondary. For example, multiplication is merely repeated additions. Multiplying four times five gives the same result as adding five four times. And subtraction is nothing but unadding numbers. And division is a process of subtraction. When you say that four is contained five times in twenty, you mean that four can be subtracted five times from twenty. I write of this now so you shall know, one, that there is only one basic arithmetical process, and two, that it is addition, and three, only by addition can we test numbers to determine both perfect form and movement in the universe and that, four, perfect harmonic movement is essential in breathing. If a number is perfect, it can be resolved by addition of its digits into one, four, or seven. For example, thirteen is one and three. Add one to three and you have four. Hence, 13 is a perfect number because it resolves into 4. Now test 26. Add its 2 to its 6 and you have 8. Hence, 26 is not perfect because the 8 is not 1 or 4 or 7. Next test 16. Add its 1 and 6. You have 7. It is perfect. So is 31. It's 3 plus 1 makes 4. And 142 is perfect, for 1 plus 4 plus 2 is 7. Except for two actual proven facts, these numbers of 1, 4, and 7 might seem fantastic. The first great factual truth is that these are the only numbers found throughout the universe in all form and movement. The second factual truth is that they are the only proportionals which are found in all the structures of the universe. They determine proportional distance of stars, width and length of path and comets, and distance of plants from the sun. And on earth, these same numbers determine every beautiful geometric design ever used in art or architecture, the intervals of our musical scales, the proportion of the human body. They are even found in the inner design of snowflakes. From my use of these sacred numbers, 1, 4, and 7, you may ask, well, do you believe in numerology? My answer is no and yes. I do not believe in fantastic systems of numerology worked out by man, for they are wrong. But I do believe in the teleosis numbers, which are found in all snowflake designs, in intervals of colors in the spectrum, in our musical scales, in forms and relational distances, and even in speeds of meteors, comets, planets, stars of the universe. With such evidence, I accept the spiritual basis of one, four, seven. And hence I teach you the resurrection expansion breath 
as the sixth step of the sacred response based on 1, 4, and 7. Use this breath only when resting in an easy chair after making your peace with spirit and after the fourth step of lesson 1. After the fourth step of visioning what you want, immediately proceed with the sacred breath of this lesson. And never use this breath when standing, although if an invalid in bed at present, use it when lying down. Use it four minutes each morning and seven minutes each evening. Breathe in for four counts and do not hold your breath. Then breathe out for seven counts and pause for one count of rest. Again, breathe in four counts, breathe out seven, and rest one count. Continue your four minutes each morning, seven minutes each night. Follow this again by desiring what you want intensely. Do not ask me or anyone how long each count should be. Never time your breathing to a clock or to anyone's advice. Your breathing is your breathing. Spirit in you will determine how long each count should be for you at this time. The spiritual law is the law of ease. So always breathe so that your four counts of your ingoing breath and the seven counts of your outgoing breath are easy for you. Ease is the proof of spiritual harmony and action in you. This sacred breath is in tune with the universe. Its one, four, seven are the proportional distances of planets from the sun and of the interstar spaces. They determine our musical scales, one primal tone, four bass tones, do, mi, so, do, seven intervals in major scale. Then other teleosis numbers are 13, 4, and 19. One determine respectively the 13 intervals of the perfected chromatic scale and the highest beautiful overtones of your purest violin notes. These same 1, 4, 7 are found in design inside of snowflakes, in the whirls of flowing water, in curve of a bird's wing, and in a perfect proportion of the human body. These mystic relations of 1 to 4 to 7 were used in designs of all great temples, in the ancient temples of heaven and Cathay, the great pyramid, the inner chambers of Tibet, the temple of Eleusis, holy of holies, Maya temples, and the most spiritually symbolic temple of God in radiancy. They balance the proportional movements of the universe. In the sacred breath they become the balance wheel of life. Although physiological breathing lets your body die in a few decades, yet the one to four to seven breath continually redeems it. Use this breath, and you spiritually resurrect your body. The apostle saith, All flesh shall see the salvation of God, and since death and life are conditions, death can be turned to life. The Lord God breathed, and man became a living soul. This turns death to life, old cells into new ones. With such life, thy youth is renewed like the eagles. Lesson 22. The Spiritual Physiologist. There are four basic means provided by God for purifying the cells of the body to make it more responsive to spirit. The intelligence of the cells is so great that they try to carry on their mysterious functions even when you neglect them. And if you spiritually cooperate, their activities transcend mere physiological functions and become redeemers. Your blood is the living fluid of life. Mystics speak truly when they call it the living blood of the Lamb of God. It rushes through your body, quarts of it every minute, purifying every cell for greater responsiveness to spirit. Other intelligent activities of intestine and kidneys carry off quarts of unresponsive waste every day. Your skin squeezes out impurities through 2,000 million little tubes, and your lungs breathe out 30,400 quarts of impure air each day, 2,500 pints every minute. God and nature work for you hourly, intelligently, lovingly. They keep these processes active even when you neglect them, even when you do not give them half a chance. Oh, I realize you may be saying to yourself, What? Is this course just attention to kidneys, intestines, skin, and lungs? 
Why, this is the same old physiology, nothing more. Ah, uh, but there is something more. Mere physiological processes let your body die even before you are a mere hundred years old. They let it begin to die when you are only twenty-one. But with spiritual cooperation, they can make the body so spiritually responsive that it tends to physical immortality. This is the difference between slowly dying for most of your life or inspiring the structure to increasingly live. The spiritual is linked with the physiological. The body, which must be made spiritually responsive, lifted up to vibrate like spirit, to continue its life vitally and youthfully. Another factor should stun you with amazement. For many decades, scientists have been trying to find out why the body dies, for physiologically the body should not die. Although birth is a miracle, and yet we can understand that when spirit enters into something it lives, and after a body is given birth, we know it should grow to adulthood because it is created responsive to spirit. Such growth is proof that the human body, at birth and during childhood, is responsive to spirit. And then comes the mystery. For even when growing, even while it is still responsive, it begins to stop being responsive. And even when healthy, it begins to die in its twenty-first year. Why? Well, that has been the mystery. For since growth is proof of the body's responsiveness to the spirit, why does it not keep on being responsive, living forever? Today, one phase of this mystery is solved. Scientists know that the primal cause of aging and death of the body is accumulation, year by year, of impurities in the body. We know that these impurities are not responsive to spirit. One, that as they accumulate, less of spirit manifest. And two, that if you free the body of them, more spirit manifest. This much is simple truth, understandable and proven. Now, one step more. Spirit is life, and hence, if you spiritually purify your body, spirit will continue to manifest, and the body will not wear out, but will continue to build new tissue, continue their youthfulness forever. We now have proof of this. Dr. Alex Carroll has proven it. He has proven that, one, perfect food is not enough, that chicken heart cells, even when fed perfectly, die in a few hours. But also, two, he has proven that when chicken heart cells are purified, when non-responsive wastes are washed away every day, they live on and on, continually reproducing new cells. Instead of dying in 48 hours, they have lived 227,000 hours, and the cells of that tiny piece of heart tissue, purified daily, have been so responsive to spirit that if all of them have been kept growing, they would have produced enough new heart muscles every year to cover 546 acres. Note the spiritual significance of this. Your body is composed of cells. The ultimate life of death of these cells depends on purifying activities of kidney, intestines, and skins, and on the continued resurrection of life by the holy breath. If you but help their purifying process only a little, your body can become so much more responsive to spirit than at present that it will approach the condition of physical immortality. For daily spiritual resurrection of the body, purification is the first essential. This is proven. For if you stop one of its purifying processes for a few minutes only, your body becomes so non-responsive to spirit that it dies. Yes, the body dies when breath is shut off for four minutes. Each purification process is a means of spiritual resurrection of the life of the cells of the body, resurrection each hour. Life is of spirit, and life itself is eternal. If nothing interfered with spirit, the body would be immortal. Spirit never stops spirit. Nothing but non-responsive substance in the body makes its cells so non-responsive to spirit that cells begin to die. Physiological purification keeps body alive a few years, but spiritual cooperation makes the body like spirit. Spirit itself is ever ready to manifest in continued life, but your body, in its present condition, cannot stand up to the vibration of the spirit. Only spiritual help will make it more responsive to spirit. If you but purify your body just a little more than is done by the usual physiological process, you can work a miracle. Purifying your 800,000 billion cells change them from teeny particles of dirty coal to diamonds of spirit. Resurrect the cells of your body so that they'll become so responsive to spirit that mind will work with spirit and respond to its power of continuing life. Become the spiritual physiologist of your life. 
clarify again the first two great rays of creation. First, the inspiring ray inspires energy into your body to energize every cell with the fire of spirit. Second, the expanding ray breaks down the fixed conditions and resurrects activity, purifying the body of inactivity, expanding power in structure to new and greater attainment. Lesson 23. Give actual form to your creation. The heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament showeth his handiwork, and man is reverently and wonderfully made in God's likeness. I now teach you the forming ray, the ray of the third day of creation. It actually made land appear in form, and water in form, each after its own form. Response to this forming ray changes desire into actual form. This is not mysterious, for each energy produces results according to the nature of its own energy, and this ray produces form. Egyptian mystics, who later designed the Pyramid of Giza, call this ray the Methonian ray, and it is not difficult for us to recognize that the first syllable of the word math is the root from which we have derived our word mathematics. While measurement is one basis of determining form on earth, this ray is much more than mathematical measurements. All radiant rays have power to change the nature of substance, and the forming ray has a peculiar power of its own. Whenever it vibrates through a substance, it produces form. This ray has peculiar power of drawing together infinitely small particles, millions of times smaller than grains of flour, and assembling them in definite form. It can also transform energies into new forms of energy. Crystal clear water flows down from mountains toward the sea. When it stops near the shore, this forming ray collects the chemicals dissolved in the water and turns them into crystal forms, that is, crystallized sand. This forming ray also builds up and gives form to things. It also has power to give actual form to desire. It is used by the masters to give form to their ideals. It is used by mystics to produce form at a distance. As you increase your response to this power, you also can form your desires in spirit in such a way that will become real, actual actualities for you. I know that for many years you have sincerely held thoughts of things for the purpose of giving form to what you wanted, but thoughts alone do not produce actual form, and by thought alone many of your desires fail to take on actual form. In many lines, man is miraculously efficient. He makes machines of astounding power and phenomenal delicacy. But these, he can talk around the world, fly across oceans, and multiply the power of lightning a thousand times. And man has sense enough to know that to produce any such machine, he must first conceive it in some definite form. Yet in his spiritual efforts, man still idealizes and desires in a vague, will-o'-the-wisp way, without spiritually conceiving the definite form of what he desires to attain. Even when most consecrated, he seeks and searches, tries this and that, and often even after years of effort, his life on earth fails to attain what he is most desired. In his attempts to improve his own body, his methods are more wasteful than any other effort he makes on earth. He tries out one thing after another, and with the years his body becomes older, stiffer, more bent and creaky. In your own life, it is certain you have thought and planned and tried to make the things you desire to come true. Yet lack of creating things as the actual form you desired has been the greatest failure of your past efforts. You have conceived greatly, but conception is not birth. Remember that even God's conception in mind were still formless and void until he used the forming ray of creation. For results, you too must give form to what you conceive, and now, with the definite power of the means of forming what you want, you can attain more in four months than you could otherwise attain in forty years. Prepare now to become a divine formist. Lesson 24. The Divine Formist If your body is not responsive, less spirit comes through. When it becomes more responsive, more spirit manifests. And form has much to do with the degree of your body's responsiveness and the quality of power that does manifest. So this lesson concerns form, and please at once free your mind of all mistaken ideas of form as a fixed result. And do not hold any mental picture of your body possessing a fixed form. If you do, your body will die more rapidly than it is dying at present, and will not respond to the higher form, the form of spiritualized energy which can transform all outward forms. 
Vision your body as a highly vibratory instrument, forever being inspired by spirit, with energies ever expanding and uplifting. One, to resurrect the body's cells, and two, to change its form, three, to make it more responsive to spirit, and four, to express more of life for you. This form is different from mind's ideal. This lifts form up to spirit so the forming ray can transform it. Since before the time of the Greeks, man on earth has always tried to improve the form of his body and increase his energy. Hundreds of methods have been used, each praised by its user. All faddish means have resulted in failure, usually in death earlier in the case of people who do not use such methods. And now our scientists are earnestly seeking means, not only of increasing man's energy, but of lengthening his life. But all results desired can be accomplished only by greater spiritual responsiveness, for only as spirit continues to manifest in the body can it maintain its strength and usefulness. No scientist of the last century, excepting only one, has studied the primal energies of the nature of God. Researchers have dealt with the secondary energies, and often only with the minor manifestations of secondary energies. For example, scientists talk of affinity in chemistry. Affinity is evidence of a power that draws particles together and gives them new form either of substance or energy. Yet not one great thinking chemist on all the earth has sought to find out the power which activates affinity. Affinity is merely the outer manifestation of a higher power. That higher power is the forming ray of God. Not one scientist has yet studied. It is wise before we proceed to understand more clearly what we mean by form, what God meant by form when he used a forming ray to draw particles and energies together so that each thing on earth would take on actuality and form. There are four factors which are determinate of form. 1. Shape. 2. Direction of movement. 3. Activity. and 4. Energy. There is the form of an apple, form of a tree, form of a girl, form of a triangle, form of a building. Such form is true form, but even the form of an apple cannot be perceived except by direction of movement. That is, your fingers must move around it, or movement of your eye must follow the line that bounds it to perceive its form. And this is true of any shape, form of triangle, of girl, statue, or building. There are also forms of activity. Some movements are in straight forms, others in waves or curves, others in spirals. Then also scientists recognize different forms of energy. The great forming ray of God of the third day of creation can create all forms of all kinds for actual manifestation. Form in part determines quality and degree of manifestation. Even the deadened forms of many things on earth, even of our bodies, hinder spiritual manifestation in comparison with the great power of the uplifted spiritual form. And this is true of all other things on earth. The Egyptians used the solid form more than any other race. They built forms at last, yet they themselves lost the spiritual concept of form, so that they themselves died out. That is, the pyramids still exist, but the ancient Egyptians are themselves gone from the face of the earth. The ancient holy Egyptian mystics understood the forming ray, but their spirituality was lost before the pyramids were built. Look at any picture of the great pyramid of Giza. Look that has been written on its true, and yet those who built the pyramid did not know of the higher forms of the forming ray. Even the lesser mystics then directing the building thought mostly of fixed forms to carry the message to future ages. Although mystic knowledge is revealed by the symbolism of its measurements, yet the pyramid itself is the lowest, the most deadened, non-living, non-spiritual form on earth. It is like a pile on earth. It stands up because of mere dirt form, inclines at its sides the same as would result if you took a shovel and piled up dirt, with the dirt rolling down the sides of your pile. It is the lowest form on earth. There is no spirit in its form, no uplift to life. It is an earth symbol. That is why most interpreters fail to find its true hidden meaning, which are revealed only by its cubic structure, and never by mere length measurements. That is why the interpretation of meaning, based on its line measurements, are completely mistaken. Its real mystic truth are revealed, one, by the spiritual significance of its cubic structure. This is not a lesson on the Pyramid of Giza. I write of it only to emphasize its lack of spiritual form, 
so different from the new pyramid now being built by mystic men of Tiura who still live, and by those holiest of today who forever abandon Tibet as the great spiritual center in 1922, now directing all higher brotherhoods from the new spiritual temple on the inaccessible heights of the eastern side of the Holy Andes. But my primal purpose in this is that you recognize relationship of spirit to form and seek its application to your body. Look at the squatty earth-like structural form of any pyramid, then look at a photograph of the beautifully uplifted spiritual forms of our architecture of today. The spires of our cathedral and tower building, the Tribune Tower, Wrigley Tower in Chicago, State Capitol of Nebraska, University of Pittsburgh, Chrysler Building in New York, Singing Tower in Florida. Man advances first by producing the results in the things about him, and often he dies and his civilization dies because he is not able to do as much for himself as he does for mere things. Today we are the first civilization on earth in which man's spirit has risen to spiritual form in structural building, so that he produces inner form to hold up the weight, instead of merely piling up mass weight upon mass weight from the base. If you had x-ray eyes to look through a modern skyscraper, you would see all its weight hung upon an inner steel structure. But in a pyramid, the weight is merely piled up, each section on a larger section below. Now we come to the actual spiritual determinant of all the essentials of the higher form in practical manifestation. The powers of inspiration, expansion, resurrection, uplift, movement, activity, and the energy of spirit. The above are the determinants of transforming life, and it is as possible to work miracles and changing form in our own manifestations of life as it is for a mere grub worm to transform itself into a beautiful butterfly. All perfect form is based on spirit, not on an earth pile. It gives man the opportunity of greater expansiveness of spirit with the greatest manifestation of energy, transforming earth man into the man of heaven on earth, a god on earth. Perfect proportions are all such forms are 1, 4, 7, 13, 19, 31. These are the perfect proportions of the human body, now proven by scientists even to the millimeter. These are the perfected proportions of all newer spiritualized structures, such as buildings and towers previously mentioned. These are proportions found in the great Taj Mahal. These are the proportions found in completeness in the very ancient temples of heaven, in pre-ancient Cathay, in the temple of the stars in the Maya land, in the temple of Elusha, and in the Holy of Holies in the temple of Solomon. Form on this basis is created by the forming ray of spirit. Use this ideal on the uplifted and uplifting structural form in your visioning of a transformed body and of the physical attitude of your body and in visualizing whatever you want and transformation will result. I presume you ask me now, how can one do this? How vision form and yet prevent it from becoming fixed? How can one change the inner body form enough so that it is responsive enough to the mighty power of the forming ray of God to create the new form of a new life here and now. You do this by realizing form as movement in action, activated by energy. This is very different from mere fixed form and also different from any thought of any fixed shape of form. Remember it is form in movement, activated by energy, so that youth walking toward you down the street, head up, easily balanced, looking straight ahead, life of body and so thrilled with life that you can almost imagine him ready at any step to break into running on tiptoe or flying through the air. Then see the squatty fat woman waddling down the street, no uplift in the back, the whole body weighted down merely by its own weight piled upon its own weight. So squatty that if she wore skirts of the old type she would look like a pyramid, a mere pile of the dirt form of earth. Yes, you can do much to change your form of movement, because all great powers are brought into manifestation. First, by your ideal of it and longing for it, and second, by action of your body expressed by the ideal and movement. So now, as the seventh step of your sacred response, do this. Slowly rise from a sitting position. Stand erect, head up slightly, eyes forward. Let the arms hang easily at the side. Stand thou like a god on a mountain top looking out over the kingdom of earth and up to the stars, symbols of the source of high spiritual power for thee. 
Then easily extend your hands outward at the side just a little, so that your arms form side lines of an upright tower, and feel your body upheld by spirit within you. Stand thus while you count seven, and feel the forming ray of God giving an uplifting form to your body. Then relax easily, but do not let the body sag. Merely stand at ease with weight on one leg as a soldier stands when at rest. Count four while standing at rest in this way. Then repeat the above and repeat it seven times. That is, stand erect, look forward and upward, arms easily at the side, hands out a little away from the body, stand for seven counts and then relax for four counts, and repeat this seven times. Then be seated and vision the form of whatever you want. Your body is a vibratory form. While on earth your soul manifests through it. Every movement which makes your body more responsive to spirit gives form to your body or form to whatever you desire. It also augments the spiritual power of each such form to become what you want it to be. Do not be confused. I know that some teachers tell you never to visualize form and to visualize nothing but spirit. Such teaching is mistaken. It leaves the creations of your soul in exactly the same condition of God's creation on earth when he created it only thought only, that is, without form and void. Moreover, all such teaching, no matter who the teacher, book of course, are mistaken in completely failing to realize the most primal law God ever gave to man. Revealed four times even in the story of creation, that each thing creates after its own kind. Every power of God creates after its own kind. Therefore, if you do nothing but vision the form of what you want, you will rightly, by God's own law, obtain only visions of what you want. For visualizing creates after its own kind, that is, it creates visions. It is action which creates actuality. Always after its own kind, an action changes the spirit of form into actual form. I have asked you in this lesson to create actual form of everything you desire or will desire in this life, and the form I teach you is movement of the living, vibrating power of spirit, the Methonian ray of Elohim, the forming ray which God used on the third day of creation. No matter what you desire, conceive, one, the purpose of your expression of it, two, its uplifted form. 3. Its freedom from limitation, and 4. Its God power to expand into actuality. No matter what you desire, conceive it as the means of more complete expression of yourself. For example, if you desire a suit of clothes, vision that suit as one of the means by which you can express yourself more fully, that is, express your ideals of form, fit, and color, and your individuality as the equal of all others with whom you associate. Desire whatever you want as means of expressing your soul, and all power of God will work with you to fulfill the desire. And second, think of everything you desire in actual form as standing up by the power of spirit within itself. This is the very truth of all matter, for matter in any form cannot stand up by itself except by the atomic energy within it. Such energy is but one phase of the forming ray of God. Conceive each thing you desire in the form you want not as a squatty, weighted-down pile of dirt form, but as upright, uplifted form of spirit. Always vision anything you desire in uplifted form with solid base on earth, but with structures held up by the uplift of spirit within it. Envision whatever you want, as live with spirit, for only thus are you sincere in declaring that all is of spirit. And third, give each of your desires a limitless form. Spirit never limits desire, it is always infinite in desire. It is only your mind that is always limiting your desire. There are teachers who will treat you mentally to heal a pimple or demonstrate a few measly dollars. But such treatments are in opposition to spirit, for spirit is infinite and manifests infinitely. Please take no anxious thought as of a pimple. Instead, desire infinitely, and spirit, which is infinite, will fulfill your desire. The same law holds for all things you desire. Please stop giving little forms to your desire. Dare to make the form of your desire as great as spirit. Then it will be like the infinite power that creates it. Then all these other things shall be added unto you. And fourth, hourly realize that your soul has the infinitely expanding power to enfold what it wants. 
in the past your mind may have tried to draw or pull what you have desired to you, but this gives your desire a contracting or shrinking form instead of an expanding, actualizing form. You attain as you become like spirit, actively expanding. So instead of trying to draw spirit into you, or to draw things to you, expand as spirit expands, so that you shall unfold what you want and in the form you want. Become a divine inspirationist, an expansionist, and formist. Please note how simply, how perfectly, how easily you can build up a sacred response to spirit. First, free the body for inspiration of spirit. Second, expand out into spirit, out even to the stars. Third, become conscious of infinity out among the stars. Fourth, in this expansion, vision what you want. Fifth, use the sacred breath to resurrect its life. Sixth, you give your desire the living form you desire so that it can become an actuality. And always you desire what you want without the hungry and intensity of spiritual longing. Lesson 25. The Great Ideal Realist In forming what it wants, spirit always has a definite aim. You must also have a definite purpose if you are to give form to your desire so that they will come true. This purpose must be in line with your greatest desire. So what do you want most? Your answer can be clear if you forget small things and think of your soul and its expression. When a beam of white light passes through a glass prism, the white light is broken up into different colors, rainbow colors. This proves that each color is but a part of white light. Then in laboratory, scientists can unite these same colors. When they do, the united colors produce white light. This proves that white light is the blend of all colors. Both failures and the lack in life are due to partial manifestation, that is, to lack of complete manifestation. When you see green light, you see only a part of white light, because some green globe or shade is responsive only to green rays, and it lets only the green rays shine through. It is the globe or shade which holds back all the other rays. When you see a pure white light shining out in full glory, it means that the substance through which the light comes to your eye are so responsive to light that they let practically all the rays of the white light pass through. This is always evidence of complete manifestation. Your body is a prism for manifestation of your powers. What then is your greatest desire? Your soul is the holy light of spirit, perfect, complete. Your greatest desire is to manifest it fully and completely. All you want, health, vitality, abundance, love, illumination of spirit, are but parts. All will be included if you seek the complete expression of your soul, and that is heaven. Become an ideal realist. Do not let desire dangle in the air. Spirit always demands a form for expression of each desire. There is nothing materialistic in this. God himself, in beginning creation, knew that he needed a body for his expression. So God created one. All galaxies of stars and all substance and energy of earth and heaven form the body of God. Every star, molecule, atom, electron were used to create the magnificent body for the glorious expression of God. So also your soul, in its urge for infinite expression, eternally needs a body. It will always need a body, either the one you now have, or a body of another form in some other realm. And all you do now to make this body more responsive to spirit makes all subsequent bodies still more spiritual. To attain your ideal body here on earth, you need not do anything to improve soul, for the soul is already perfect. God made it perfect in the beginning in his own likeness. Your part is to make your body more responsive to it. You have read, the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. In the original, that is more clearly stated, it is, spirit is ready, but the body lacks standing up power. This has been the trouble with most of your past desires. They did not have enough stand-up form to become actual. That is why I teach you the forming ray of spirit, called the Yadinian ray by ancient Tiurians, the Methonian by the Egyptians, the Quavian ray by the Hebrew mystics, to give power to man's desire, so that they will be able to stand up and manifest as actual actualities. You yourself do not need to prepare a house for your soul. 
An infinite soul cannot be housed up inside a little body. Your body is only the focal point through which your soul expresses its glory of all power. What your soul wants is a vibratory instrument for its expression, and it cannot be attuned to express soul unless it is made responsive to spirit. Lesson 26. The Lord God of Your Soul to create form, which is an actuality, it is necessary that you become a Lord God of the forming ray. The word Lord in the Old Testament is the translation of a Hebrew word which means master. This word was used both for men and for God. And in the New Testament, the Greek word which is translated Lord also means master. It also was used both for men and for God. And you, created in the image and likeness of God, become your true self. Only when you combine the consciousness of mastership and lordship with certainty of your own divinity. Become the great master God, the Lord of your own desire. Become Lord God of infinitely expanding power of your soul. Become a master God in giving form to whatsoever you desire. Become the Lord God of your body. Remember, there are only two billion living people on earth, but eight hundred billion cells living in your body. If any man should ever become absolute ruler of the two billion people on earth, he would be the mighty Lord of earth. But already you are infinitely greater. You are the Lord God of 800,000 billion individuals of your body. You are the supreme God of all the universes of them. They live in the vibration of every attitude of your soul. You are their Lord Master, Lord also of all the expanding powers of spirit which can transform these cells of your body. By action and spirit, they become responsive to spirit. As you become more responsive to spirit, the cells of your body become more responsive to your soul. Then there is heaven. That is the manifested truth of the Father in me and I in you, brought into actuality every hour of your life. Lesson 27. Limitless Freedom in Action. This is the beginning lesson of the Holy Cathayan Ray. This is the ray whose power is symbolized by the creation of the sun and the moon on the fourth day of creation. Their creation was more than the creation of ordinary light. This is the power which in itself creates ordinary light, the power that transforms all things by purification. This term should be understood clearly. Purification means each thing separate by itself. Gold is pure. Lead is pure. Mix the two, and you have both impure gold and impure lead. Separate them, and you again have pure gold and pure lead. It is in this true sense that I use the word purification in all these lessons. This Cathayan power is symbolized by transformation of all things, as when the light of sun at dawn disperses the dark of the night, or the light of the moon transforms activity of earth into rest and calmness. This Cathayan ray is the power that both liberates and animates, and also purifies and transforms activity and substance. It symbolizes everything that is done by the activating power of the light of the sun at day, and by the calming power of the light of moonlight at night. It is the power by which the body is prepared for greater responsiveness, so that it can begin creation of its own form of life. To understand its value more fully, it is wise to repeat four truths. 1. Spirit is infinite. 2. Nothing but lack of responsiveness causes the lack of life. 3. The energy of spirit possesses limitless vitality, and hence all fatigue and illness and even death are due to the non-responsiveness of mind and substance of the body. And 4. Nothing but non-responsiveness hinders full response to and communion with all spirit. You know from experience that there are powers of the soul which purify and transform, that sometimes a mere moment of expectant joy instantly cleanses the body fatigue poisons and makes the body so spiritually responsive that all fatigue vanishes in a second. Such is the result of the purifying ray, the Cathayan ray of spirit. This is the ray used by God during the fourth day of creation. It is the great ray which was dominant in the civilizations of pre-Cathay, which existed ages before ancient Cathay, which in turn preceded Cathay, which preceded China. Its mystics built the ancient temple of heaven. 
This was, however, literally transformed long ages before the later ancient Cathayan Temple of Heaven was built. Energy can transform substance. Even heat rays can so transform water that it actually disappears and vanishes in the vapor. Since a low-powered heat ray can work such a change, imagine the miracles wrought by titanic Cathayan ray. This ray can transform the human body as astoundingly as a change wrought in changing coal to diamond. Coal and diamonds are composed of the same chemical substance. Coal cannot respond to light. Light cannot shine through it. But diamonds are purified and made responsive to light. Light shines through them in glorious, gorgeous colors. The change from coal to diamonds is an astounding change, due to the Cathayan ray which purifies the lumps of coal deep down in earth, so that coal does become diamond. I insert this short lesson for faith and expectancy for you, for it is very certain that, since coal can be changed to diamonds, miracles can be worked with your own body and your own life. Even a soggy body can be transformed by the Cathayan ray, so that the spirit will flow through it, manifesting power and glory. The first results of purification are a great multiplication of energy, need of less sleep, an astounding uplift of the body, and this means unlimited freedom and action. Lesson 28. Liberator and Animating Energizer There is also a vitalizing result due to the Cathayan power. Your lack of energy and deadness of body, due to its lack of responsiveness to spirit, are often so great that you remain unconscious or asleep for at least one-third of your life on earth. Sleep is not mysterious at all. Sleep is temporary death, due to lack purification sufficient to let spirit flow through the body easily and continuously. It is not difficult to understand that when the very spirit of life flows through your body continuously, it first energizes it, and then frees it of all fatigue so that you do need sleep. Your greatest need is always more vitality and energy, for with more vital energy your body will be healed. With more spiritual energy your personality will so change that abundance and success, happiness and love cannot be kept from you. Even physiological results of purification are astounding. Consider Mr. Adam and Mr. Brown. Adams and Brown are of approximately the same build, weight and structure. Both eat the same food, the same amount of food. They are approximately equal in intelligence and education. Do same kind of work for the same number of hours each day. Both live and have lived in the same universe of energy. Yet in manifestation, Adams and Brown are very different. Adams is always tired, sleeps eight hours a day, rests a lot, lacks vitality and health, and has no endurance. Brown is vital, virile, strong, healthy, always filled with energy, always active, sleeps five hours a day. The brain of each is the dynamo of his respective body. The muscles of each are his respective motors. The nerves of each are the wires which carry energy from dynamo to motor for all expression. But the brain of Adams is not truly responsive to spiritual energy which surrounds and permeates all things. It is so unresponsive that only 1,000 units of God's energy flows into each minute, so at best he has 1,000 units of power to use per minute. Moreover, Adam's nerves are not responsive. 300 units of his 1,000 units are used up, just trying to get through the cells which form the nerve path. Then also his muscles are so blocked with waste that they do not respond easily to let the energy flow through them. They are so unresponsive that 400 units of energy are used up in friction trying to get through his muscles in action. Hence, 600 units of the 1,000 units of energy inspired into Adam's body are used up trying to get through his body. So he has only 400 units of energy left for actual manifestation in strength and health, action and living. He is always weak and tired, a colorless, ambitionless man. In contrast, the brain of Brown is so responsive to spirit that 1,800 units of spiritual energy flow into and through his brain every minute. His nerves also are responsive, and less than 100 units of his 1,800 units are used from brain to muscle. His muscles are so responsive that they use only 100 units more in turning energy into action. Brown has 1,600 units of energy in actual use each minute, for use. Brown has four times the energy Adams has, yet all energy of the universe surrounds each of them. The amount that comes through into use depends on whether or not the body has or has not become consciously or unconsciously responsive to the Cathayan ray of God's powers. Lesson 29. 
cleaner and quickening emancipator. I have said that the Cathayan ray is a purifying ray. The purifying process taught here are not materialistic. When a glass is covered with black greasy dirt and then washed to crystal clearness so that the light is its glory of colors can shine through it. The change is material so far as the dirt is concerned. But to the light the change is spiritual for it lets more of the spirit of light shine through. So also with the body. Purification fulfills the great purpose of making each cell more responsive to spirit and hence to life, even to your life, it is a spiritual process. Spirit and living blood purify the cells of your body. The purifying activities of lungs, skin, kidneys, and intestines are but helps the blood's purifying process. Your blood does more than merely wash the cells. It affects a holy inner purification inside each cell. Only spiritual purification makes the body more responsive. There is a spiritual function of bodily organs and it is your duty to be their cleaning God, to clean them spiritually, to use them, spiritually to manifest more of spirit. In ancient and holy Cathay, four purifying processes were worshipped as divinely spiritual, processes taking place not only in the body of man, but in all things throughout the universe. For spirituality is spirit expressing through the body. That is why the four corners of the temple of heaven were consecrated, one to each process of purification. We moderns have condemned and cursed and debased most things that have been and are sweet and pure and holy in life. We debase sex, prostitute love, ridicule brotherhood. We have even condemned substance, the most beneficial substance God has made for man, and called their use sinful. For a hundred years men were hung without trial if caught feeding carrots to their cattle because the yellow on carrots was condemned as a color of sin produced by witchcraft. Now we know that the yellow substance is carotene, vitamin A, the actually essential substance for growth in all life. Only a few years ago we condemned tomatoes, believing that juice of even one tomato would make a young girl immoral for life. We condemned tobacco because of its nicotine, yet now we know that nicotine is the loving brother of vitamin B1. Scientists have kept this fact rather hidden because they know the prejudice of ignorance might prevent its use. And it's amusing to see earnestly ignorant people who think it a sin to smoke cigarettes go to the drugstore and pay $2 for tablets of vitamin B1, which is pure nicotinic acid. Most of the things which the ancient spiritualized we have condemned as sinful, and we are suffering from our own condemnation. Nevertheless, we are making progress. All advances of man are from condemnation to idealization. Today we think only of the crude physiological cleansing, but in the holy days the process were spiritualized. Cathay, sometimes called Cather and Carthar, meant the response to the flow of the spirit which purifies. Today we have only the crude remnant of the old meaning in the word cathargic. How debased our meaning is is evident from the fact that the word originally meant chaste or pure. Thousands of years after the temple of Cathay, a little of its spiritual idealism had come down to the holy men of early Judea, for they wrote of the soul of man in his reins, or reins, R-E-N-E-S. From root of this word we have adrenal, the miracle glands attached to the kidney. I write these truths only to awaken in you something of the spiritual significance of the purification needed to free the body for great manifestation of spirit. First, aid the purification work of the kidney. For this, use the substance in celery, which science has found acts almost mystically. Use celery broth, not raw celery or raw celery juice. Prepare it thus. Cut a quarter pound of celery stalks into small chunks. Boil them 20 minutes, salt to taste, drain off the water. The water is the broth for you to use. Or buy canned celery juice at a food shop, and to one cup of said juice add half a cup of water, heat it until it boils. Every morning use a cup of this cooked celery broth. Drink it before you take anything else, sweeten or salt to taste. Yes, I know that raw celery contains beneficial vitamins and salts, and that asparagus also increases flow of water from the kidneys. But our aim now is to aid them to help living blood to purify the cells of the body. For this, use the cooked broth. Second, every night before you go to bed, help the purification process of the intestines. No, I am not writing of any mere cleansing of the intestines. I am not writing of flooding the intestines. I am not interested in the intestines as a sewer. 
but I am interested in the purity of the billions of living cells of your body and their responsiveness to spirit. So I teach you purification which helps the living blood to purify your entire body of cells for greater flow of spirit. To attain this result, do not depend on fruit juices. The acid fruit juices of lemon, lime, grapefruit, orange or tomato, and all cathargics of oils or acids tend to deplete the blood instead of helping it to purify the body. Of course, such juices cause freer movement of intestine because of their effect in flooding the intestine with water. But where does the water for such flooding come from? This is the important factor. The process is this. All acids tend to eat up animal cells. Every tissue of your body is composed of animal cells, not plant cells. Delicate walls of your intestines are of animal cells. When you take acid juices or oils which free acids to eat into the delicately thin tissue walls of the intestines, its intelligence knows that if its walls are eaten through, you will bleed to death internally. Consequently, its cells, to protect themselves and you, draw quantities of water from the blood and pour it into the intestine to dilute and weaken acid. This floods the intestine enough to make it move, but weakens the blood, so it is difficult for the blood perfectly to perform its work of purification of the cells of the body. Certainly, mineral salts and fruits are good for the body, and we should eat them, but we can also obtain them from other foods without excessive use of acid fruit juices, which, if sufficient to move the intestine, deplete the blood of its essential water. Overuse of acid juices is the worst food fat of these years. I consider these truths so important and so little understood today that if it were nothing more than this in this entire course, it would be worth well while. In contrast to all methods which take water from the blood and deplete it, I give you a method of purification which adds water to the blood and helps it purify the cells of the body. This is the only true purification help of which I know of. For this purpose, take one half cup of spinach juice, you can now buy it in cans, add one half cup of sweet milk and one full cup of distilled water. Use distilled water. No other water is valuable for this purpose. If there is no commercial company selling distilled water in your locality, buy it at a drugstore. This makes two cups of this purification drink. Within a week you will feel a new lightness of the body. During the fourth step of the sacred response, when your spirit is reaching out to the stars, vision the great Cathayan ray, pouring into and through your body, cleansing and purifying it. This purification makes your body more responsive to spirit. In the Cathayan civilization, when purification was worshipped, it worked tremendous advancement in the lives of men and in the race. Although Chinese of today have long since lost knowledge of the spiritual significance of this ray, yet results still persist. The Chinese today possess greater continuance of life and youthfulness than any other people on the face of the earth, greatest continuing vitality and virility. The Egyptian civilization is but a memory. Spiritual attainments of ancient Greece are past. Atlantis and Mu and all others lost the power to continue to live. But the Cathayan ray gives such phenomenal continuance of life that even Chinese of today, who have unconsciously inherited something of spiritual purification, continue their ancient race. This corruptible must put on incorruption. Nothing but the attitude of your mind and the condition of your body interfere with complete response to spirit, and all the things you want, vitality, health, virility, endurance, success, illumination, communion, memories of the past, or certainty of the future, and the highest illumination come only as you become more responsive to spirit. Lesson 30. Vibratory Harmony of Body this teaches the Armonian ray of Eleusis, the Salian ray of Tibet, the Shemian of the mystic seers of the Hebrews. To give harmony to each thing of his creation, God used this master ray of spirit the fifth day of creation. This ray was lost to the Hebrew priests, but it was known to the ancient Hebrew mystics. They called it the Shemian ray. The mystics of Tibet, 4,000 years later, called it penetrating music or the Salian of the rising sun. But no people worshipped their spirit power so devotedly as the very holy souls who founded the early Eleusian mysteries. They called it the ray of Elios, the joy of freedom. The result was armonia, from which we get our word harmony. Jesus was initiated into the mystery powers of this ray. Christ used this word, 
Ilios and a derivative of it in two of his great teachings that have not yet been understood. First, the God does not want sacrifices for man, but that God wants man to feel mercy, the joyousness of free life. And second, that those who gain joyous freedom for others shall be blessed with joyously freedom themselves. That is, the Elios and Eliim, translated mercy in Matthew 9.13 and merciful in Matthew 5.7, truly mean joyously free. This ray is the synchronizing ray of the universe, for nothing but harmony brings joyous freedom in life. There comes a period in the creation of anything when creation cannot advance unless all of its parts or energies work together in harmony, and they cannot work together harmoniously unless each part is free to manifest its own activity. No matter how responsive you make your mind and nerves and brain center, there is no transforming responsiveness until all tissues of your body are synchronized to vibrate to the higher unheard silent overtones so that all cells work together in perfect harmonic cooperation. And remember, it is one thing to think that you are free in your mind, so that spirit will flow more freely into your consciousness and lift it to superconsciousness. It is quite another thing actually to free your body, so spirit does flow into and through it easily. To free body activities, the muscles must respond to spirit. Muscles may be strong, yet as unnonresponsive as bands of wood, or they may be weak and just as unresponsive as dish rags, or they may be just muscles, stiff or soft or sloppy. But no matter what their condition at present, you want them to be responsive to spirit, as powerful as steel springs when you need power, and as gentle as ripples of moonlight on quiet water, when you wish him to be at ease yet ready to be active. The responsiveness of your muscles is vitally important. First, because they form three-fourths of your entire body. Second, because they are now so very non-responsive. And third, because they are your one means of expression. Fourth, because they are the last barrier to the spiritual responsiveness of your body and all your expressions on earth. Yes, your muscles are on your one basic means of expression. You cannot produce even one tone or speak except by action of the muscles of your torso, throat, cheeks, tongue, and lips. You cannot look at anything unless muscles move the eyeball. Every expression, face, or body is due to muscle movement. It is very important that you spiritualize their activity so that spirit in you can express fully and completely. And yet your muscles are very non-responsive. If a fly lights on the side of your torso, your muscles are so deadened and unresponsive that you cannot even flip those muscles as a horse can to get rid of that fly. Also, you have almost killed normal responsive activity in muscles because of silly methods used to develop muscles. You have tensed muscles in exercise and block up energy, then relax them to get relief from the fatigue of the tensing, till you are so tired you have no impulse to express anything. So I teach you to tune up your muscles to perfect vibratory harmony, to be responsive to the synchronizing ray, the ray that harmonizes all sphere of creation, so that all substance of your body, even muscles, will move in harmony with spirit, with your activity wedded to activity of spirit to manifest new life. The synchronizing or Shemian ray dominated the civilization directed by the mystics of Tibet and that of the super holy men of very ancient Greece at the time when there was a truly spiritual understanding of Eleusian mysteries. It is the ray of the fifth day of creation of harmonizing each living thing or creature for life of its own kind. It also harmonizes the energy of man with the energy of stars and hence increases man's power a thousandfold. To this point, I have used names as previously translated, but I myself shall change the translation for the word vitalizing more truly reveals the nature of this particular creative power which God used on the fifth day of creation. It is a harmonizing ray that it manifests with mighty tone, vibrating throughout all matter, but nevertheless it is primarily the vitalizing which gives life to matter. This is clear from what God did the fifth day of creation. There was the sea which had not yet brought forth life, for water is not life, nothing but two gases, hydrogen and oxygen. So God used this vitalizing ray to impregnate water, and life was born out of that which had not previously been life. This seems to be an impossible miracle, yet it is not impossible even for man. 
One of our great biologists whipped WAP mere soapy water by means of a laboratory machine operating at a tremendous speed and created living cells out of infinitely tiny bubbles of soapy water. Certainly the whipping, wapping itself did not create life, but it did activate the vibration of the substance so that the vitalizing rays of life could manifest through them. This is the purpose of the power of the vitalizing ray, to bring forth life out of substance that are not living. Remember also that this vitalizing ray is a tonal ray, but of much higher vibration. It cannot be heard by the human ear, yet it vibrates through all the universe. It is the harmonic tone, love, life tone of star to star. This is the universal tone, the overtone of the universe. This love life vibration is essential for new life. For though I speak with tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am become as a sounding brass. I teach you the synchronizing tone of the stars, the vitalizing ray, the divine musician of your soul and body. It can tune up your body structure to the basal tone of the universe and create life where there has been no life. It tunes up every cell of your body, your brain and nerves and muscles and all other inner organs to its own sublime overtone. The determination of this note is not based on a theoretical assumption or poetic phrase such as music of the spheres. This dominant celestial overtone is now proven. Other great harmonic chords vibrate throughout the universe, through all stars and constellations of stars, and the same harmonics vibrate through earth and in earth, and in all things of earth even in and through your body. In their vibration you live and move and have your being. When you are not responsive to them, there is discordant hell both in your mind and in your body. But when you are in tune, there is a heaven of activity. There is, however, one basic overtone of these chords. It is the key tone of the great vitalizing ray of heaven. I heard it first in spirit. Later I heard it here on earth, in wind and trees, in the murmur of brooks, in the queen of doves, and deep underneath and within the roar of waves of the sea. Later I heard it in one great opera, Parsifal. Then, daily for years, I heard it vibrated from one great temple gong of the mystic mountains of the east. I write one gong, because even the great masters know of only one gong on earth, which is tuned down to this basic tone. The secret of making such a gong was discovered by the ancient Tiwakans. They made one, and thousands of years later sent it to Salo in Tibet. And now it is again sent back to our western continents to tone the spiritualizing chants of the sacred shrine of this new age. The tone of this gong is almost like an A-flat, below middle C on our piano today, and is now revealed for you to use. See the next lesson. Lesson 31. Permeating Activist and Unifier Tune your body to the key tone of the universe, and you harmonize all the vibrations of your actual physical body with spirit and open the way for harmony in all you create. Such response augments your expectancy, expands thought, uplifts emotions of peace and love, joy and power, so that you are holy, body, mind, heart, soul, wholly in tune with harmonic spirit. First, learn to hear the tone, at least hints of it, in all deep love tone to the human voice. I used to teach a student to strike the key of A-flat on a piano, the A-flat below middle C, and to listen to the tone, so that the student would try to tune his voice to it. I do not teach anyone to do this anymore. One, because the great harmonic overtones of the universe differ as they vibrate in every human body. And two, because many students, in spite of my caution not to think much about this work, gave so much mental effort to trying to produce a tone like the tone A flat on the piano that they hindered their higher spiritual response. So now I teach you the truer way of getting your basic tonal response to a great overtone. Tones of different individuals vary because of the different structures of their body, and your tone should be your tone, fitted to the structure of your body. Before humming this tone, to make the body more responsive, sit down quietly alone by yourself, Vision the love of star for star, love of plants for sunlight, love of electron for proton, so great that it holds to the proton with such power that man finds it difficult to separate one from the other, even with millions of volts of electricity. Vision the love of mothers of all ages and your love of the one you most love. Next, vision yourself talking with a great feeling of love to the one person you love most on earth. 
then hum the tone you use to express your own deepest love. It will be your tone, fitted at this moment to spiritualize your body to vibrate in harmony with the great master harmonic tones of all the universe. Now prepare to synchronize your entire body, every cell of it, with this harmonic tone of the universe, to let it vibrate through you, through every cell of your body. In preparation, sit in an easy expectant position, in a position that is most restfully expectant for you, and think of the stars, and of expanding out to the stars and trying to feel your spirit among them. Then vision what you want, revive your body by the holy breath, form the concepts of what you desire, vision the cleansing power of the Cathayan ray, and all that time intensely and lovingly desire whatsoever you most want. Then again expectantly reach out in spirit to the stars and hum easily this mystic tone of love. Hum it repeatedly for a few seconds at a time, about four minutes at all, each morning, each night, trying to feel it in your body. Do not hum loudly. Hum very softly and feel it vibrating. And while you are humming this mystic tone, hold to the expectant attitude of body, head and eyes a little upward. Hold to the expanding attitude of the soul, reaching out and up in spirit to join with the peace and love and joy and power of the universe. And you hum this tone. Forget your body. Just try to feel yourself expanding with its vibration out into the infinite. No separate time should be taken for this because it should be included as the seventh step of the sacred response. This opens all substance, including your body, to become a channel for the symphonic ray of the universe. Lesson 32. The Telochi Vibrationist. There is a music of the spheres. It is perfect in numbers and proportional relationship of tones, for spirit in all of its relationships and activities is always perfect. The dominant note of the majestic synchronizing ray comes from the very center of the universe of stars. It is known by its likeness to the telosis number of perfect tones on the musical scale, and the telosis numbers of the harmonic movement of the universe. The spiritual base of these perfect numbers is 1, 4, 7. The key tone of the universe is perfect in these numbers. There are four base tones in the octave, Do, Mi, Sol, Do. There are seven intervals in the major scale. There are 13 intervals in the perfected chromatic scale. There are 19 harmonics of each pure string note. The dominant tone of the universe is the mother love tone. It is the tenth note of the thirteenth interval of the perfected chromatic scale. Ten is the first super perfect one. Thirteen is the first super perfect four. See Lesson 2 and 3 for reduction on basic process. Of course, 13 is so perfect that ancient mystics taught common minds to be suspicious of it and to avoid it. They did not want the symbolism of its perfection of energies known except in their own priesthood. Since I do emphasize response to the synchronizing ray of the stars, you may wonder if I believe in astrology. My answer, as previously stated, is no and yes. True astrology is a science of stars, for astro means star and ology means science. But today the true science is debased, that is, it is off its base, for the emphasis is given to planets such as Jupiter, Mars, Saturn, etc., and not to the stars. I do not depend much on planetology, for all planets are dead, they have no energy of their own. Each reflects only a tiny part of the light of sun and stars. So I do not worry about the influence of any tiny part of such light reflected from dead planets when I can bathe in the whole living light, that is, the holy light of the universe. There are living stars, a hundred million times larger than our sun, and there are star suns so heavy that if your brain's substance were as heavy as their substance, your brain would weigh one trillion thirty-four billion pounds. Other stars are so thin you could fly through them, so thin that our air is as solid in comparison. Then there are stars of black light and other star suns of gloriously gorgeous living light. All star suns forever radiate titanic energies of God. These energies as cosmic spirit do shoot through our bodies, so I do believe in astronomy, 
and in the true astrology of energy of living stars manifesting as music of the spheres. The music of the universe is silent to our ears, but out of it its infinite harmony comes the ray of power which vitalizes all life because it harmonizes it. All the results you desire, whether on earth or heaven, are always attainable if the powers of spirit work together. It is this mystic, synchronizing ray, and your response to it, which activates power in you with the powers of heaven. Responsiveness to spirit and to all its manifestations is multiplied many fold by this great harmonic tone of the universe, which vitalizes that which is not life into that which is life. It is an angel power from God. Commune with it, and you commune with all angels of God. Spirit is infinite, hence there are angels. The word translated angel in our New Testament means the good which is sent out, a spiritual power sent out of God. These lessons will be read by students of different beliefs. I respect your beliefs, but nevertheless our mere mental beliefs are not important. When any person says, I don't believe in this or I don't believe in that, they do nothing but state their own limitations. In contrast, spirit rises to superconsciousness and knows. Many people ask if I believe in spiritualism. I answer, no or yes, for all life lives. Life lives forever, and forever continues on. But there are phases of spiritualism which are nothing but crude efforts to show off tiny limited response to spirit. Since all life is intelligent and loving, it does not wish to be separated from that which it knows and loves. And since it is intelligent and loving, it longs to continue communion with those it loves. But certainly do not mistake the mere telephone receiver, the medium, for the soul at the other end. True spiritualism is the opposite of materialism. Spirit is infinite in energy and capacity. Hence all efforts to secure limited responses are outside the realm of true spirit. To be spiritual, you must be like spirit. To be like spirit, you must be able to respond to spirit, easily and fully in infinite manifestation. True response is direct and conscious and intimate communion, direct, intimate contact with God or the masters or angels, or any soul that desires to help you is spiritual. And the purification of the body given in this course opens you for true communion. That is neither fantastic or twisted or mistaken. Now return with me to our cosmic vibratory ray of harmony of the universe, the ray that vitalizes substance matter. Dwell on it. Feel it vibrating through your body. See Lesson 30. Feel it vibrating so that it tunes up the substance of every cell of the millions of billions of brain cells and every nerve and muscle of your body, so that all substance becomes responsive to the vitalizing ray which weds substance so that new life is created out of that which is not manifest in his life, so that the very substance of your body gives birth to new life for you. Lesson 33. The Infusing Creation of Newness this lesson teaches the Godesian ray of the masters, the sixth great recreative ray of God. In this, we come to another phase of body responsiveness, rebuilding newness, recreating tissues, creating youthfulness. Many a man has so improved conditions of his body that he feels like a new man. Such a person is sincere. He feels as though his body were made new. But if it were recreated, it would not continue slowly dying. If he built true newness, his body would be like those of the masters, immortal. Building anew comes from response to the great Godesian ray, that is, the ray of the sixth day of God's creation. On that day, God made man. It was the first formation of anything like that which he had previously existed, for God made man in his own image like unto himself. This ray is the Godesh of Melchizedek, the Nephesian of holy Egyptians the Tizonian ray of ancient Tyura and Tibet. But in terms of today, I call it the recreative ray. Out in infinite space, it creates new atoms, new stars. On earth, it creates new substance and new cells. When you respond to it, it recreates the cells in your body. The power of this ray is astoundingly peculiar. Its vibration is next to the highest of all seven rays. It is the only ray which gives soul and everything our substance, the power to recreate in these higher vibrations. By it, animals can reproduce young, plants can reproduce plants, cells can reproduce themselves, and thus recreate a newness of the human body for man. 
This sixth power of God is also able to recreate ideas and ideals in love, even recreates the very life of the soul. But since it is of spirit, recreation cannot be affected by conscious mind, but be wrought by spirit after its own kind. If you do not accept the goodness of spirit and all God has created, you cannot fully respond to it, for you must accept God's creation as God's creation, to create as God creates. If you dislike many things or conditions or people, then your mind is in opposition to the very nature of the Gadishian ray, which loves all because it recreates all. Dislikes prevent responsiveness to spirit because dislikes are due to part knowledge. Part knowledge is due to the mind which sees through a glass darkly, but holiness or wholeness is of spirit, for spirit is whole and holy. Each earnest soul in its aspiration longs to be able to create as the masters create by use of the fifth ray, which vitalizes substance into life, and by use of the sixth ray, which reproduces both substance and life. In other words, many a soul wishes to create by what is called materialization. This comes by use of these two rays. But they are both of spirit and of God. And so long as conscious mind is prejudiced by part knowledge, you cannot create the complete holy newness you desire. Dislikes always prevent such recreation. And I am writing now of your persisting prejudice against many of the things God himself created and your condemnation of them. Although sincere, they are in opposition to spirit. They indicate lack of agreement with God's own pronouncement that all he created is very good. To build your body anew, to impregnate it with the mystic vitalizing ray, the recreating ray, rise above all your old dislikes and prejudice. Renew your mind and, like spirit, conceive the goodness of all things as God does. Lesson 34 infinite love and judge in origin holy h o l y and holy w h o l l y come from similar root words to become holy man must rise to the love of all things for the truth is definite god saw everything that he made and behold it was very good it is only man's misuse of things that produces ill results and ill use of emotions and impulses which produce evil Note well, God idealizes all things, but man condemns. It is condemnation which produces the evil. God created an ideal world for man, and God gave his creation into your hands and gave you spiritual rule and dominion over all things he made. God did not tell you to condemn and shun any of them, but he did tell you to use all of them for your good. The greatest factor that keeps you from all your desires are your dislikes, which bar you from the spiritual use of things already created for you. God knows that all he made is good. But unless you accept God's truth, your attitude makes you non-responsive to spirit and keeps you from God. What hinders you is condemnation. It is due to part knowledge, for knowledge of the holy or whole is understanding. It is lack of whole knowledge and condemnation due to that lack that has hindered man in all the ages. Let me give you a few illustrations of such condemnation. Take a few foods as an example. Carrots. First, a few hundred years ago in England, even scientific men believed the yellow color of carrots was proof of the presence of evil spirits. So if a farmer fed carrots to his cows, he would be hanged by the neck until dead and without trial. Then potatoes. 260 years ago in Europe, scientists knew that potatoes were deadly poisonous. Yes, the scientists knew it. No doubt about it. For 40 years, potatoes in Europe were used only by military forces to be fed to prisoners, hoping to kill them off. And tomatoes. Only 90 years ago, physicians in our country believed that tomatoes were poisonously detrimental to morals. No mother would let a young daughter eat a tomato because all scientists knew that even one tomato would make a young maid immoral for life. Scores of other things that are good have been condemned, and the condemnation is spread to soul emotion desires, and man suffers because of his condemnation of them. In the past, whenever a new product was first imported from a foreign country, it was condemned as evil. This was the attitude when carrots were first taken from Italy to England, when potatoes and tobacco were taken from America to Europe, when coffee was first brought from Java, etc., 
All dislikes and fears are due to lack of knowledge. But with new knowledge, old condemnation pass. Things we once thought were evil are now known to be good. Ultimately, man will realize that all is good. So why not get ahead of the race, accept God's truth now? Then, with love and use of all things, you can rise to heights attained by the masters and create as they create. Idealize and use all things, each after its own kind. There are still people who believe that spirituality is attained by what one does not do. And such people try to become spiritual by avoiding the use of many things which God has provided for them to use. They assume that the masters are transcendingly great because they do not do this or they do not eat that. But one becomes a master by attuning oneself to God's creation. Great masters integrate their lives with all things. That is why they are holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy in tune with spirit. Hence they transcend age and actually build new bodies. To build your body anew, integrate your life with the life of all things and use all things. For example, no matter what kind of food you eat, integrate your spirit with the spirit of its substance and thus free its life by recognizing that its substance is created of spirit. All true life is integrated with spirit and is continuous. Scientists as well as mystics know that life in every form is conscious. Each manifestation is conscious. The plant is as conscious as the animal. And any spiritual ray which has already attained power of producing a form for itself here can produce another new form. For the very power which gives its consciousness to create one form is the same power which can create other forms to continue in manifestation. When one form disappears, life is freed from that form. It then moves on in accord with God's law from life to life. These lessons will be studied by many people, by some who eat meat and by some who are strict vegetarians. I am not a propagandist, one way or the other. I do not ask you to eat meat foods or not eat them. But I do urge you to integrate yourself with all life and all changes as the great masters have done. Never let part knowledge and its prejudice block your advance to the highest spiritual responsiveness. I present spiritual truth. All forms of anything you eat are but forms of manifestation of life, not life itself. Free your soul of prejudice and hence of all fear of things. Free your body to respond to all that is spiritually limitless. God is love. Of love he created all things. Lift yourself up to love of all things and become like God. Love impregnates and transforms all things, even foods. Love foods in all their lower vibrations vanish, for love transfigures all things. Choose the substances which make the body most responsive to spirit, those which are most responsive to Godesian ray which creates newness. Ancient priests of Judea, even though they had lost most of the spirituality of their holy men, worshipped this ray. The inner temple was the Godesh Hak Godishim, Holy of Holies. In it, man worshipped the ray of creativeness, the Elohim power used by God during the sixth day of creation, the only ray which recreates like God with powers to recreate anew. Lesson 35. The Reforming Architect. Come now to actual response to the ray of recreation and choice of responsive substance for the cells of a new body. It is not so important to fuss over starches or sugars or fats or proteins, for they always build a body that slowly dies after its first 21 years. They build a squatty body, built like the old Pyramid of Giza, heavy on itself, with weight built upon weight. In contrast, I teach you to build a new body like the new Pyramid, thrilled by spirit, upheld by spirit, and reaching upward. Are not cereals and all starch foods good for the body? Certainly, starch foods are good for solidity, but they are of little value as materials responsive to spirit. For myself, I do not want a concrete house for my soul. I want an infinitely responsive instrument for spirit. Starch food builds up a good, solid, stupid body, which always tires out quickly that it needs much sleep. It ages quickly because it is not able to respond fully enough to the finer vibration of spirit to create youthfulness. The starch foods are... 1. Underground vegetables, potatoes, turnips, beets, etc. 2. Grains, wheat, rice, corn, barley, rye, and all products made from grains, 
white and whole wheat flours, bread, cake, breakfast cereals, etc. 3. Legumes, peas, beans, lentils, soybeans, etc. 4. Most nuts and 2. Fruits, breadfruit and banana. During childhood, starch food is needed for substance to increase the size of the body. Eat more protein foods. A diet high in protein is not detrimental to any organ of the body. The proteins do make the body more responsive to spirit. Such foods are fish, eggs, cheese, red meats, lentils, gelatin, etc. Eat fat foods for responsiveness of nerve and brain tissue. Fat foods will not make you stout unless you also overeat starches and sugars. Now we come to the mystical creators, two of the greatest mysteries of spirit and substance. Just as God directed man to make glass to be responsive to light to manifest his glory of color, so God created two substances to be responsive to the Godesian ray to manifest newness. The first is mystic chlorophyll, the living green substance in leaves. The second are those mysterious new growing substances called oxanons, which have power to activate new growth. Chlorophyll is still the mystery substance of this earth. In all green plant leaves, this substance inspires, that in takes in, the rays of radiant energy of sunlight, and works a transformation with non-living substance of soil, producing living substance. In food substance for man, it seems to be most responsive in taking in, or inspiring, the spiritually cosmic energy of the universe into man's body. In other words, chlorophyll, as food, apparently makes your body so responsive that the cosmic energy of spirit flows into and through it freely and abundantly. This mystic substance, so mysterious that it still confounds all scientists, is responsive to the vitalizing ray which creates structure of the body anew. Remember that spirit energy is limitless. It never tires. So when the body is fed this mysterious substance and becomes more responsive to spirit, its fatigue is lessened and its aging process delayed. If I myself should live on the ordinary diet or on diets of food fattest, my body would become so unresponsive to spirit, so non-responsive to the vitalizing ray, that my body would have to suspend consciousness for many hours each day. That is, I would have to remain unconscious, sleep as you call it, for seven or more hours a day. It is evident that so long as spirit flows easily into and through the body, the body does not tire, and there is abundant and vitally impulsive energy. And so long as there is no fatigue and no lack of energy, then certainly there is no need of sleep. When I use foods which contain chlorophyll, a couple of glasses daily of green leaf juice, for instance, and do not load my body down with starches, but instead eat plenty of responsive protein foods, then my body responds more fully to spirit. Oh, become responsive to spirit. It is criminally inefficient to live so that you need to spend one-third of your life in bed unconscious. Some say, but sleep is natural. So is a pig natural. It is the unresponsive condition of the body which makes it necessary for most people to spend one-third of their lives in the temporary death which we call sleep, and all because they live so earthily that the body cannot respond enough to spirit to live spiritually and vitally. Now consider the second group of mystic substance which tends to make the body very responsive to the spiritually vitalizing, recreating ray of creation. It is not enough merely to make your body responsive enough to take in the creative energy of spirit. It must be made so responsive within that the inspired creative energy of the Gaudetian ray will in turn create new and youthful cells each hour. For this, the second group of substance mentioned is created by God, responsive to the recreative ray of creation. Infinite intelligence in nature works in mysterious ways. It produces auxins, A-U-X-I-N-S, in all things when they are newly growing, and auxins in plant or animals impel new growth of new cells. These are exceptionally responsive to spirit, for new growth takes place whenever they are present. They are the substance which are responsible to the recreative power of the vitalizing ray of creation. Scientists who have investigated this subject for several years have written of these substances as immature foods. Immature foods are the young sprouts of seeds or plants used as food before the sprouting stems or leaves reach maturity. Nature loads these new growing sprouts with oxanons for new growth and oxanons used as food apparently impel new growth of new cells and youthful tissue. 
new growing structure is super responsive to life. Hence, oxanons are substance for viral manifestation of life. By their use as foods, organs, and tissues are changed. One helping, at least twice a week, of half a handful of new growing sprouts of seeds or very tender young leaves works miracle in new growth. Supply your body not with substance which are said to produce a good solid body, not with substance which weigh it down, not with substances which make it to drag the energy of spirit, not with substance which will leave a lot of waste in your body. Instead, make your body spiritually responsive to life and to the Godetian ray of spirit which impels all new life. This is the mysterious secret sought for ages. This is the secret of the mystic alchemist. And yet there is nothing mysterious about it. With use of more responsive substances, food, the body becomes more responsive. When more responsive, spirit flows more freely through it with less friction, less wear and tear, and less fatigue. Spirit can transform your body into actual newness, and your body will respond to all energies about you, and you will respond to the conscience of others, to the soul surrounding you, the spirit of the infinite self. Then the body, as it responds to the Godesian ray, becomes spiritualized and actually creates new cells, the mystic creation of being born again. Lesson 36. Holding Your Creation The actualizing ray of our age was once called the mystic, cosmicizing ray, which actually fulfills the prayer of Christ. They will be done in earth as it is in heaven. As you respond to it, your heaven of desire becomes an actuality on earth, for this is the ray, back of all cruder rays which scientists call cosmic rays the highest of all rays. It can unite movement of vibrations with movement of matter. It is the power of consummation, last step in creation. I have translated its basic meaning by several names, but to make it clear to you I call it the holding ray. That is its nature. It has the power to hold what has been created, so you can continue to use it. I shall reveal later that this is the meaning of God, Sabbathized the seventh day. There is a divine sequence in the sacred response to spirit, because the seven rays are used in the same order in which God used them in the seven days of creation. First, before you can create any actual thing or condition, spiritual energy must be inspired into the creation you want. Second, you must expand desire and effort and continually resurrect your primal urge to keep it vitally alive. Third, you must use the power which gives your ideal or desire actuality, that is, gives it identity in a form of its own. Fourth, you must clarify the ideal or purify the substance. It will not be a messy mixture of what you want and do not want. Fifth, to give it life. You must vitalize it, even create life out of that which had no life, and unify all parts to work together in harmony. Otherwise, it will wear itself out and be of little use because of the friction within itself. Sixth, you must prevent fixity and stagnation by giving it power to recreate itself, to continue producing what you desire. And seventh, since its actuality may still be separated from you, you complete your work by the power of the holding ray, power to keep and use what you have created. This lesson brings us to the last barrier which hinders full response of both mind and body to spirit. That barrier is the non-responsive condition of your muscles. Perhaps the last thing you have thought of doing is making your muscles spiritual in action. They seem so unspiritual that it seems impossible. Yet, to make body responsive to spirit, you must tune up your muscles because they form three-fourths of your body. And no matter how responsive you make brain and nerves, you will not attain full responsiveness until you do learn how to make your muscles respond to spirit so that they can act without fatigue and with a continuous thrill of energy. Without doubt, you have tried to improve your muscles. At some time, you have probably taken some kind of exercise to make them healthier and stronger. All such exercises alternately contract and relax muscles. Some systems teach psychotensing, other special relaxation. Oh, there are many systems, but none of them do anything more than tense and relax in one way or another. And what is the result of tensing? You know, it is fatigue. And the more you tense your muscle, the greater the fatigue. And why do you study systems of relaxing your muscle? To try to give them a little rest from the fatigue due to the tensing. 
That is, you relax him, so you can tense him again and cause more fatigue. At least this is silly for an intelligent human being, and very silly for a spiritual being, who knows that all your energy is of spirit, and that spirit never tires. And how does tensing affect your energy? It holds energy in your muscles, stops its easy flow through them, blocks up energy so much it soon exhausts you. And since the very impulse of energy is to flow continuously stopping its flow works havoc. That is why our strong men always die so young. Next consider what relaxation does to your energy. It makes muscles slack and inactive, so slack they are not active enough to receive more energy. Hence, relaxation prevents more energy from flowing into your muscles, and this produces a constant feeling of lack of energy, a continuous, tired-out feeling. And now you're thinking, well, what can I do with my muscles except contract and tense them, and release and relax them? And probably your muscles have never done anything else. Yet certainly, what you have been doing is not in line with spirit, for spirit is the urge to continue a constant flow of tireless energy. And yet, when you are actually looking for more energy, you block up energy and stop its flow into the body, and that is rather stupid. Neither tensing nor relaxing makes muscles responsive to spirit, for relaxed muscles are too inactive to take in more energy, and tensed muscles block up and hinder energy from flowing through them. Yet your muscles can respond to spirit, for even what you call muscle power is spirit power. The proof is this. No matter how strong you think your arm muscles are, if you cut the nerve which carried energy from your brain to those muscles, the energy you thought was muscle energy disappears instantly and your arm muscles are paralyzed. What you call muscle energy or nerve energy or even brain energy vanishes the minute you cut off spirit energy. Even physical strength is the spirit energy which is first inspired into the brain and then sent to the muscles. There is something you can do besides tensing and relaxing. There is a way of using your muscles, which gives you complete freedom of movement, continuous and abundant energy, with never a feeling of nervous exhaustion or tensing on the one hand, or the letdown or slackness of the other. Such a heaven of activity is attained by free flow of energy into your muscles, unhindered flow through them into actual action, and then extended flow out to something beyond yourself. Only a few great masters have attained this full use of the extended flow of muscle energy out beyond the self. It is this which spiritualizes the activity of your muscles by making their activity like spirits expanding activity. What I now write of selfishness is not merely my own thought. I have learned it from the centuries and from the inspiring help of mystic masters still active in conscious and body. The truth is this. There is physical and physiological and even chemical selfishness, just as there is personal selfishness, and all great transformation depends on unselfish action. All effort which blocks up energy is selfish. All effort to hold it in the muscle is selfish. All effort to use it only in the muscles is selfish, and selfish action always destroys any structure. But when energy flows out beyond the muscles that is unselfish and makes even muscle action like spirit activity, this is the sacred secret of the seventh day of creation. With such action, even the spiritual energy of muscle reaches out beyond the body, out into the cosmic, and even the muscles of your body become spiritualized. And when your muscles, like spirit and action, reach out into all intelligence and love and power of spirit, it is then that your body becomes a perfect channel of spirit. And the blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up. This cosmicizing activity is not so impossible as it seems. In fact, the little muscles of your eyes already do it. That is, you have seen stars, many stars in your lifetime. Yet you could never have seen even one star if the muscles around your eyeball had not adjusted your eyes to the position and distance of the star, far out beyond those little muscles of your eye. Cosmicizing a muscle activity means letting it reach out into the cosmic, out beyond the muscles. Stars are trillions of miles away. So you have already cosmicized the activity of the little eyeball muscle, making them reach out beyond themselves every time you have seen a star trillions of miles away. This is spiritualized activity of muscles. 
Do you now begin to understand why walking beneath the stars seen them always brings you celestial power and peace? Give your muscles this power. By the work of the next and last lesson, the ultimate and spiritual response, resulting in the power to hold for use whatsoever you create in fulfillment of desire. Lesson 37. The Transformation in Heavenly Communion Sit easily in an upright chair, like a dining room chair. Reach out with your arms free easily in front of you. Vision yourself freely, softly playing a piano, or let us say an organ, for its tones are richer and fuller. Move your arms and hands and fingers, using both hands, just as a child does when pretending to play a piano or organ. Run your hands and fingers up and down the keyboard. Imagine playing any tune you like, hum it if you wish. This is real, not imaginary. It is real, actual movement. The only thing that is imaginary is the organ. All else, movement of playing, are real, actual movements. Now next, vision the keyboard six or seven or eight inches away from you, out beyond the reach of your fingertips. But keep on playing, moving your arms, hands, and fingers. Envision yourself sending energy out from your fingertips through the few inches of space out to the keys. That is, extend your activity out beyond your physical self. Then vision the keyboard of your organ three feet away and keep on playing this imaginary organ. Next, vision the organ across the room and continue playing. Lift your arms a little higher, move your hands in a wider range from side to side, as you vision the organ to be larger, with keyboard extended from one side of the room to the other. Now, with infinity of spirit, see beyond walls of your room. Let the walls disappear and vision a much greater organ halfway down the block with a keyboard 200 feet long. Also vision infinite spirit in you manifesting through the muscles of your arm, active in your wrists and hands, but moving out beyond your fingertips, actually reaching out to the keys of the gigantic organ halfway down the block. And continue playing on that keyboard a half block away, make it real, and actually hum the tune you are playing. In actuality, your soul is doing this. Your arms are doing it. Your fingers are doing it. It is real. The only imaginary thing in all of this is the organ. Actually express your soul infinitely in actual action, reaching out and out with energy extending beyond the physical self. Now vision the stars as keys of a majestic keyboard of a spiritual organ of the universe billions of miles away. Lift your arms and hands higher. Vision your fingertips sending out energy and movement to the keys of that celestial organ and keep on playing on the keyboard of the stars, producing the silent music of the universe. O oh friend, expanded soul, realize what you are doing. Your soul is expanding out into the infinite and in action. Your very muscles actually are acting in harmony with spiritual expansion. That is, even your muscle activity is unified with spirit's expanding activity. And it is probable that this is the first time in all your life that you have done this, except perhaps in dreams. Often in the past you have attempted to attain a greater consciousness of the infinity of yourself, but you have limited the efforts of your mind reaching far out beyond itself in thought. Such attainment, in mind only, was without form and void. What I have just taught you to do is the one means of attaining actuality and action out in infinity. It makes even muscle action like unto the activity of spirit. This is the greatest attainment any soul can make on earth. No matter how simple the exercise of playing an imaginary organ, it is the extension of activity out into the infinite, which is the greatest thing you have ever done. To extend action so that it becomes infinite is like unto the activity of infinite spirit, like unto the activity of God. This makes it possible for more spirit energy to flow into your muscles and through them, because you do not limit the action of spirit to the mere size or extent of your muscles. Thus your body, even its muscle structure, becomes responsive and vitalized and transformed like to spirit action. Now cosmicize muscle activity of your torso and lower limbs. Stand up easily, lift head a little, and lean a little forward. And while standing, repeat the organ plane on the magnificent organ of the universe with stars for keys far, far away. As you reach out, lean forward a little, 
to play on the keyboard of the star so that the motion of all your torso and even your leg muscles join in the motion of the arm muscles. Thus the activity of all muscles from head to toe respond, this is the heaven of wedding spirit to matter in action. This carrying of action out into the infinite is the process which completes actuality in attaining things you desire. With it, things you want no longer remain formless and void. It establishes a habitual tendency of your mind and heart and soul to do more than merely create what you want in mind. It establishes the habits of all energies of your soul whenever you desire anything to move out into action beyond yourself, both to create and also to unfold what you want and hold it as your own. Please note this phrase, hold it as your own. I shall write more of this later in this lesson. Now be seated once more. Again play your magnificent organ and lift thine eyes to the hills, to mountains of the stars. Feel the energy in your muscles moving out and up even to the stars. You can now attain the glory of the power of freedom and action, for your body is neither tense nor relaxed yet its muscles are thrilled with energy and are active. As you make this habitual, it will not take more than four minutes for this entire step of playing the organ near you, farther away and even farther out with stars for keys. But never let one night pass without thus spiritualizing your muscles. They are the last barrier hindering full response to spirit. Thus all tensity of holding energy and muscle disappears and all of the slack, all-gone feeling of relaxation vanishes, and yet abundant energy flows into and through your muscle. Probably this is the first time in your life you have actually unified activity of all body with the activity of spirit. By such unity of responsiveness you are spiritually ready for all intelligence and love of spirit, past, present, future, to flow into and through you so that you will be constantly unified with spirit and always intimately communion with it. I include the past for you, for life is infinite. Life always has lived and always will live. Your memories may be blocked now by an unresponsive body, but as body responds you will awaken infinite memory. Soul is perfect with past memories, present expanded consciousness, and prevision and even knowledge of the future. The soul, being free to manifest, can respond to consciousness of continued and continuing life and to all its manifestations. The marvel of these uses of these seven Elohim rays is that all of them are always constructive. They are the only rays of the universe which are creative. God used them to give form and actuality to all creation. When responsive, you can commune with spirit, for then your deepest emotions are in harmony with all higher spirit. And again I emphasize the law that like responds to like. You cannot even see blue color unless something in the retina of your eye and also in your soul is like blue and responds to blue. So also your soul cannot become at one with that which you wish to commune unless your own soul attitudes are like those of spirit and its manifestation. Spirit always lives in attitude of peace and love and joy. So to attain greatest spiritual response to spirit, you must attune your emotions to the same attitudes of peace, love, and joy. By such likeness of attitude you can feel oneness with and commune with consciousness of all things on earth and heaven. Full responsive communion depends on unity of likeness. This is true of all communion and all communication. Even on earth, communication of ideas is possible only by likeness of the language used or gestures used. If a friend speaks only Greek and you only English, you cannot communicate except by like meanings of gestures you use. So also in spirit, communion depends on likeness. Spirit never feels sad or separated. Hence, so long as you are sorrowful and feel that you feel separated from one whom you love, just so long will you remain separated in consciousness from the spirit of that soul. Feelings of sorrow differ from those of spirit. You cannot become one with anything unless you respond in likeness. Love responds to love, peace to peace, joy to joy. God is joyous, and the angels of God live in a realm of joy. 
Those who have passed on live in joy infinitely greater joy than that which we know, and just as beautiful music cannot harmonize itself with discordant clanging noise, so you cannot be constantly responsive to their joy, except by joy in you. Let thy soul be joyful, and sorrow shall be turned to joy. Your heart shall rejoice, your joy no man taketh from you. For perfect communion, free yourself of all self-centeredness. Let your soul reach out in feeling the love of the grass and trees and hills, to the infinite peace and harmony of stars, and to all time, all the past and a million years hence. With such expansion there will come greater love for you, love of souls you love, love of all growing grass, trees and ferns, the rush of water, winds of mountains, angels and God. Sit not in the silence of the response with mere thoughts expanding out among the stars. That is not enough. Let your soul feel the peace and love of all things of heaven and earth to consciously, continuously commune with all. I digress here to give you the actual proof of what God did the seventh day of creation. It was quite different from the usual interpretation, which is mistaken in thinking that God was inactive, did nothing on the Sabbath. Certainly you now realize that something was needed to be done that day. After use of the first six powers of God, the first six days of creation, all that was created was not in condition to be held as a recreating process for all time. Permanency of creation had not yet been established. So God used the sabotaging ray on the seventh day. This ray captivated what had been created and held it, not in inactivity, but in limitless activity. I have previously written it often in the ancient Hebrew. The same root word is used repeatedly in the same sentence. For example, the meaning of activity was used several times in the sentence, God created man in his own image. It really means infinite activity activated the activity of man in the activity of God, to be like the activity of God. So also in telling of God's action on the Sabbath, one word is translated by three words in the original text. One meaning, but three different in the English translation. The Hebrew words which are translated finished and ended are translations of the same word kala, K-A-L-A. In this verse, kala is a verb. It means all activity and limitless activity. Consequently, it does not mean stopped activity at all, but rather activity that is limitlessly active. The word translated work is melaka, M-E-L-A-K-A-H. It is spelled with a aleph, A-L-E-P-H, which signifies the greatest strength. It is derived from the root melek, which means king, to reign, to radiate power forever. The word translated rested differs from all other Hebrew words in the Bible, which means to stop work or to be inactive or to be idle or to take a rest. In this verse, the word used does not mean inactive rest. Rested and seventh and Sabbath are each and all translations from the same root word. In many Bible verses, this word is translated by words which mean held, captured, held captive, actually acquired that is, the rest of the Sabbath, was making spiritual creation actual so it could be held as an actuality. Lastly, the word sanctified is a translation of Kadesh, Q-A-D-E-S-H, which means set apart for a particular purpose. Hence, in this verse, the power was set apart for actualization, that is, to be held captive in continuous activity for use, This reveals that on the seventh day, God used the seventh great creative ray to make all processes permanent. That is, he held them in captivity for limitless action. In our words, this means the power to hold what we idealize and create, hold it for our own use and for the good of others. Vision this true ideal of the Sabbath to understand the sabotaging ray or holding ray of creation. All fulfillment of all you desire comes only by response. All you desire, vitality, energy, freedom from fatigue, endurance, calm nerves, healing, come only as more spirit manifests in and through your body. More vivacity and less dullness and sleepiness, more charm, youthfulness, 
companion winning power, more virility and strength come only when more life of spirit manifests. Initiative, success and abundance are due to more power of spirit becoming actual in your life and taking form. Illumination and the super consciousness of soul and alchemic changes and transformations are wrought by response. Clear memories, consciousness of the presence of masters, entering into spirit into the temple of the past come only by response to spirit. All true guidance and true communion, untainted and intimate, come only by spiritual response to spirit. Remember, my friend, also, you are now making the most astounding change man can ever make on earth, changing from dependence on energies which always tend to destroy, to use the seven spiritual energies which are always constructive. And it is very simple, and soon it will become one unified process of response for you, beginning by quietly inspiring spirit, then expanding to the stars, giving form, clarifying, vitalizing, recreating, and ending with your spiritualization even of muscle energy, at one with spirit, so that you hold what you have created with limitless freedom of power. In closing, again summarize these seven great rays of creation. Often clarify in your own mind the seven hold powers of God of the seven days of creation. There is nothing else like these power in all heaven and earth. They never destroy, they are always constructive, and each always produces a result after its own kind. For the first day of the process of creation there is the inspiring ray, the radiation of energy into the ideal of what you desire, or into the substance of thing or condition you wish to create. For the second day of the process there is the expanding ray, which starts the creating of something different from that which was inspired by the first power. For the third day, there is the forming ray which begins to give form to what is expanding, to actualize the ideal of what you desire. For the fourth day, there is the clarifying power. You may also call it the purification or differentiating power, each part taking its own place, being harmonized, so that each part works together harmoniously to produce what you most desire. For the fifth day of our process of creation, there is the vitalizing ray to be used. It is the mystic and mysterious in its power. It gives life even to that which does not have life, just as God on the fifth day brought forth life out of the water, which in itself is not living. For on the sixth day, the recreative power, the power of each thing to reproduce itself like its own kind, the source of all abundance on earth, whether abundance of energies, of life, or all things of material wealth. And for the seventh day, the holding ray, that is the power that keeps what you have created for use for yourself and for others, and also keeps what you have created in the form of condition in which you created it, so it does not lessen or deteriorate or disappear. End of lesson. End of book.